Compassion, doctor, like Dr. Mark Ridley Thomas would say, check yourself before you wreck yourself, my brother, because today's society is all fucked. And that's what the capital F-U-C-K. And don't quote me wrong on that. It's a statement made from Cohen versus California. Next speaker, Thank you. please. Honorable Supervisors, Fred Sutton with the California Apartment Association. We appreciate all you do. Uh, if there are funds that are, are not fully allocated or are softly allocated, we respectfully request more dollars be considered for direct rental subsidy to build off of the $45 uh, million dollar program uh, created earlier this year for rent relief. Um, Direct rental assistance is the best and most effective tool to address uh, residual concerns uh, of COVID pandemic era policies. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you, board. My name is Max Sherman. I'm speaking on behalf of the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles. If there are available or unencumbered ARPA funds, we strongly urge the board to allocate additional monetary support to establish direct rental subsidies to help renters pay back owed rent to struggling mom and pop rental housing providers. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the American Rescue Plan. Is that part of the CARE plan? This capital C, capital A, capital R, capital E, capital S plan that Nancy Pelosi put before the federal government? $1.9 billion? on top of your $44 billion budget? And I need to remind you, that's another care plan? You just voted for three items, your last item. You voted for five and six and something else. And item six says care first, just last. We're now on so three. We're I now know on what you're three. on, ma'am. You're on, on a stick. It's up your ass. That's where it is. That's where it should be. Talk to your friend and cohort. You signed up to 15,000 people in Skid Row. What happened to that plan? L.A. Care. L. Period. A. Care. Period. Mark Ridley Thomas's private company. Thank you. Uh, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Madam Chair, there are no additional speakers. Okay. Uh, any other supervisors want to comment on this? Thank you, Dr. Scorza, for being here. Um, this item is a receive and file, and here are knowing objections, hearing no objections, that will be the order. Now we're moving on to 12, uh, developing a community reinvestment spending plan for future county cannabis business tax revenue, which was held by Supervisor Solis. For members of the public on the telephone, please press one then zero now to comment on this item. Supervisor Solis, would you like to make some comments? Yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I also want to thank Supervisor Mitchell for joining me on this motion. Uh, last November, as you may recall, voters in our county approved Measure C, which authorized a general tax on future cannabis businesses located in unincorporated areas of the county. And it's estimated that business tax will generate approximately $10 million to our county with revenue generated from the tax going into the county's general fund. With some of the lowest tax rates across the state, the passage of Measure C was a major step for the county towards an equitable transition to a regulated market. But we must not forget that the anticipated revenue from these taxes comes from a product that has long been a source of incarceration and intergenerational trauma for our communities of color. And for decades, our black and brown communities have endured the impact of discriminatory enforcement of cannabis criminalization. Those convicted of cannabis offenses and their families have suffered, as you know, long-term consequences of lives being disrupted, exclusion of employment prospects, and access to adequate resources and support to live healthy lives. Despite more state and local governments moving toward legalization of cannabis and a multi-billion dollar cannabis industry, our communities of color continue to deal with the collateral damage from the war on drugs and prevent systemic barriers toward economic mobility. Governments have, in my opinion, a belief and moral obligation to ensure the communities that have been most harmed by cannabis criminalization can benefit from its legalization. This is an important moment, I believe, for the county to support and hopefully repair 
through revenue reinvestment to help redress those harms and decrease disparities for communities disproportionately and detrimentally impacted by the war on drugs. We need to make sure that the future cannabis business tax revenue going into the county's general fund does not stay frozen in that fund and that we take proactive measures for appropriate allocation and spending of that revenue. Focusing on how cannabis revenues are allocated is critical now because this relatively new funding stream is expected to see long-term growth and we've all been anticipating that. And we have an opportunity to identify, in my opinion, opportunities for future cannabis revenues to benefit those communities towards programs and resources that help people thrive. That's why today I bring forward a motion that I authored with Supervisor Mitchell that will help the county establish a plan on how future cannabis tax revenues from Measure C could be reinvested to benefit those very communities that have been harmed by cannabis criminalization so that our communities do not get left behind as money flows through that industry. The motion directs the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs and its Office of Cannabis Management in consultation and collaboration with county departments to develop recommendations for and developing a community reinvestment plan for cannabis tax revenue for the county's unincorporated areas that will help the county properly plan and establish mechanisms for collected revenue that align with key priorities and benefit key programming and services such as community benefits, reinvestment into neighborhoods that cite cannabis businesses and equity-led programs. I urge my colleagues to join me in helping to repair some of the harms of cannabis criminalization by working to create a community reinvestment plan for cannabis tax revenues that will support our most marginalized communities in the unincorporated areas of LA County. We also need to evaluate how we can best allocate sufficient upfront funding in our budget to staff up the OCM and related departments appropriately to manage the equity network framework and regulatory demands to collaborate with our stakeholders, our agencies that are involved, and are in our unincorporated areas. I would also like to read in the following language to add to my report back motion, and it reads as follows, a recommendation on how the revenue could fund initial investment in administrative and compliance operations of OCM and related LAC programs supporting cannabis social and health equity and ensure resources are available while the programming matures. Go ahead, Supervisor Solis. Thank you, and I would now turn uh, the remainder of my time over to Supervisor Mitchell for her comments. Supervisor Please. Mitchell as the co-author. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and Supervisor Solis for taking leadership on this. I appreciate it. Uh, I have been really consistent and clear for that from my perspective, communities who have been harmed disproportionately by the over-policing of cannabis-related offenses should be those who benefit from the licensing of cannabis in the unincorporated community. So I'm looking forward to the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs establishing a regulatory and licensing framework that promotes equitable ownership and employment opportunities in this new emerging industry. Any program that we design must recognize and address the long-term negative social impacts associated with the disproportionate enforcement of cannabis policies on communities of color and low-income communities throughout the county. Our cannabis tax funds collected from Measure C should be reinvested back into what I call our hardly reached communities through a community-led process, which includes the dedicated creation of an equity fund whose investments should be directed by the community. So I look forward to the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs recommendations and the report back. Thanks again, Supervisor Solis. Thank you. Uh, any other OC? I see um, Supervisor Barger and then Supervisor Horvath. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Supervisor Solis and Supervisor Mitchell for bringing this motion forward. I also want to recognize the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs, the Office of Cannabis Management, County Council, and all the departments and staff that are working on developing the county's legal cannabis framework. <clears throat> when California voters approved Prop 64 in 2016, it was a departure from the sentiments pre prevalent in the 1970s, which was the year cannabis was classified as a Schedule I drug. 
We have seen a shift over the last couple of decades regarding public support for the legalization of cannabis. And last November, more than 60% of the voters approved Measure C in support of the county's cannabis business tax. Legal cannabis equity has been at the forefront in conversations and deliberations by this board. It is important that we build equity into the investment opportunities of cannabis tax revenue for community benefit while also leveraging this opportunity to rectify the harms caused by the criminalization of cannabis. It is important that we ensure that cannabis tax revenue is being reinvested back into the unincorporated communities from which it will come. I will wholeheartedly um, agree that the revenue should be used to support and provide programming activities and social services in the unincorporated communities. However, there are other issues we must consider, especially for the unincorporated communities that have borne the burden of illicit cannabis operators with little to no benefit to, uh, for their community. In the endorsement of Measure C, the LA Times editorial board noted the need for the county to allow legal cannabis sale. Otherwise, and I quote, the result would be more of what we have now, illicit, off the books sales, and all of the violence, crime, and environmental destruction that have made unincorporated Los Angeles County a cannabis nightmare. For many of my communities, violence, crime, and environmental destruction have been a continued struggle. I have had to use discretionary funds to support abatement efforts of illegal cannabis operation in my district. We have to face this reality head on if we wanna provide legal cannabis operators the opportunity to succeed so they are not undermined by illicit operators. This is not to say that our sole focus should be on enforcement, nor should our focus be on criminalizing. It is, however, an acknowledgement that tax revenues are linked to sales, and a robust cannabis industry should not have to compete with operators not following the rules and using pesticides that we don't even know what, um, what they're, quite frankly, using that could be detrimental to people's health. Additionally, we must not forget that the reports we received on legalization, um, legalizing cannabis sales noted there will be costs for the county to create and support this industry. Numerous departments will play a role and will need to allocate staff to work on this endeavor. Those departments should be included in the reinvestment of the cannabis tax revenue if we want to ensure the longevity of this program. I hope that the report back considers the various issues associated with creating a legal cannabis industry and that it recommends potential investments that balance the funding the county will need and the opportunities to invest in our unincorporated communities. And Raphael, I just have just a couple questions. How will cannabis business tax revenues be allocated to each supervisorial district? Have you looked at that at all? Uh, thank you for the question, Supervisor. Well, th that'll be part of the process. We'll engage the community and the stakeholders and your respective offices to come up with a formula and bring it back to our board. Generally, what we're hearing from the community is that they want to see revenue that's generated within their community, reinvested in their community. So some of that will be captured in our report back. Excellent, and then on Measure C included provisions for taxes being imposed on all cannabis businesses operating either legally or illegally within the county. Will there be recommendations included funding enforcement efforts as well? You can look at that. Yeah, the recommendations will include compliance and enforcement. The benefit of st standing up a regulatory framework too also allows us to apply for state grants for enforcement that we otherwise couldn't tap into to support some of those activities as well. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, I support it. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Horvath. Thank you, I also wanna thank Supervisor Solis and Mitchell for bringing this item forward. And uh, Supervisor Solis, I also wanna thank you for including the directive to ensure that, that cannabis tax funding and resources are utilized for administrative and compliance operations as this rolls out. It's important we use ca cannabis tax dollars uh, to make equitable invest uh, community investments, and it is also critical that cannabis retailers have the education and tools they need to ensure compliance. I'm glad we're taking steps to plan for how to spend this revenue in an effective manner, and I also want to ensure that, as, uh, that we get the new businesses permitted up and running as quickly as possible while making enforcement of illegal businesses a key priority. As we move forward in the implementation process, I also want to ensure that there is adequate funding to stand up the program and enforce our regulations so that our legal businesses can thrive. Some communities in my district have seen emerging, emerging challenges related to cannabis tax revenue. Specifically, uh, we've seen lower tax revenues than projected and reduced tax receipts as more and more dispensaries were licensed in the region. With that in mind, I would encourage us to cautiously plan for the expenditure of these 
tax receipts and not overestimate how much we may receive in the future. I look forward to future reports and uh, on this program and its continued implementation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and um, I too uh, support this. Thank you, for Supervisor Solis and Supervisor Mitchell for bringing this forward. Um, you know, what this board is saying by, by this is that we want to, we want the revenue we collect from Measure C to go directly back into the community for things like childcare, after school programs, park improvements, youth programming, and other community benefits, as opposed to collecting revenue and having it sit in the county general fund. I understand that this motion uh, is saying part of the reinvestment includes supporting our plan equity program for specific applicants who may have been impacted um, negatively by the ill-advised war on drugs. I'm in agreement with my colleagues and want to add my uh, support to this. It only seems right that the tax money we collect from businesses in unincorporated um, county go, we spend it in our unincorporated areas. And I appreciate that we're giving opportunities um, to people through this. Um, and I also support Supervisor Barger's concern, which I hear a lot of in my district, is the illegal um, cannabis operations, which I think hurts everything. So hopefully, uh, I agree, we don't want to spend all of our money on enforcement um, uh, or incarceration, right? But we've got to get under control of these illegal um, businesses because, again, we want to support legal businesses. We want to support that infrastructure. And I think the, the voters, when they pass this, agree um, that we should also tax these legal entities and then use that revenue in a positive way. So if we do this right, um, it will have a, a good outcome. Uh, so I support that, and I thank you. You have my support, Supervisors Solis and Mitchell. All right, okay, Executive Officer, please call the members of the public that would like to speak on this item. Will Red Chief Hunt please come forward and staff will assist you? Okay, moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please? Our first participant is Damian Martin. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Board of Supervisors, County staff, and the, and the public. My name is Damian Martin. I'm the co-founder of and attorney for Catalyst Cannabis Co. Catalyst Cannabis Co. has 17 open and operational dispensaries throughout the state of California, with many in the city of Los Angeles and LA County and the incorporated areas. Uh, our mission slogan is weed for the people. What that means is that all of our stores are unionized with UFCW, we're committed to community benefits, and particularly we're committed to social equity. On that note, um, four of the stores are, are, that we operate are social equity stores in the city of Los Angeles. And I personally attended the Office of Cannabis Management's uh, list, uh, community feedback session in East Los Angeles um, a couple uh, a week ago, or a couple weeks ago. And one of the biggest messages or sentiments coming from the community at that feedback session was that they did not Thank trust Thank you. that the tax revenue you, from Measure Fix. C would come. So your time oh, has expired. So fast. I know, it does go oh, fast. Shoot. Thank you. Um, next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Jacqueline Ayer. Your line is open. Yes, my name is Jacqueline Ayer and I'm speaking on behalf of the Acton Town Council. The motion before you was based on a pathway study which supports an enforcement moratorium policy that is uninformed because it does not account for devastation created in the fifth district where huge cartel running illegal grows perpetrate human trafficking, the enslavement of people of color, murder and environmental destruction. The study perceives enforcement only as a tool of oppression and it ignores the undeniable fact that enforcement is absolutely critical to address the huge illegal operations in the fifth district that are destroying communities and the environment. I am an environmental engineer and I am offering this testimony as a subject matter expert. If you want to impose an enforcement moratorium on small scale operations, that is one thing, but you must maintain a commitment to enforcement on deadly and environmentally destructive cartel run operations, and you must use a portion of the revenue accrued from cannabis taxation to support such enforcement efforts. Another concern is that this motion directs the OCM to develop recommendations for a plan to use cannabis Thank revenues, you. but Thank it does you. not Your direct time OCM to Thank you. solicit public input before Thank you. preparing such. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Cicero Quinones. You may begin. 
Yes, I attended the meeting in East Los Angeles, and I was disappointed in the presentation, and I saw it as not equitable, and I think if you're going to do this, you got to do it right, and it won't be equitable the way it was presented. Um, I want to work with the board to improve it, um, because there is no trust. You can have pennies on the taxes, but the owners of the dispensaries, who are they going to be? White, wealthy, and they will displace the smaller growers, even if they're uh, the ones that are funded now are funded by the same ones that were in the city. And when I heard they were going to use the city model and they were going to use the same process, I was outraged. It was full of corruption, and it's an example of more racism. So we have to go back to the drawing board because what I saw, I was not, not happy with at all. When the community cooperatives in both black and brown communities that went not only uh, run the dispensaries, but the cultivation, and they have to be community-owned. Uh, no, we don't trust it going to the general fund. You have to put a caveat that it goes to those Thank communities you. that have been harmed. Thank you. Um, segregated communities Thank and incorporated. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Bye -bye. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Diego Rodriguez. You may begin. Good afternoon, honorable supervisors. My name is Diego Rodriguez, and I serve as CEO of ALMA, a social services organization that offers mental health, case management, and substance use prevention and early intervention, to name a few. I want to first thank Supervisor Solis and Mitchell for this motion, item 12. Proposition 64 was created to re help repair the harms caused by the war on drugs and allocate cannabis tax revenues to specific purposes, including community reinvestment grant programs. Several local governments have passed local ballot measures to allocate portions of cannabis business tax revenues for specific uses to close the spending gaps on historically underfunded services that provide community benefits. The recently released cannabis equity assessment highlights the importance of allocating a portion of cannabis tax funds back into communities targeted by the war on drugs. Redirecting tax revenues could help to address various disparities and to be used to promote restorative justice, support local economic development, create or expand health Thank and you. social programming, Thank you. Your and time has enhance expired. public safety Thank strategies. You. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Our next participant is Edgar Torres. You may begin. <clears throat> Howdy, my name is Edgar Torres, and I'm in the Community Outreach Manager for Catalyst Cannabis Co., which is a regulated operator in the state of California with 17 locations all of which are invested in community service and development. Firstly, I would like to thank the board of further time and Supervisor Hilda El Solis for her motion item 12 to develop a community reinvestment spending plan for future county business tax revenue. Being in the cannabis industry throughout the years and working for legal and traditional market companies, I have experienced firsthand the differences and benefits that regulated cannabis comes with, to name a few tax revenues and community benefits. The county must the county must proactively plan for collection and reinvestment of future measure C cannabis tax revenues for community benefit purposes in an incorporated communities. Several local governments have passed local ballot measures to allocate portions of cannabis business tax revenues for specific uses to close spending gaps on historically underfunded services that provide community benefits. This in conjunction with community benefit agreements with cannabis operators have empirically shown to uplift communities substantially and efficiently. Catalyst prides itself on being community focused, giving back informed spending from blood drives, expungement clinics, unhoused events, and food recollection drives, which Thank is you. all done in conjunction with local Thank outlets. You. Take a breath. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Next Our speaker. next participant is Diana Diaz. You may begin. Good afternoon, um, supervisors. I want to thank uh, Supervisor Hilda Solis for her motion on item 12. I'm uh, working with the Goddess Mercado, the Queer Mercado, but I'm also a school counselor that has worked most recently in the Divergent Program where um, youth that I work with are criminalized for the use of marijuana. And what I have learned as a school counselor that a lot of the youth um, that have overdosed on alcohol or other drugs, but never on marijuana, and use cannabis as a form a way of dealing with trauma and the mental health. I urge you to please use any of the funds collected for the reinvestment for programs that will educate, empower students, provide healthy and alternative ways to deal with the trauma that our students have been exposed to in our com in our undeserved communities, such as um, use of funds for education on medicinal purposes to decriminalize, to educate parents as well, for prevention, for research, for more regulation, and also Thank to you. provide. Thank you very much. Thank Next, you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Our next participant is Roy Humphreys. You may begin. Hey, first of all, uh, contrary to uh, Supervisor Hahn, you spend every penny that's necessary to crush illegal anything to do with this operation. The other thing is, what is our return on investment today? That's ROI. When, and if I don't believe you've even broke even, when did you project the, the break even uh, situation on that? And as far as a legalization of drugs, as uh, uh, Allende Fox of uh, Mexico says, it's time to legalize uh, all drugs and, and, and do it uh, accordingly because, as you know, the war on drugs was declared in 1965, and where are we today? The drug cartels are making more money and doing more drugs going across our borders every day, folks. Time to get smart. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Alessandra Valdez. Your line is open. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, I'm here. Hi. I'm here Hi. to speak today in favor of supporting yes on item 54A. Um, my name is Alessandra Valdez. I am a tenant oh, you and know, I live oh, you in know the what? city of uh, Burbank. Hello. You were so cheerful, but uh, you're on the wrong item. Uh, we're on. <laughs> Item uh, 12, uh, 13, we're on 12, and you're speaking on 54A. Oh, so that's not till a little bit later, no, so I'm... no problem. No. Okay. <laughs> no need to apologize. Okay, in person. Madam Her Chair, Herman. there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. Okay, Herman Herman. So we already know that elected officials push for Measure 64 and deny us the right to have a good toke. However, now you want to tax the hardworking cannabis people for all their endeavors to put the business that you pushed upon the public. But the public voted for Measure 64. That's the sad part, and that's the good part. But the pathetic part is now you want to regulate them like the mafia. And that seems to be a perspective of an allegation because why are there so many pot shots popping up? Hilda Solis, why? And Miss Holly Mitchell, why are the youth being introduced to fentanyl when you could stop them at the border before they come in? So the question is whether or not, yes, we passed Measure 64, love it, suck it, or leave it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. That's it. Okay, uh, any other supervisors want to speak on this? Um, okay, hearing no comments, item 12 is now before us. Moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 12, as amended, is before you. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Horvath? Aye. Supervisor Horvath? Aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries, five to zero. Okay. Um, now we're going to move on to item 13, support for United States President Joseph R. Biden's executive order on reducing gun violence and making our communities safer, which was held by Supervisor Solis. For members of the public on the telephone, please press one, then zero now to comment on this item, item 13. Supervisor Solis, would you like to make some remarks? Yes, thank you. Uh Chairwoman Hahn for co-authoring the motion. As you know, this is a very important topic. You met with the president uh, last week on his visit here to Monterey Park, and I know this was uh, front and center for all of us. He came to speak to our community in Monterey Park, especially the victims and survivors uh, regarding the massive shooting that took place. Um, and it was a good thing for him to do to be there. He was needed. It was an important message. And I just want to share that the president's message was that of hope and resilience, despite what happened in that tragic uh, event. Um, it was an ideal location for the president to make his announcement. He was issuing his executive order on reducing gun violence. And colleagues, you all know we have a very strong record of standing up for victims and survivors of gun-related violence. And we have collectively over the years created stronger local ordinances to protect our residents. But we also have supported safe state and federal legislation to keep our communities safe from gun violence. Uh, President Biden's executive order calls on Congress to do the following. 
banning assault weapons and high capacity magazines, requiring background checks for all gun sales, requiring safe storage of firearms, and expanding community violence intervention and prevention strategies. Does that sound familiar? Because we've done it. This board has already supported many of those actions through our various motions. So therefore, I think it is incumbent on us to also lend support to President Biden's executive order. So I would respectfully ask my colleagues for an I vote. Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Solis, and thanks for asking me to co-author this. Um, yes, I thought it was so important that President Biden um, came here and chose to go to Monterey Park, uh, where you uh, met with him as well as uh, families of the victims of the, the, the shooting out there. Uh, and uh, I understand he has such a great way of connecting with um, you know, families of, of those who have lost someone as he's experienced that loss in his own life. And I hear he's really powerful when he speaks to the grief uh, in others' hearts. Uh, but I do uh, appreciate that um, he is doing what he can to fight gun violence while he waits along with the rest of us for Congress uh, to act and really uh, pass some legislation that could prevent gun violence. And his executive order, though, is a good step, and it does things like strengthen enforcement against gun dealers who break the law, encourage the use of red flag laws and safe storage of firearms, and ensure that ballistic data is reported in a timely fashion. Okay, I think to say that I met with the president is a huge exaggeration. Uh, I stood on the tarmac with an umbrella in the pouring rain when he stepped off uh, Air Force One uh, and the, the mayor of Los Angeles and I greeted him and welcomed him, but in my two minutes uh, that I had uh, before he, he got into his motorcade to go to where you are, he's like, I can't talk to you, I'm heading to where Hilda Solis is. Madam Chair, I saw your picture all, all like, over I'm the all newspapers like, I, I, with I, him. I, well, it's true, we did take a quick <laughs> selfie. Uh, but I did take my few moments uh, to say, especially on, on the red, red flag law, I said that's exactly what we're doing uh, in LA County. We realize uh, that the red flag uh, is on the books, but a lot of people don't know about it. So our, our idea here in LA County was to educate more people um, to learn about it. And then like I said, he's like, I gotta get to Hilda. Um, so, I think it's important that, that um, we're supporting this executive order, but I think we also are clear that until Congress acts on you know, really passing significant, meaningful uh, gun violence prevention legislation, we will still be in the situation where some states uh, have good laws, others don't, but it's so easy uh, to buy guns uh, in other states and bring them here uh, and commit uh, horrific acts of violence. So thank you for, for bringing this forward. Um, I appreciate the fact that he's um, sending a big message on what he can do to help, help us as we try to prevent gun violence here in LA County. Thank you. Um, any other um, supervisors wanna speak on this? Okay, um, please call the members of the public who have signed up to speak on this item. Well, Anthony Garcia, Herman Herman, and Red Chief Hunt, please come forward and staff will assist you. Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please. Our first participant is Matthew Sullivan. You may begin. Hello, my name is Matthew. I'm a Long Beach resident. I urge you not to put any more restrictions on lawful gun owners. If you want to protect the community, how about policing and arresting the 20% of criminals that cause 80% of the crimes? It's laughable that you claim to be against gun violence when you and the DA allow criminals to be released with no bail, permit homeless to overtake public sidewalks and public areas. California already has some of the most stringent gun control laws in the nation, yet the crime continues. It is not the lawful gun owners that are causing the crime. Don't pretend otherwise. It is the criminals that are doing it, and you allow it. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Cindy Wu. You may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Board of Supervisors, staff, and the public. My name is Cindy Wu, and I'm a board member with Mountain View School District, which is responsible for eight schools and about 5,000 students from K-8 in the St. Gabriel Valley area. 
an immediate past president of the Los Angeles County School Trustees Association, which embraces the 13 community colleges and 80 K-12 school trustees in LA County. I want to thank Supervisor Helga Solis for her motion to support President Biden's executive order on reducing gun violence in America. Gun violence is a national crisis, and as someone who's been working with the victims of gun violence, victims of suffering from PTSD, being a witness to gun violence in the most recent Monterey Park shooting, even having a 20-day period due to PTSD. We need to ensure our students are safe and protected through all our schools uh, in our community. Actions need to be taken. A supervisor and the board have already put forth many motions, and I'm grateful for their leadership. I fully support President Biden's executive order, and I support you. Supervisor's motion to Thank support you. as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Eric Chen. You may begin. Yes, good afternoon, Board of Supervisors and um, the general public. My name is Eric Chen, and I'm a pastor uh, with the TCUSA Presbyterian Church of the United States of America pres uh, denomination, and I've been working most recently uh, with the victims of the Monterey Park shooting. And I'm calling to thank Supervisor Hilda Solis for her motion to support the president's executive order. I know firsthand from speaking with many of the victims and their families that they are very concerned about the number of guns in the wrong hands in this country, particularly the shooter who um, went in on that fateful night and his gun uh, was altered to have a, a, a round of a magazine that had 30 bullets in it. And no one should uh, in America needs a gun, the, uh, that basically functions like an assault weapon, a weapon of war, and, and many families would like to see um, Thank you. more responsible gun ownership. Thank you. So thank with you. that, I want to thank, thank you. Thank you. And next speaker, please. Thank you. Our next participant is Renita Armstrong. You may begin. Hello, my name is Renita Armstrong. I'm with the Bellflower Unified School District. And we have three high schools and 10 elementary schools. I am currently, uh, I am the immediate past president of our board. And just last night, we had a town hall meeting um, to get our parents involved. You know, and I am also a, a, a mother and I have two children still in school. You know, so as parents and educators, it is an unfathomable uh, thought to lose a child and student in what is to, supposed to be a safe haven. So um, we need to do what we can to keep our schools safe. I want to thank Supervisor Hilda Solis for her motion to support um, President Biden's executive order. I fully support this because it is up to all of us, parents, educators, staff, and students to work together and ensure our safety from internal and external threats. We can unite and look out for one another, and we can spark change for the better to help Thank minimize Thank the you. risk of tragedy from reoccurring. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Carrie Karapitian. You may begin. Yes. Yes. Hi. Hello. My name is Karen Karapitian. I'm a tenant from the Los Angeles, California. I'm living in Glendale, and uh, I urge you to what yes to item 54A. Uh, and I ensure that tenants across no, we're the not, country I'm, are protected I'm sorry. against the... We're not on that item. We're on item 13. 54A will be later in the agenda. Thank you. Next speaker on item 13. We have no more telephonic. We'll go into in person. Okay. Ah. Herman, are you up? So... A decision of the Supreme Court, 562 U.S. 443, Miss Attorney, dealing with not blessed, just cursed. Because our dumb, dumb 46th president has cursed America, and we are doomed. We are doomed. That's why we need Bagdazarian versus the United States of Pasadena to give me the Second Amendment to protect the United States of America with a 50 caliber if I could. Because no one here is going to save America. You're all a bunch of cowards. 
You're all hiding behind a glass door to not reality, but stupidity. Guns don't kill people. People who misuse guns kill other people. I use a gun to hunt. I use a gun to protect myself. And now I'm fucked, for the record. Next speaker, please. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in the queue. Okay, hearing no other comments, item 13 is now before us. Moved by Supervisor Solis, I'll second it. To approve this item, Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 13 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, we're gonna move on to item 16, proclaiming Cesar Chavez Day 2023. It's held by Supervisor Solis. For members of the public on the telephone, please press one then zero now to comment on item 16, proclaiming Cesar Chavez Day. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know many of us here may know his story, but there's so many people that don't out in our, in our county. Um, Cesar Chavez, as some may know, was born on March 31st, 1927. He spent much of his youth as a migrant farm worker with his family. His life in the field provided him with firsthand experience of the mistreatment, low wages, and deplorable working conditions affecting migrant farm workers. Cesar Chavez was committed to making a change for the better. Cesar Chavez became a labor organizer back in the 1950s. He formed the National Farm Workers Association in 1962 and was later joined forces with the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee to initially then form the National United Farm Workers. Throughout his life, Cesar Chavez was at the forefront of leading marches, hunger strikes, and boycotts to bring attention to the plight of the many farm workers. Cesar Chavez used nonviolent means to both bring national focus and drive change to improve the rights of workers, as well as to help them secure medical coverage, fair wages, and benefits. His slogan, as we all know, Si se puede, means yes we can. And it continues to inspire so many of our communities around the world to this very day. In 2004, the state of California established an official holiday for Cesar Chavez and President Barack Obama later declared Cesar Chavez Day a federal commemorative holiday in 2014. And here at the County of Los Angeles on 2017, we joined the federal government in establishing a holiday to commemorate Cesar Chavez's birthday and the legacy of this civil rights icon. And today I'm proud to lead the motion in proclaiming Monday, March 27, 2023 as Cesar Chavez Day. The motion also instructs all our departments, as well as the sheriff, district attorney, assessor, and the superintendent of LA County Office of Education to work with the library, La Plaza Cultura y Artes, and Department of Parks and Recreation in promoting and sponsoring their Cesar Chavez Day related events, programs, and resources. It also encourages our county residents to participate in volunteering efforts as well as events being held throughout their communities to commemorate the legacy of Cesar Chavez. And this Friday, ahead of the Cesar Chavez Day, I'll also be honoring nine individuals and organizations to continue his legacy. And I want to congratulate the following. David Diaz, Executive Director of Active SGV. Hector Barajas, Veteran and Founder of Stop Deporting Veterans. Elizabeth Renteria, Clinical Chief Officer at Tri-City Mental Health and Azusa Community Advocate. Lourdes Saab, Chief of Protocol here at our LA County Office of Protocol. Erica Anzoteki, our LA County Alternative Public Defender. Jackie Contreras, our Director of DPSS. Norma Edith Garcias Gonzalez, our Director of Department of Parks and Recreation. And Esperanza Immigration Right Project and Catholic Charities of Los Angeles and the Immigration Center for Women and Children. I'm so grateful for their service, all of these individuals, and let's continue to celebrate what Cesar Chavez taught us all to do in a nonviolent way to, to spread peace, harmony, and leadership and protection for all workers, both men and women. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Horvath. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Solis, for bringing this motion forward. I'm happy on March 27th, we will celebrate Cesar Chavez Day in Los Angeles County. This day of commemoration is particularly important here in Los Angeles because of the significant contributions that Cesar Chavez made in our home state of California. The daily lives of some of our most vulnerable residents would look very different today if it weren't for his decades of dedication. His work and message are important, and I'm glad that our county libraries, uh, the Plaza de Cultura y Artes, and the Department of Parks and Recreations all have Cesar Chavez Day related events, programs, and resources that our, commun that our community can attend um, in person. Lastly, I would like to give a plug for one of our local three, uh, local district three events. For over 20 years, we've been a strong supporter of the Cesar Chavez March for Justice. I'm proud to continue that tradition. Uh, this year, we're sponsoring their 27th annual event, which will be on March 26th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. The rally starting point will be at Coima Charter Elementary School, and the Cultural and Resource Fair will be at Richie Valens Recreation Center. And I invite everyone to join the March for Justice and support the work and message that Cesar Chavez exemplified. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and let me also say thank you, Supervisor Police, for bringing this forward. It's always the right time to honor Cesar uh, and his legacy and his message of nonviolence. And really, when he was uh, doing his hunger strikes and his marching for, you know, the farm workers who were, who were, you know, working in such dire conditions. Uh, and most people didn't realize, you know, when they when they had their food on their table, where it came from, how hard the workers worked, and he really was lifting up their stories. Um, I remember my mom, who really was not an activist by any sense of the word, she kind of just was a, a great little homemaker, but uh, she was so moved by Cesar's uh, asking for the boycott of grapes and lettuce, you know, from average, you know, I don't mean this in a demeaning way, but housewives. Um, and he was getting his message to them, and my mother quit buying grapes and lettuce. Go ahead. And I know, right? And 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 told us about it at the dinner table why she was doing that. And I think that was his, you know, his uh, strategy was brilliant uh, to get people who were just used to going to the grocery store and buying these things to stop buying them uh, because of the conditions. So great opportunity, always every year to lift up Cesar. Uh, and his, um, yeah, again, message of nonviolence and lifting up those essential workers. We didn't call them, them that at that point, but that's exactly what they are. So thank you. Uh, do we have members of, oh, wait, I have somebody else on here. Supervisor Mitchell. Oh, and Supervisor Barger. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I just, you know, it, I'm proud to be a resident of a county that, that honored his memory and his legacy by declaring it a holiday. Um, but I always feel a little awkward when we consider these holidays, because these really should be days of service, um, like Dr. King's um, birthday, as well as Caesar, to, to, to acknowledge what they contributed individually, personally, giving their lives, literally and figuratively, um, for what they believed in. And so I just hope that we all find opportunities, considering what we're facing right now as a country, um, that we aren't... Um, um, as far from uh, um, those times as we would like to be in terms of fighting for the rights of workers uh, and underrepresented communities. So I just hope that everyone will consider some act of service in his honor on his birthday. Thank you very much for the motion. Thank you. Supervisor Barger. And actually, I'll add on to that, um, Supervisor Mitchell, because while we've come a long way, in my district, we have, I have a lot of agriculture, and that wage theft is still a problem. And it's something this board has addressed, but we need to continue to be vigilant because we know that that was one of the issues that um, Cesar Chavez focused on, um, was the fact that they were not being paid um, for the work that they were doing, a proper wage for the work they were doing, and some were not being paid at all. They were being taken advantage of. And that is happening, and it's happening in agriculture, but also with illegal cannabis as well. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to um, continue to be vigilant and, and celebrate his memory by, by making sure that this doesn't continue to happen in LA County. So I support this motion wholeheartedly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, are there members of the public that would like to speak on this item? Executive Officer. 
Yes, there's uh, telephonic speakers. Okay, let's go to them. Our first participant is Renita Armstrong. You may begin. Hello, this is, this is Renita Armstrong from Bellflower Unified School District with a total of 13 schools, and I am excited to have this. Uh, thank you so much, supervisors. Um, you know, Cesar Chavez, he was a great teacher, and he loved students. And he had 10 core values, which was service to others, sacrifice, a preference to help the most needy, determination, nonviolence, acceptance, respect for life and the environment, community, knowledge, and innovation. This, uh, we, we need to celebrate him and learn. Such a great teacher, so much to learn from him. And there are so many people right now today are still connected to him. If we don't get to Tehachapi and where La Paz is, you know, he has a beautiful national park in, in La Paz, and that's where he did his groundwork. So much history. He has a son. Thank that you. has turned 66 years old to uh, this year, yes. which is unfortunately how old Cesar Chavez yes. was when yes. he passed thank away. Thank you. Thank you. So I thank you. Thank you so, thank you so I'm much. I'm loving this. Yeah, I've had a chance <laughs> to meet his son Paul and his daughter Eloise, uh, who talked about what it was yes. like to grow up yes. as his kids. Yeah, fascinating. Um, thank you for that. Uh, next speaker, yes. please. Our next participant is Roy Humphreys. You may begin. Okay, folks, just for a little uh, catch up on things. Uh, number one, Cesar Chavez was uh, not for illegal immigration. He wanted everybody to be legally coming into the United States as uh, farm workers. And uh, number uh, two on the situation is that uh, not only did he want them to be uh, legal, uh, but why don't we look and remember about the uh, Spanish slash Mexicans and the Patron system, if you want to talk about human slavery down in Mexico, where they came from, a uh, Patron. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Sisoa Quinones. You may uh, begin. I Yes, I stand in support of the motion. My only question is, ¿por qué no lo hicieron el 31 de marzo, que es el día de su cumpleaños? Um, I just wanted to know why is it it's not on the 31st, the day of his birthday. Thank you. In support. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Diana Beard-Williams. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. I simply wanted to share that I think it's wonderful that we have celebrations and acknowledgement of the sacrifices of all of these heroes, especially Cesar Chavez. But I recall something that Dr. King's daughter Bernice said, he is gone now and who will carry the banner behind him? And so while we celebrate and we put on a pedestal the great things these people have done. I think that we also need to look at the things that are actually happening in our communities that are not being addressed. And don't overshadow that with the celebration. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. There are no other speakers in the queue. Madam, Madam Chair, Chair, there are no speakers in queue okay, to address the board. In, in no. Is there an echo in here? Um, okay, uh, hearing no other comments, item 16 is now before us, moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by um, Supervisor Horvath. To approve this item, Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 16 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hunt, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, now we're going to move on to item 28, uh, Treasurer and Tax Collector Investment Policy, which I held. And for members of the public on the telephone, please press one, then zero now to comment on this item. Uh, and uh, we do have Keith Knox, our Treasurer and Tax Collector, is here. Um, you know, I just thought this might be a timely uh, to hear from our, our treasurer and, and tax collector about our um, investment policy uh, in the county of Los Angeles. I think we've all 
watched uh, the news again uh, of uh, banks collapsing and, uh, you know, mainly like average folks being anxious and nervous, um, you know, worried about, you know, runs on banks. It reminds us a little bit of what was happening, uh, you know, in 2008, but also reminds me of uh, what happened with Orange County in, in the 90s when that whole county uh, went bankrupt because of uh, risky investments. And um, I just wanted to uh, hear directly from our LA County's uh, Treasurer and Tax Collector, Keith Knox. Uh, and maybe Keith, uh, you can just start this off and then if my colleagues have some comments, uh, give us your perspective on the situation, maybe about w what happened to these banks. Uh, one of them was in California, uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and, you know, if we, you know, how are our investments? Have we had any investments that might have been tied to these banks which collapsed? Have you kind of reviewed our investments as a result of what's happening? Um, I and mean, we just want to know as a county, uh, you know, that our investments are solid and, and prudent. But I do think, you know, maybe even the public it wants to be, is a little bit concerned about what's happening. So, um, Keith, did you want to start off? In, uh, uh, Supervisor Barger, do you want to? Okay, let's let Keith start this off. Sure, thank you, Chair Hahn and Supervisors. Good afternoon. Also with me, I have Demia Johnson, who is our Assistant Treasurer over Internal Controls, and she's the one that holds us accountable and makes sure we ad adhere to our investment policy at all times. Um, first and foremost, I, I wanted to mention and acknowledge that the Treasury pool did not have any investments um, in Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, First Republic, or Credit Suisse. Um, we do not have a depository relationship either with any of those banks. Um, you know, from everything we've read and heard, and I'm sure you've seen the news, it's, it's largely an issue of liquidity. And, and the fact that in the case of Silicon Valley, it was very much a, a like-minded set of depositors that they had, that they were all in the, in the tech industry for the most part and, and were funded by venture capitalist firms that were also um, depositing in the bank. Um, so there was a lack of diversification in terms of their business lines, also a lack of diversification in terms of their investments, which were extended out for a longer period to try and squeeze as much return as they could. As, in, as the interest rates increased, as some of the cash dried up, depositors went to look for their money. I think they also kind of fueled that run on the bank that we all heard about, like-minded depositors all trying to get access to their cash at the same time. The bank had a, a hard time liquidating and selling investments that were underwater long term. Um, to, to pick up on your next comment in terms of our investments, um, I think what this does is reaffirm the, the tenets of our investment policy, which under the government code prioritizes in this order the safety of the investments, first and foremost. They have to be secure. Second to that is the liquidity, which was, again, that huge issue for, for Silicon Valley Bank. We need to make sure that people that are in our pool have the money that they need to pay their bills, to fund their payroll, et cetera. Once we satisfy safety and, and liquidity, then we can focus on getting the best return on our investments and, and, and putting our, our money to work. Um, unlike Silicon Valley that had extended investments I like to uh, mention that our investment timeline looks a lot like a barbell. So on the front end, we have a, a, a significant portion of our investments that are one to two months out, very short, very liquid if we need them. Out several years, we have another big chunk of money that's sitting there earning, you know, uh, or, or getting a, a good return for us. And then sprinkled in between these two large amounts are, are things over one to two to three years. Um, we have historical data that shows us projections on how much we need, one year out, one month out, next day out, and then we also have an extra cushion should we need it just in reserve to, uh, to fund those that need the money. So you would say, because we're here to, uh, you know, vote on this, uh, your investment policy, our investment policy, so just listening to you, would you say that um, this policy that's before us will protect the county and depositors in the treasury pool? Correct. And um, based on, did anything that happened recently made, make you relook at our investment policy, or you feel like that just pretty much um, affirmed uh, and, and uh, 
validated uh, your current investment policy? Definitely reaffirmed. You know, this is an investment policy that our department, my predecessors, the board, the supervisors uh, in the past, um, that we collaborated on this very conservative, consistent practice that we have of adhering not just to government code, but actually being even a little more conservative than government code allows us. My investment team is even a little more conservative than the boundaries that your investment policy approved by your board allows us to be. We just wanna make sure we're conservative and consistent um, because that's what's most important is protecting the money. Thank you. Um, I have uh, on the queue Supervisor Barger, then Supervisor Mitchell, then Supervisor Horvath. First of all, thank you, because I mean, it, it's very confusing, but it's interesting that, that one of the causes was it was all investing in like-minded, probably, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, new tech. Um, and, and so a lot of that liquidity that you're talking about, I know in my district, with a lot of startups, they were, a lot of their money was tied up up there. Um, and so it is obviously focused more on the Silicon Valley type uh, uh, industries. But I want to understand, do you think that the increasing interest rates or are they going to have an, by the Federal Reserve are going to have an impact on our borrowing ability or um, any of our own investment strategies? You know, in terms of our borrowing ability, you know, we have very good ratings. We, we have good access to capital when we need it. Um, you know, as interest rates go up, we will certainly pay a little more when we borrow than we did when they were low. Um, so, you know, on one hand, we're seeing our um, earnings rate on our pool increase. You know, it's, it's gone from under a percent a year ago to now it's over 3%, which is good on the revenue side. But again, when we do borrow money, we will, we will pay a little more of a premium for that. And what is our ceiling as it relates to how much we float in bonds? Is it 10%? Is it, I mean, isn't there a percentage in terms of what this county will, will allocate in bonds? Yeah, it, you know, it, it can be a measure of a, a percentage of our, our unrestricted revenues. I, I hate to put a percentage on it. Right now, as, as we tell the rating agencies every year, our debt burden is very modest um, given our unrestricted revenues. And so with the high interest rates, that's probably going to, that would impact as well when we would want to, um, to get bond, bond for different projects, correct? Again, it would just be reflected in the, in the price we would pay, you know, when we borrowed money. It would, it would be higher than it would have when interest rates were lower. Okay. Well, I appreciate you bringing this forward because I do think it's important. I mean, I take pride in the fact that both here with what the county does, but also with our pension in La Serra, um, are both, in which you sit on the board of Lucera. Yes, sir. Um, we're mindful of being um, uh, conservative as it relates to um, the way we invest, but also in how we allocate um, the money to different different uh, banks, et cetera. So I just want to thank you for your work and your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you, um, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Knox, for your presentation, a couple things I really want to thank you for. First of all, I was very relieved to know that you consider environment, social, and corporate governance scores of companies in the, count, in the county's investment por portfolios. I think that's important to the people I represent. Uh, and also that um, you've worked with my office really to make sure that we um, uh, are not investing uh, or rewarding discriminatory financial institutions by banking with them. So I appreciate that lens that you're using. What struck me was uh, in your comments about the failed banks uh, recently, and you talked about like-minded investors, which was my assumption. I was surprised to hear from, from some LA County-based nonprofit organizations who used the Silicon Valley Bank, one of which was the South LA Land Trust. I, I, I heard, frankly, through the grapevine. And so I'm wondering, um, is there anything we need to do proactively as the county or banking institutions in LA County really to make sure that we're providing uh, institutions or banking products that are meeting perhaps the, the, the needs of, of new innovative kind of organizations so they don't have to bank outside of LA County? Thank you, Supervisor. And I, and I think there we can leverage our relationships with our, our banking partners that we have. You know, those are very important to us because they also help us facilitate business when the county needs to facilitate business. But we also talk to them significantly about their community reinvestment efforts. 
and, and the services and the products that they're offering to our businesses because we want to retain businesses in our county mm -hmm. and, and offer services and products to our constituents who we want to have safe, secure access to a diverse set of banks as well. So that's, that's where we can leverage our relationship. Thank you for that. Good question. Uh, Supervisor Horvath. Thank you very much. I just wanted to thank you for your presentation, your great stewardship of our funds, and to thank this board for the environmental, social, and corporate governance guidelines, uh, which you put in place in 2021, which I fully support, placing a greater emphasis on environmental, social, and corporate governance when the county's making investment choices. With over $50 billion in investments, we have the opportunity to use our money to invest in the things that reflect our values, and so I thank this board uh, for making those choices and want to thank you for your presentation here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see no other supervisors on the queue. Are there members of the public that would like to speak on this item? Will Donald Harlan please come forward and staff will assist you. Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker please. Madam Chair, there are no speakers in queue to address the board. Okay, is there someone in person? Oh, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Hi. Donald Harlan. This is about agenda item number 28. The Treasury tax collector wants to spend the money from the unincorporated communities. If the tax revenue from the unincorporated communities belongs to those people, why is the county in there spending money on unincorporated parts of the county? You know, those, that, that's my money. Uh, another thing is uh, there's lots of attempts by the county supervisors to grab money from anywhere. It's unincorporated, they wanna develop it. If there's open land, they wanna develop it. They want the money. All of those properties that you have endorsed for real estate development, in LA County that are illegal all come off your tax base, all of them. That includes this money you're trying to steal. Thank trying you. Trying to spend other people's Thank money. You. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers. Okay, um, thanks again uh, to both of you for coming. It sounds like our uh, investment policy is sound and um, and sensitive and in good shape. So thank you for that. Uh, colleagues, item 28 is before us now. I'm gonna move it, seconded by um, Supervisor Barger to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 28 is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Horvath. Oh, I don't know where she went. I don't think she's here. No, okay, she's absent. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Okay, we're gonna move on to now to item 45, report by the Inspector General on reforms and oversight efforts. For members of the public on the telephone, please press one then zero now to comment on item 45. We have with us, there you, uh, yeah, did you, uh, do you want to be recorded on the last vote for the investment policy? No, that was a yes, please. So, Supervisor Barger, aye, and so we'll make the change five to zero, motion carries on item 28, thank you. Thank you, um, and we have with us Max Huntsman, Inspector General, Sergio Aloma, Assistant Sheriff, Bruce Chase, Assistant Sheriff, and Dr. Timothy Belovich, Director of Correctional Health Services, are all here uh, and available for questions. Chair, make remarks. Here we go. Uh, colleagues, oh, I held this item so we could uh, get some updates about the issues we're continuing to see in the Office of Inspector General. Uh, quarterly reports. While so much uh, in these reports is the same each time, there are also some changes to this one to be hopeful about, I think. Uh, I'd like to hear from our Sheriff's Department about those changes and any progress being made in a moment. But first, I wanted to ask um, our Inspector General Max Huntsman 
uh, for a brief overview of this particular quarterly report. Max. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to clarify, Bruce Chase is not with us today, but there are some, some folks who work with him who are available on- Is there someone here that, we, that I didn't introduce? Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Commander Valerie Silguero, assigned at Countywide Services Division. Commander, welcome. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, Captain Andrew Meyer, assigned to the Hom Homicide Bureau. Captain? Okay, good. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, Max. Uh, the report, as you mentioned, has the format that we usually have, so there's a lot of information in it that is, um, in a sense, repetitive. But the important parts, I think, are two that relate to jail overcrowding. The first relates to lack of programming in CRDF, or more specifically, racial disparities in the manner in which programming is provided. Uh, and that's uh, an ongoing concern. As we mentioned, it's the fifth report in which we pointed this out. Um, I think it's related to overcrowding. I'll go into why in a moment. And then the other one is within uh, grievances. You'll see that a very high proportion of the grievances relate to medical care. And I think that also is uh, a symptom of the overcrowding that we have. In both these respects, the, the programming that doesn't happen appropriately at CRDF could happen better if we had a better ratio of staff to prisoners. And as uh, Dr. Belovich, who's here, has told this board before with respect to mental health care, uh, we just are not in a position where we can possibly comply with our court orders and the Constitution if we don't reduce our population. And I think that applies also to CRDF and also to the medical problem, the larger medical problem, which he was not addressing in those comments. Uh, fortunately, although the Constitution orders us not to mistreat people in our care, uh, the California state law gives us a simple solution in Government Code Section 8658, which permits the uh, release of prisoners when there is an emergency situation that threatens them. And we all know about that because of COVID. Um, but prior to COVID, in 2008, the Appellate Court of Cal uh, California ruled specific specifically on the statute. When the state prison was in the, in the process of, of melting down because of poor medical care, there was a court case in which the Appellate Court said, yes, that code section, that emergency code section applies to overcrowding and it, in, it empowered the governor to make special contracts for private um, prisons because of the fact that otherwise the C C um, CDCR would have to release people under that code section. So we have that same code section available to us today. Uh, the sheriff uh, has the keys to the jail, as I've said before. For the last four years, we had a sheriff who openly violated the law and did not uh, follow any of the rules, including the Constitution in, in many regards, but we now have a sheriff who has campaigned on following the law. So I'm hopeful that uh, when this process, which is a little rocky to start, is done, uh, we will see um, that, that code section followed. Thank you. And um, before I uh, open it up to my colleagues for questions, I'd like to um, give Assistant Sheriff uh, Aloma or Dr. Belovich, or both, uh, an opportunity to respond to this report. Thank you, Supervisor, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to come here today and speak uh, to this report. Um, and I appreciate the OIG's comments and uh, their quarterly reports. As uh, Mr. Huntsman mentioned, uh, as we speak about CRDF, overcrowding, disparities in uh, work opportunities for the incarcerated population there, that is something that, uh, again, has been pointed out in previous reports and that we are taking seriously. Um, some of the things that you know I, we are looking at and that we have uh, recently started looking at, uh, and by recently I mean as recently as this past January um, when I took over as Assistant Sheriff of Custody Operations, um, we noted that in the OIG reports uh, there was a lack of tracking as it related to specifically uh, women who were given opportunities for work programs at CRDF and disparities uh, amongst the Afri African American population there. So one of the things that we looked at was a uh, software system and contracting for one that would help us better uh, track uh, that data uh, upon intake, which we are still currently uh, negotiating uh, a contract for that. However, 
we established uh, an internal system with our IT uh, personnel. It's temporary, but it's helping us to better track uh, the offer of work opportunities when they come in. Um, the fourth quarter report of the OIG report, at the time, uh, there was about 8.5% uh, of the African American women at CRDF were uh, enrolled in work programs. Uh, today, that number sits at about 14.2%, so we've seen some incremental improvements in uh, those opportunities for work programs for specifically the African-American population. Uh, one other thing that we took note of was uh, serious and violent charges against African-American women uh, upon intake at CRDF, uh, those that were charged with those serious and violent um, crimes. And their opportunities based on our uh, policies related to uh, their uh, involvement in work programs. So one of the things that I asked our staff to do was to revisit those policies as it relates to serious and violent charges being disqualifiers. Uh, we know that, uh, again, based on our current population today, that about 60% of incarcerated uh, African American women are charged with serious and, and violent uh, charges. So we are re-examining uh, their ability to participate and not necessarily disqualify them on those charges by themselves. Um, those are what's commonly referred to as M7 charges or serious and violent charges. So uh, we're, again, reevaluating those charges to see what charges we can remove so that they can participate. And rather than um, use that as a criteria, uh, rely more so on their behavior while they're with us, and as long as um, that we uh, don't see anything that uh, suggests that they cannot participate, uh, making those opportunities available to them. So it's an on, ongoing process uh, that we are uh, continually focused on and working on. Thank you. Tim? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for uh, asking me to be here today. Uh, I know you may have some specific questions about the report that um, I'll, I'll try my best to answer. Um, but in general, um, to, to comment on uh, what the Inspector General ha had mentioned, uh, we continue to struggle to provide health care. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not a surprise when I was with you several months ago um, talking about the previous report. Um, not a lot has changed on the ground, except I can say, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that what has changed is there's been an all hands on deck effort uh, to, to get more staffing, to identify challenges, to improve staffing, to, um, to look at the processes that could become more efficient in the county. We're working very closely with CEO and CEO staff um, and uh, with county council on, on this to come into compliance with some of our, our mandates with the Department of Justice, but also just generally improving the care that we're able to provide. So, so that effort has been uh, all hands on deck and very positive. We haven't seen the fruit of it at the moment because that does take time. Uh, but again, as I, I sit here, just our population has dipped some, uh, but obviously not enough for us to provide the, the care that we need to be able to provide uh, at, at this point. Uh, we, as the report states, we, uh, we had 42 deaths uh, in uh, 2022 in, in our system. Uh, and uh, we uh, examine each of those deaths very, very closely to see if there's something we need to change in terms of policy, in terms of the way we, we, we provide care. Um, Supervisor Solis, we've also been working with your staff on identifying, uh, you had mentioned last time I was here that, that we agreed that there were a lot of people who probably didn't need to be with us in the jail. And so looking at a closer look, if there are ways that we can facilitate getting them out of custody uh, into care in the community. So we've been working with your staff on that as well. Um, and so I, I think that our eyes are in, in the right direction uh, as to, to the things we need to be focused on. We just haven't realized it at, at, at the moment. Thank you. Okay, I'll go to my colleagues now for some more specific questions. I have Supervisor Solis, Supervisor Barger, and Supervisor Horvath on the queue. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for holding the item, and I want to thank uh, Max Huntsman and, and Dr. Belovich. I would say, though, that most of this report is reflective of the past administration, so we know we have a ways to go. I realize that, but uh, Dr. Belovich, I want to ask you, do you have any data on this, 
beginning of this year in terms of deaths in the jails right now? Do you have a number? Uh, yes. Um, as of today, we've experienced six deaths in the jail. Um, two of them occurred over this past weekend. Uh, so prior to uh, prior to Friday, we had we had had four. Uh, uh, we are waiting for the classification of, of most of them, um, but we believe we've had one suicide this year, um, and we've had, uh, I believe the rest are, 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 they're undetermined, but based on what we know, we would classify them as natural. Uh, they, some of them had been with us for, for years in our care and uh, uh, died at the medical center. Right. So, so um, for the person who may have committed suicide, as, as you state, um, my concern is just knowing what kind of mental health evaluation, appropriate diagnosis, and is there that check-in that's needed? I mean, was the person by themselves in a cell? How did what happened? Yeah. Can you reflect on that, if possible? Uh, so, for for the death that occurred in 2023, yeah. Uh, it, it, yes, um, we we've examined the, the death. Uh, and the circumstances surrounding the death, um, in terms of the health care, uh, I'm not sure that I can provide you, you at the, this moment the, the level of detail, but uh, I, I can provide your office. Um, but we, we've examined that death and um, uh, taken it, corrective actions. We didn't find corrective actions from a health care standpoint, but we found corrective actions from a physical plant standpoint that we wanted to make. Uh, with our custody partners, and uh, and those are in progress. And what um, were those due to? Could you talk about that? The corrective action. What 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 did you find? Uh, the the individual was a, was able to uh, to scale a, a part of a, a wall and and uh, throw himself uh, from from that wall. Uh, uh, we have in the past made um, physical plant changes that prevent that, so so individuals can't jump off of tiers, um, and so so we make those we made those changes years ago, and it, it had been very successful. But unfortunately, when one avenue is closed, it, people look for another way to harm themselves. So sometimes we have individuals who may throw themselves off of a top bunk, or who may climb up a set of stairs and throw themselves down those stairs. So. We, we can't make a facility suicide proof, but we work our best to make it suicide resistant. Um, and uh, again, so, sometimes there, are, there are, are things that we would not have envisioned that someone would, would, uh, would use to harm themselves uh, that we then have to look back and say, you know, do we, do we have to make these physical plant changes? Just a question, did we know he had these tendencies, suicidal or? Was that documented anywhere in, in terms of his care? And I mean, if he if he managed to go over a wall, he must have been outside somewhere. Or, I mean, I don't know. Uh, he he wasn't out. He wasn't outside. Um, and and I, uh, I I'm happy wall. to share the details with you. I'm just not sure I yeah. should share them in okay, in this fine. forum, but I, I absolutely will. Okay, thank you. Um, and and just um, for. Uh, I think one other question I wanted to ask you, doctor, before I turn it over to, I want to hear from Max. If you could uh, tell me what you and your team are doing regarding the deaths overall, like what kinds of corrective action plans are you taking there? Because I think for a while um, we were getting a lot of reports of people uh, in the jails that were dying. And, and I understand they mm -hmm. some have medical conditions that have been going on for many years, but all the more reason should they really be there. Should they not be perhaps in another maybe facility that could care for those illnesses if it, if it looks terminal? Yeah. So, I mean, could you talk about that? Sure. Um, the, in terms of individuals who we don't believe uh, need to be in our custody uh, or, or our care, um, we work with, with our custody partners and we prepare uh, requests for compassionate release. Um, and we've shared some of those with, with, uh, with your office. Um, some have successfully gone through and some do not. And that's part of what we're working on uh, with your office to determine if, if there are better ways to go about this or if there are, are, again, I think we agree that sometimes the bar may be very high to get someone out of custody uh, for a compassionate release. 
Um, but in, in, other, in every death, when we, we do our death review, we have multiple reviews, and we look at the medical care, we look at the, we look at the emergency response to the, to the care when, when we are aware that someone is in distress. We look at our policies surrounding, surrounding uh, the care. Um, we look at the practice of our clinicians um, and our medical staff. Uh, custody has a similar look at all of their processes, and we, we ask ourselves in a very qualitative manner, does something need to change? Is it a policy change? Was there uh, a training issue? Um, was there, there an issue with, with the, the competency of the provider? Was, was uh, you know, any number of things. We, we look at, at, at sort of any possibility to see if there's something that we should do to be changing our system. I and mean, I think that's a very common way that correctional systems do look at their systems in order to, to make needed changes, especially to prevent future deaths. So, so just a quick question for the sheriffs. Uh, is, there a, is there a perhaps ability to have a policy change when we look at these uh, inmates that are severely ill and it doesn't look like they are going to have a successful stay within our, in our jail and that they are extremely critical in critical health that there might be some look at you know more, more readily available conversations that could somehow provide a policy that says in these instances, you know, we agree. I don't know if the, if the new sheriff has, uh, Sheriff Luna has even entertained that or if the staff has done that yet. Yeah, so the, um, our position is that we are always open to looking at policy and seeing where we can uh, change policy where uh, needed or necessary and when we're able to uh, within uh, the law. Uh, as it relates to compassionate releases, uh, that's something that we partner very closely with our partners at Correctional Health Services to determine whether or not this person qualifies under current policies or practice in working with uh, the healthcare providers uh, as well as any other reasons that would disqualify this person for a compassionate release such as uh, charges and working with our justice partners to determine whether or not we can, but we are always open to looking and reviewing and changing policy where we can and if we can. Be interesting to see when the last time the policy was reviewed, if that can be shared perhaps. I mean, I think that's, that might be of interest. I know it's a, I'm, I have an interest in that. We'd be happy to. To see where we're going there and, and obviously get uh, input from, from our OIG. And, and Max, I know you've been uh, telling us, you've already reported to us uh, that there's a, a new attitude in this new administration, which is great. Uh, and for example, um, just I wanted to hear if you could talk about the release of any uh, footage, body-worn camera footage, things that um, I, I've heard the, the sheriff say he's going to be releasing uh, for some of the some of those um, shootings that have occurred in the past and what you have uh, learned from that. I don't have a lot to say yet because we're just in, begin in the beginning process, but the stated position of the sheriff's department is one of greater transparency. Certainly my office has been given access as promised to body-worn camera footage. That doesn't help the public directly, but it, but it certainly helps oversight and, and helps uh, you conduct uh, your oversight duties. So that's a plus. Uh, I believe because uh, the board has opened up the, the new 1421 section in county council that we're going to have an expanded ability to respond to public requests, as well as part of that is an order by the board that information that can be made public be placed on the website immediately. Well, that includes body-worn camera footage in a timely manner as well as additional footage under California law. And as I said, the sheriff has made a, a big plank of his uh, being sheriff is following the law. So I anticipate that we will see uh, body-worn camera going up on that website uh, quicker than it used to, but we haven't seen that suddenly change immediately because it requires uh, work on the part of county council, work on the part of the sheriff's department, and then ult ultimately tech work in some cases to blur out some aspects of things. So, so it's not something that's really borne fruit completely yet, a little like what we were hearing about uh, our, our medical efforts in jail, but, it, but all, all the indicators are positive. 
Does Sheriff want to respond to that? So I'll, I'll respond uh, briefly, and then uh, if Captain Meyer wants to take the, the rest of the question, uh, I know that Sheriff Luna in, in our administration is uh, uh, very open to releasing body cam footage when we can and, and being transparent in that regard. I know that uh, there were a number of uh, deputy-involved shooting uh, body cam uh, videos from last year that were uploaded recently to our public uh, website, as well as at least a couple this year. I, I don't know the exact number, but we are in the process of uh, actively and currently releasing and posting those videos to our uh, public website for, for viewing. And if uh, Captain Meyer wants to expound upon that. Yes, ma'am. We've been working hard at Homicide Bureau is, is part of the uh, Body Worn Camera Bureau falls under Homicide Bureau. And uh, the, over the last couple months, we've been working hard to make sure that all those Body Worn Camera videos from last year were open to the public and uh, placed on our transparency website. The, there's a lot of work that goes into those, and we have two different uh, directions now on how to put, put those together. We have an internal uh, system that we have where we use our own personnel to actually edit and put together the videos and combine all the, uh, the uh, voiceovers for these videos. And then we have an external uh, company that, that we are using uh, to assist us to speed up the process. So uh, for instance, the two body-worn camera videos that were released from this year, from 2023, were from a, a company called Cole Media. And, and we helped, we, they, we utilized them to help us speed up this process. We have a pretty good process internally, but now we have a process externally that we can also use to speed up that process when we have when we have to do so. And that's what we did uh, within the last couple of months to get those up to date. Do you wanna say anything, Max, on that? Um, I, 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 I applaud that approach. During the height of concern about George Floyd and, and the aftermath in a, in a series of shootings throughout the country, the, the places in which there was civil unrest were the ones in which information was not shared. It wasn't always a result of how serious the shooting itself was. It was often the reaction of the public to what they perceived, and I think usually correctly, as an unwillingness to be transparent. So I think that putting up video quickly is very important. Uh, however, I will point out that the California law is not ambiguous on this point, that when there is a shooting, all investigatory materials must be placed uh, made available to the public immediately, absent a written statement by the, uh, the governmental entity as to why they can't do that. And I believe it is still our practice at the Sheriff's Department not to follow that law, that we just don't give out materials and we don't produce a written statement as to why we should do it. Um, that's the same practice that we used to have with, with respect to autopsy holds, and the COC is going to bring the new coroner in and talk about that issue. Uh, I hope these are growing pains, but but still we're not in full compliance with the law in the in the instance I gave. I'm not aware of any single time in, in, since that law was passed that the Sheriff's Department has complied with it. So we still have, uh, have a ways to go. I'm sure we'll be looking forward to an update on that. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Parker. Well, thank you, and, and to follow up on, on the whole issue of the, the cameras, on a couple of the cases that you cited, Max, um, there was either the cameras were turned on late or and or there were no body-worn cameras used. So what is the status of the rollout of that? Because, I mean, I look at it from the standpoint of protecting both the public but also the deputies um, that are involved, and it tells the story. So where are we with the rollout on that? I'm sorry, ma'am, we said- On, on the body-worn cameras, because on a couple of the cases oh, that were out. cited in here, um, for example, SEB. Okay, so, so yes, ma'am, uh, as far as the rollout go, goes, uh, all of our patrol stations has been outfitted. Uh, we are still in the current process of outfitting our Narcotics Bureau and our uh, Special Enforcement Bureau, which includes the SWAT team. Excellent. Okay, um, and then, you know, the board is- has long been concerned with conditions in the IRC, room confinement and jail overcrowding. That's something that this board collectively has been supporting um, in terms of addressing that issue across the board. During the last OIG report in January, Dr. Belovich mentioned that about 6,800 or 47% of the inmate population are enrolled in mental health programs. Um, I can't imagine that number has changed significantly in the last two months, has it? It's pretty consistent. 
or has it grown? That's correct. It, That's it's, it's remained about the same. So you also mentioned the population of inmates classified as high observation is about 1,500, which is an increase of about 600 inmates from four years ago. So it's clear we have a growing population of mentally ill inmates while we are also trying to comply with provisions of our DOJ consent decree. And I fully understand that unless we reduce the population in our jails, compliance will be difficult to accomplish. But the one concern I have is, you know, when you talk about on the, the health side, if someone has a health ailment, um, getting them a bed is probably a lot easier than it is for someone who's mentally ill. And my concern is if we're releasing individuals that do have mental health issues, that we are setting them up for recidivism or um, endangering them in the public. I mean, I feel because there is no place to send them. Um, last week, we had a discussion about the fact that we're trying to get services in Pasadena. Out of 14 contracts, only two have space for individuals and the wait time is incredibly long. And so I just would caution us as a board to recognize that the individuals that we may have to release because of the fact that we can't provide mental health care may not get it out on the street as well. And so the question is, are we setting them up to be put in a position to either end up back in jail with a, a, a more uh, a hideous cr crime or or they take their own life? And so I'd, I'd like to know your thoughts on that and how you triage. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. There, there's, there's no good solution to this uh, at, at this point, at, at this moment. Uh, I think we we all agree that the the, the the solution to this is building this county's infrastructure of appropriate beds uh, for for acute mentally ill patients, um, and we're not there yet. We we have we have uh, far too few beds that, that we need, um, and so even when we we if, any release we have is a difficult release because it's difficult to find uh, appropriate beds at times and and. Uh, and to to ensure that that handoff is often done correctly, um, so so it is it, it, it's a challenge and it'll continue to be a challenge until we have a place for these individuals to go in the community. Um, in terms of, of triaging, uh, are you referring to triaging at intake and within, throughout the yeah within those that you would determine would be better suited outside the jail because they're not getting adequate services because um, we don't have the the ability or the people power to provide. Well, I think uh, I think that there are a, a large uh, number of individuals, and, and again, this is uh, only my opinion, uh, who uh, potentially the, the judicial system would feel more comfortable in allowing to be released if they knew that they were going to a program and going to a place where um, they would they would receive those services. Um, and uh, again, I I, I don't. I can't say that w with certainty, but that's my understanding. So that's a diversion side as, of it? as a form of diversion, yes. That there would be people, uh, there would be individuals who, who could could right. safely program and receive their services in the community. But if those if those services don't exist, there's the, it, it just becomes a hypothetical. And and that's actually that's that's my concern is that that's why the DOJ is breathing down our necks right now, breathing down your necks right now as it relates to compliance. And I know that you know we um, uh, have um, Maggie Carter, who's here um, as the county's chief DOJ compliance officer, but if they can't be released into the community, and even if there were beds, but they're deemed to have to stay in our care, yeah. um, then we need to figure this out. And I know that Supervisor Hahn and Solis motion to address specific needs of the P3, P4 population was a step in the right direction. Um, but we need to we need to accelerate that, um, and we have had discussions about the release of inmates to reduce over, overcrowding. But we also need to have discussions about inmates that cannot be diverted or released, which is what we were just talking about. Correct. And and make provisions and ensure that they are getting the services that they're expected. Because you know when we talk about the state and what happened at the state, I don't know if any of you all have toured the prison up there, but they have state of the art everything because they were taken to court. And it wasn't out of the goodness of um, individuals' hearts. It was because they were told, you have to do that. You're keeping a population over a certain period of time. So if they're there, um, they have to have services across the board. Um, and uh, you know, if you haven't gone, I, I would tell you that it's, it is quite a sight to see. It's state of the art everything. Um, and you know, I, that's the reality of what could be coming our way if we do not ramp up and, and provide um, services at a level that, that the DOJ expects, and actually that the that the individuals deserve. Um, 
I'm going to leave it at that because I know out of respect of time, but I just want to thank you all. And, and in terms of, you know, the report, Max, um, I appreciate the fact that you did the jail and then also the patrol. And I know that we've got additional cases that you're reviewing right now. But the one thing I, I, want, I would ask of you, Commander and Captain, is when, when we're looking at these, if you could help us understand where, for example, a mental evaluation team would have been beneficial. Um, because I know one of the first things that I did when I was elected was increased the number of mental evaluation teams. I know we are tight on um, personnel, but I have to believe, you know, for example, in some of the cases that I know in my district, um, that probably would have helped de-escalate the situation. I don't know if it would have stopped it, um, but, you know, I'm hearing that, that that's something that a lot of my cities are also asking about that are contract cities. So I would just ask that you all keep that front and center in terms of, you know, um, corrective action and things that you would ask of this board to help um, to, to address some of the shootings that have been taking place. Thank you. Thank you. Were you going to respond to that, Commander? Or did you yes. Um, for the mental evaluation team, I'm assigned to Countywide Services Division and oversee the mental evaluation team. We currently have 36 co-response teams, and we partner with Department of Mental Health. Um, we would like to see the mental evaluation team expand, but it does come down to staffing, and unfortunately, you know, we are at um, critical staffing levels right now. Um, we would also need to partner with our, uh, our, our partners at uh, Department of Mental Health to see if they would be able to grow with us because it is that co-response model. But um, unfortunately, at this time, we wouldn't be able to expand. Thank, thank you. Thank uh, Supervisor Horvath. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, for Assistant Sheriff Loma, I couldn't help but notice that in West Hollywood there were 12 personnel complaints, uh, which makes West Hollywood one of the highest on the list currently. So can you tell me what happens with those complaints when they come in? How do, how do they get addressed? And does the person who files the complaint get a response from your department or from the station? How does that work? Yes, thank you. So I think you're referring to public complaints. Uh, what we refer to as watch commander service comment reports um, and the public has the opportunity every any time they um, wish uh, in any of our patrol stations to uh, file a complaint or a commendation of our personnel for uh, their performance so as it relates to specific complaints at a station the process is uh, laid out in policy that any member of the public can either uh, come to a station, call a station, uh, write to a station their complaint, and we will take a Watch Commander Service comment report. We have an obligation to respond to them, to let them know that we received it. That is done by a formal letter, uh, letting them know that we received it and that it's being reviewed. And then we have a period of about 30 days before we have to respond back to them with findings, unless there's reasons for delays that would uh, cause uh, more time than that for the complaint to be investigated, but there is a strict policy on uh, timelines and then getting back to uh, the community member who has filed that report with uh, the outcome of that inquiry by uh, station command staff, and that's reviewed all the way up to uh, division where uh, those reviews take place, and then they are provided a letter of response or a final letter letting them know the outcome uh, of that complaint. They're also provided with the opportunity to come to the station and uh, engage in conflict resolution with the personnel involved if everyone is amenable to that. Um, so that's our, our complaint uh, process. So what frankly. is the time limit? Because I know that there are sometimes that people have felt like they're, they haven't gotten a response. I, I hear you saying that there may be extenuating circumstances, but when will they expect to get a response? They should get a response, like I said, within the 30 days. Um, immediately upon uh, intake of that complaint at the station, um, if it's on the telephone, if they call in, then they'll, or in person, they'll get uh, someone that will take the, uh, do the intake of the complaint, usually the, the watch commander on duty, then that complaint is sent to um, the operations staff and ultimately the unit commander captain of that station who uh, writes a letter letting them know that the complaint has been received and it's being investigated and then we have approximately 30 days to complete it. However, it's the timing uh, of that completion could uh, depend on a number of factors involved that 
may require further investigation depending on the number of personnel involved, the number of uh, community members that were involved, witnesses that need to be uh, interviewed during that uh, Invest, the investigation of that complaint. And so is there, do you keep track of um, complaints that remain outstanding? Like could, I, could you provide me with that number for, for the West Hollywood station? How many complaints are still outstanding? Yes, we can provide you with that, absolutely, and we do keep track of that. Great. I, I know that, that there were 17 commendations, conversely, mm -hmm. at the Lost, uh, Malibu Lost Hill Station, so, you know, work is being recognized, and, and thank you for letting me know that so we can appropriately follow up. Um, two questions for the OIG. First, um, I see that there were seven incidents where deputies shot members of the public. Um, I, and it's my understanding that there's historically been a delay in cases getting to the final point of resolution um, where the DA conducts its review and makes a filing decision. Uh, your report notes that the oldest pending case is from 2017. Does that mean the delay issue is being resolved and do you know how many total cases are currently pending? I do not know the total number, uh, but we could certainly find out. Uh, I wouldn't say resolved because I believe this is a, an endemic problem in the district attorney's office, just like overcrowding in the jails is. But I will say they have recently taken steps to try to cut down on their backlog, to go back and do a aging cases and try to get them resolved, and they are making an effort to speed it up. But, but as long as uh, I've been aware of this issue when I was in the DA's office and since here, it's been a horrible problem and I think it continues to be. I think part of it's inherent to the desire to be perfect. And so they go through an exhaustive process and their idea of perfect in mind is not the same, but, but they, there's a lot of editing back and forth. So I think we will always find um, it takes a very long time to resolve most of those cases. Five years is unusual, but, but I think it's not unusual for them to, take, to sit in the Justice System Integrity Division for a long time, and I don't think that's gonna change. Okay, and in the same period of time, I saw that there were five final decisions issued by the Civil Service Commission. Um, three were sustained and two were reduced. Um, can you, do you do any sort of analysis on these decisions to better understand uh, reasons why discipline would be reduced? Not on an individual basis, uh, because it doesn't seem to serve any purpose. Um, historically, I can tell you that there have been times when the Sheriff's Department has collectively accused the Civil Service Commission of doing a, a, a poor job of um, reducing cases when they shouldn't. At the same time, there have been times when the Sheriff's Department, by myself amongst others, has been criticized for doing a poor job of investigating those cases. So the reasons why reductions happen uh, vary, but in general, I would say, in my experience, the Civil Service Commission often uh, reduces when it shouldn't, and in fact, there's a, a significant uh, case that was appealed to the court in which the court found they were applying the wrong standard. They were treating the process as a cat and mouse game between the employee and the employer. And if the employer made a mistake, then they were saying, oh, they, they should reduce it. And really, they should be looking at public safety. Because when uh, a deputy engages in something such as dishonesty, uh, I think in most cases that should be a firing offense and too often it gets reduced for a variety of reasons at a variety of stages. We have an extensive report on that on our website. Um, it's an ongoing problem. Um, so I can tell you that it's, yes, it should be a matter of concern, but it's, it's a very difficult uh, problem to address. As you know from LAPD and what happens there, that's, it, that's a huge challenge to, to do it as to police and also in the county at large, it's a difficult uh, challenge to be fair to workers uh, while at the same time uh, making sure that we hold our most important employees, the ones with badges and guns, uh, to a higher standard. So it's, it's a difficult thing to do. But we, so we watch it, and when we think we can make a change or make a point, we do. But we don't, on a regular basis, uh, conduct a reanalysis of what the Civil Service Commission does or even what uh, LASD's internal affairs does. Thank you. Uh, some of my questions have already been asked and answered, but um, to follow up on the um, uh, MET team, uh, you, uh, Commander, you had indicated that um, it's a personnel issue. Um, if is it that there are not people coming into the ranks who want who uh, would then be capable of serving in an MET team uh, deployment or? Well, currently we would have to take um, personnel who are assigned to patrol stations 
um, who are patrol trained and have them transfer to the mental evaluation team. And currently patrol stations are working at minimum staffing levels. So that they negatively impact the uh, patrol station. There aren't um, personnel who are in other positions that must come out of patrol. There aren't uh, personnel in other positions who could serve in those roles alongside someone from the Department of Mental Health to increase the mental evaluation team availability. I think overall our staffing levels are so low that we wouldn't be able to increase our sworn personnel on the mental evaluation team. And that's a, throughout the, de that's department wide, that's not just in patrols? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you, uh, colleagues, for, for all your really good questions. Yeah, most of my questions have been asked. I was gonna talk about our African American women in our jail in Linwood, up underrepresented uh, in the jail employment program. Uh, Assistant Sheriff, you answered that. I was gonna talk about the uptick of um, in custody suicides this qu quarter, you've talked about that. And I was also gonna talk about the MET teams. Um, and I, you know, I really feel like this board wants you, wants the Sheriff's Department to prioritize this. I don't know how you're gonna figure this out, but I think we feel very strongly um, that we can prevent uh, officer-involved shootings. We can uh, save uh, lives out there uh, where situations end badly when, when what they needed was an, a MET team to roll out to de-escalate the situation. So I think this board is very um, um, insistent that somehow, I mean, we hear you, but we have, uh, uh, we got nine new academies happening. We're all working to, to recruit and hire more. Uh, so I think it's probably not as good of an answer just to say uh, we can't do it because of staffing levels. You gotta figure this one out. This is definitely a priority and we believe it speaks to just the philosophy of this board uh, in how we are um, addressing and um, you know implementing our, our care first policy. So you don't have to answer that, but I think your answer um, probably didn't satisfy anybody up here. What, what the one question I didn't get, uh, I didn't hear get asked is that the, the Sheriff's Department has established an Office of Constitutional Policing. Uh, so uh, Assistant Sh uh, Sheriff Loma, did you wanna speak to um, maybe the role and goals of, of that office? Uh, I, I, sh I sure can. So we are fortunate and happy to have uh, Eileen Decker as our new uh, division director over the Office of Constitutional Policing. Uh, she's a uh, outstanding uh, addition to our team and moving forward, I think uh, nothing but good things will come out of her office. Uh, but as I sit and say her office, uh, uh, D division director uh, Decker is uh, currently uh, establishing staff that she needs and she's car carefully selecting those people for that, those critical positions in the uh, Office of Constitutional Policing. She's gonna be focused on our consent decrees and settlement agreements, both in our jails and in the North County, the Antelope Valley uh, consent decrees. Um, so she is uh, hitting the ground running. In addition to focusing on the recommendations of the Civilian Oversight Commission or the COC, those 27 recommendations, we're taking those uh, very seriously and she's also working very hard uh, to uh, assess those and see where and what we can implement. So. Um, Hope, hopefully that answers your question. So the goal of this office would be? To provide uh, guidance to the sheriff and to our command staff and to our department as it relates to constitutional policing and the principles of constitutional policing's, policing and where she can help us uh, expand services and do so uh, in a constitutional manner. Good. I mean, I think it's a great first step. Uh, I think it's something that I think is really important, and I think the timing is um, great right now, and I appreciate the sheriff for doing that. Max, did you want to say something about that office? Oh, I just say I'm a big fan. And what, okay. what you're seeing happen is what this board asked for when you created my office. Yeah. At that time, you gave a bunch of money to the sheriff to establish something called the Audits and Accountability Bureau, and it was never used the way you intended. Right. As a result, it did almost nothing when in, in, as to reform when it was right. first created. Then we had the dark ages, the last four years, and now our new sheriff is reimagining, moving a lot of those positions into this office, yeah. which I believe will function in the way yeah. 
We Good. wished it would have a long time ago. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you all for, for being. Can I just, can I just uh, uh, say yeah. one thing? Because when you talk about that, and I, and I think what I heard the commander say is we need to talk to mental health. Because they want to expand MET, but they I don't heard have that. I just, I would yeah, so I think had, we need to talk to Lisa Wong. I would rather have an answer like, yes, we, we're going to prioritize this and we're going to see how we okay, can make Okay, then Lisa Wong, if you're listening, um, we're prioritizing this. We want you to identify individuals to pair with deputies um, and yeah. give us a report back. Yeah, fine. Don't soften my blow. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, are there members of the public that would like to weigh in on this? Yes, uh, we item? have Corey Smith. Please come up. And there is no telephonic. Um, okay. Uh, welcome. Go ahead. Uh, hi. My name is Corey Schmidt. So we're talking about reform of the sheriff's department talk about that so what do they do they um, they like to use their helicopters to encircle you uh, at your house um, or at the beach or anywhere in the city um, they like to uh, follow you around in their car with their sirens going try to make you feel like a criminal uh, what else do they do they um, follow you throughout the city there's harassment um, and discrimination, definitely experienced discrimination. There's been fist fights. I got jumped, definitely. Um, let's see. I would say if we're going to do some reforms, those are a good list of things to focus on. Thank you. Is there another speaker that would like yes. to speak? Oh, yes. Herman, okay. Herman. Go ahead. Mommy, gentlemen, young lady, I hate to bring this proclamation that there are some serious issues among the sheriff's department. And I'll give you a hypothetical example. When I file a claim to investigate inappropriate activity of sheriffs having me handcuffed and asking me if I do a, a swastika and I walk around going to meetings using Cohen versus California, fuck the draft, is that offensive? Because when the fucking cops arrest people in the street, they're not as polite, and I find that offensive. You get a lot more honey than you would spilling the sugar. And the issue is we need a reform, and we need to audit the policy that goes on today in regards to item 45. I support the motion, but with an audit. Get it going, spend the money, and make it work. Hoorah! Thank you. Madam Chair, we have Donald Heron that signed up in the queue in person and one person on telephonic. Okay, great. Hi, uh, I'm Donald Harlan. Uh, this is about the Inspector General's report. I'd recommend that you fire the Inspector General, that uh, you won't get anything that you would expect out of the job of the Inspector General from this person. Also, uh, there's a lot of puffed up talk about how they're going to respond to complaints and do all these things, but we know that's not going to happen. Um, yeah, the sheriff's department's corrupt. It's been corrupt a long time. It's a real shame that somebody would invest all that money in the sheriff's department for oversight and accountability and auditing and stuff. And they can't even fucking get their work. They can't even get it together. It's just ridiculous. Uh, yet you're not going to get anything. Every one of these guys up here looks like they'd sell, they sell you in Delaware. Do you understand what that means? Every guy up here looks like they would sell you in Delaware. Okay. Uh, do we have another speaker in person? No other speaker. Okay, in on person. the phone? All right, let's go to the phone. Our first participant is Roy Humphreys. You may begin. Uh, yeah, the sheriff's department's corrupt. It's been corrupt. Mr. Humphreys, your line is open. That somebody would invest all that money in the sheriff's department. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. Okay. Um, seeing uh, no speakers, uh, Supervisor Barker, are you back up on, or are you? No, Madam Chair. Okay. 
uh, seeing no other supervisors or any other comments on, on this uh, report, thank you all for coming and being available for our questions. Um, this report is received and filed and hearing no objections, that will be the order. Okay, now we're going to 54A, uh, Homelessness Prevention, Critical Tenant Protections, which was held by Supervisor Horvath. For members of the public on the telephone, please, please press one, then zero now to comment on this item. And I think we have Rafael Carbajal, uh, Director of Consumer and Business Affairs is available. I see Cherie Todorov here. Um, Supervisor Horvath, would you like to make comments? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks uh, to my colleagues for considering this item. I know that the words tenant protections can trigger feelings of anxiety and confusion um, and that it can get complicated, but the motion before us today is not complicated, nor are the reasons why it is so incredibly necessary. As we know, we are in a declared state of emergency on homelessness, and the most important thing that we can do is stem the tide of people falling into homelessness by protecting them in housing that they might otherwise be able to afford. I know there's been uh, some, I, I would say intentional, but at least some uh, confusion or disinformation that's been spread. So I uh, will go through what this item actually calls for. But owners, um, I'm sorry, but this motion uh, to protect tenants countywide who are paying their rent from being arbitrarily removed from their home, which is what just cause protection means, um, is, is incredibly important. Owners must have a just cause to evict a tenant, a cause which could include tenants not paying their rent or violating the terms of their lease. So for those who have been reaching out saying, you know, we can't afford to have tenants not paying rent, we have heard you, and uh, that is not what this item is calling for. These protections will not go on forever as a result of this motion either. They are for a one-year period while we work with all cities to increase their renter protections. There were over 34,000 evictions filed in the county in 2022 during a time where some believed eviction protections protections would not allow this risk. 34,000 evictions filed in one year. These protections are not an eviction moratorium. They provide tenants with an affirmative defense that they can assert when they have done nothing to warrant being removed from their home. Evic evictions are not based on just that are not based on just cause are the primary driver of discriminatory and arbitrary evictions. Given the disproportionate number of people of color in our unhoused population, we cannot sit silent and, and allow discriminatory housing practices to continue. This motion also protects tenants who brought roommates into their home during COVID to help cover rent or to take care of sick household members. Households also adopted, adopted pets in record numbers during the pandemic, providing valuable emotional support resulting in historic adoptions from county animal shelters, and they exist in stable households and families that deserve to stay intact. Tenant protections are homelessness prevention, slowing evictions, maintaining housing, and stopping the inflow of people ending up living on our streets. We are in the midst of a humanitarian crisis in Los Angeles. Over 69,000 people live without homes. We can make an immediate impact on this emergency by stopping the inflow into homelessness and protecting tenants from losing their homes. There are people renting in some uh, of our cities in Los Angeles County who enjoy city-led eviction protection efforts but most independent cities in Los Angeles County have not yet launched their own tenant protections. The county through the Department of DCBA, as we know, um, has agreed to host a summit to support these cities in launching their own protections, but given the scope of the summit and the size of the event, we have learned from DCBA that this event is expected not to be held until June of 2023, while eviction protections will expire at the end of this month. Because of this delay and mindful of the county's commitment to decreasing the number of people experiencing homelessness, the county must initiate tenant protections in partnership with our emergency homelessness declaration and demonstrate our commitment to keeping Los Angeles County residents housed. 
This motion asks for reports back on a variety of work, so I will get into the specifics of what this motion actually calls for so we're all clear. The first directive, as I spoke about, uh, is uh, with regard to just cause evictions, keeping people in housing where they are paying rent and they are abiding by the terms of their lease for the next, uh, for the next period of time, this next year, until March of 2024. Uh, not, directive two deals with uh, the pets and occupants issue, which I have addressed. Directive three uh, allows um, tenants who are keeping current on their rent starting April 1st of this year to continue to stay in their housing while they work to pay their back due rent. We have heard stories of property owners and landlords who are taking rent that uh, tenants uh, perceive to be uh, applied currently and instead using it to pay back due rent, which then causes them to be subject to eviction. We are trying to prevent people from falling into homelessness. We would like rent to be applied currently while we work with tenants and landlords to address their back due rent. Uh, I, Directive 4 would address, uh, um, would limit the increases uh, to rents that would um, otherwise apply in LA County. And the remaining directives are all reports back on connecting at-risk tenants with resources uh, at, at their time of eviction, centralizing access to resources to make it easier for tenants to access them so they don't have to go to multiple places to access the resources that already exist for their protection. S uh, additional support for DCBA and assisting cities who are looking to implement renter protections, developing a toolkit to explain available resources Resources. Obviously, we don't want to duplicate efforts, but there are a lot of resources already available to tenants that people don't know about, and we need to make sure that they do. And finally, expanding support for tenants, which I know this entire board has talked about in terms of making sure that we have longer-term protections for, for renters that are not under the banner of a state of emergency. We are learning from this, these times of crisis, and we must implement those lessons into policies. And I'm grateful to Supervisor Solis for co-authoring this motion with me, and I hope that um, any and all of those directives will be considered by my colleagues here today. Thank you. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I know it's been a long afternoon already, and we've had so many um, challenging issues and things that we've taken on on this board. But this is one of those issues that keeps me up at night, in all honesty. This is one that um, we get calls into my district offices, and I have several, and including the one here, uh, where people are calling because they are getting notices uh, that they're going to be evicted. And I have, uh, many of them are, happen to be senior citizens. So for the life of me, I try to think, well, how are we going to try to help provide assistance to an elderly couple or family where you have multiple uh, families living with with an older relative and they're just as worried just as traumatized as to what's happening and uh, many are, are just barely making do and you have maybe two or three people working but they're all working at minimum wage or less than minimum wage and part-time that's the reality for my district the people that I represent I think the majority in my district are renters uh, we don't have a lot of landlords we have a lot of unincorporated areas we, ha we have a lot of uh, low-income uh, units, but still, it's not enough. And we know that right now we have a shortage of housing, affordable housing, and we're trying very hard to meet that, to meet that need. I think all of us here on the board, and want to thank you, Sherry Todorov, for everything that you're doing, because everything that we've been working on in terms of provi providing housing, affordable housing, to get people housed, but now we have this other tsunami that's coming and it is coming i mean i i foresee it i hear it from people in the street um the very the very uh fact that you're talking about a strike that's going on right now across across the way la unified school district the majority of those people make less than twenty-five thousand a year and they're complaining that they're going to be out of out of their their homes or apartments because they're not going to be able to make do and we know this, this isn't anything new for us. But I, I, I wanna stand proudly uh, with uh, Supervisor Horvick, Horvick on this because I think it is a big issue for us. And I do wanna see that at least this board take more consideration into what our tenants are really going through. Um, and perhaps they can't all be here today because many of them are at home right now watching their kids because their kids are, are out of school 
A lot of them are, couldn't make it. That's what I heard today. A lot of them that could have come here couldn't because of the fact that, you know, they've got to stay with their children right now. But that's one, one issue. The other is that I just want to say that um, tenants protections in L.A. County thus far have protected many, many people during the pandemic. And we know that on March 31st, <clears throat> those uh, protections are set to end, meaning more than 30,000 households could face eviction by the end of the year. 30,000, multiply that by four or five, you know, in a, in a unit or more. And in, in some of our immigrant families, it's a lot larger. Could go up to eight individuals or more. We don't, we don't really have a good idea, but I do know it's large. Um, we need to do everything we can to try to protect, in my opinion, at least by, by this motion. And that is providing a one-year extension to help us reach out also to our cities who right now are looking at what the county's doing. I've had a number of my cities tell me, we're waiting to see what the county's gonna do because we wanna follow your lead. And I think that many people out there do trust what the county does, I know that. Um, but I think that if we could do that, it would help provide guidance and assistance to many, many people beyond our reach, beyond just the unincorporated areas. And as, as a reminder, I think we need to just continue to inform people about the current tenant protections that they have and the relief programs. We talked a little bit about that earlier with respect to ARP money and ARDI, the presentation that we had, because we have to do more to let people know that there is assistance. And apparently it isn't breaking through the way we think it is. That, that is a fact. Um, I see that when I'm out in my district. Uh, I think as a board, we need to focus on what needs to be done and do the right thing to address the crisis that is at hand right now. And today, for me, the right thing is to extend the tenant protections at least for one year. And the motion initiates new tenant protections to prevent more homelessness. And the motion has already been stated, prohibits landlords through March 31st, 2024 to evict tenants without just cause. Prohibit property owners from seeking evictions against tenants for unauthorized occupants, such as pets, who moved in between March 4th, 2020 to January 2023. And prohibits landlords through March 2024 in the unincorporated areas to raise rent by more than 3%. For some people, even a minor $50, whatever, could, could bankrupt them in some cases. But in some cases, we know that it's even harsher for, uh, for many other families. I, I won't even go into that. But this motion also has other directives to increase that outreach, as we said, and legal representation. We know when people have a legal defense, they have a better shot at winning their cases. And we know that. We did that through other efforts here on the county. So I think we need to do that and provide multilingual material of all resources that the county offers. And most importantly, we need to give authority to DCBA to hire a consultant to coordinate a convening with cities to begin that process to implement their own tenant protections. I can't wait for that to happen. I keep getting calls about that. In January, the board allocated $45 million to financially assist our mom and pop property owners and tenants. Those funds will be rolling out to help many. I'm quite aware that of the struggles of many of the small mom and pop landlords and what they're facing because I know too they have bills that they have to meet. The Department of Consumer and Business Affairs administers the Stay Housed LA and the Small Landlord Assistance Programs, which I know can help go a long way to provide mortgage assistance also, which also launches next month. So there are help and protections even for landlords. So I think that also has to be stated because I think it's lost on some people. I also want to remind the public to call the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs to find out more about these programs and apply for the assistance. And we all recognize that the COVID pandemic drastically changed and disrupted both our families and our economy, particularly impacting the most vulnerable. We as a county implemented emergency tenant protections that were greatly needed to try to diminish the impacts of COVID-19. Today, we're using the declaration of local emergency for homelessness to prevent families, women, and seniors from sleeping on the streets or in their vehicles, many of whom are doing that right now as we speak. One year extension will help us reach out to the cities and help them implement permanent policies and protections in their jurisdictions before the lift of the emergency tenant protections. As a county, 
we have lifted the importance of collaborating and supporting the city of LA Mayor Karen Bass, her declaration in the state of emergency on homelessness. We need to do all we can to help reduce displacement and to prevent more from falling into the homeless bucket. And it's a reminder for the county that we need to continue those tenant protections and relief programs to prevent more homelessness and housing insecurity, which is at one of its highest peaks. And thank God that we do have collaboration with the mayor across the street, city, and the things that this board has been doing, but more needs to be done. And I know this is another part of her uh, values and, and her initiatives to take on as well. So with that, Madam Chair, I would also ask uh, members to please support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Barger. Thank you. And I, I want to thank um, the authors uh, for this motion. I think it's good for us to have this discussion. But I need to get a clarification. So we talk about cities, because I'm actually hearing the opposite from some of my cities. Um, I'm trying to figure out AB 1482, doesn't that cover just cause across the state? That's already in place? Yes, it does. Uh, AB 1482 provides extends just cause uh, to the entire state of California for uh, all residential, all, all units uh, 15 years or older on a rolling basis. It also provides um, uh, relocation assistance in certain, in certain instances and also caps rent hikes at 10%. So that's already being addressed. That's, and when does that go into effect? It went into effect 2020 and it sunsets in 2030. 2030? And then of the 45 million we've allocated, how, how much has been spent? None. See, this is, this is my frustration. When did we vote on that at this board level? About a month, but I mean, we already had something in place, a template in place on how to get this money out. Um, and so when we talk about, I mean, I know personally, and I'm gonna thank Tyler publicly, um, who helped an individual who was going to be evicted. We got her legal representation and actually found money to pay her back rent, but it wasn't that 45 million. It was VOA. Um, but there's a, it, there's a sense of urgency here, all right? We're talking about, you know, we talk about people may end up homeless and we've got individuals that need to be made whole as well, mom and pops. Um, and so, you know, I would ask that we, I thought we had a template already going or you've already got a formula because this is not the first time we've allocated money to do this, correct? No, it's not. So we've allocated five million of that, of that 40. Uh, the 40 million is actually ARP. Uh, so because of the fiduciary requirements under ARP, we need to put it out for procurement. So realistically, when do you think that money will be available to those mom and pops that don't have the luxury of tenant protection? We're targeting the summer. When? The summer. Oh, I thought you said December. No. And then on, on the, the January 24, 2023 meeting, um, Supervisor Solis passed a motion designated to explore the feasibility and impact of moving tenant protections from our COVID-19 emergency over to the emergency homeless declaration. Can you let me know where the report is? Because I know that I asked that we reach out to courts and property owners to get feedback before I take any action. And my staff's telling me there is no report. Yeah, the, re the report back will, will be back uh, April 6th, and uh, we actually have been engaging with landlords and landlord representation uh, organizations. Uh, we meet with them on a regular basis. Uh, every email, every flyer that you receive, we receive as well. Uh, we're leveraging our landlord en engagement roundtable to receive feedback from them. As a matter of fact, we have a webinar scheduled tomorrow, I'm sorry, on Thursday, uh, targeting landlords for the expiration of the protections, which is kind of on pause depending on how this conversation goes, uh, the, the, the information that we'll share there. And the courts, we've definitely been involved in conversations with the courts. I'm actually excited at the new leadership over there. It's a completely new leadership uh, and, and view and perspective of the work that they're doing. Uh, David Slayton, the new executive officer there, we've been meeting on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, I had a meeting with him today at three o'clock that I excused myself from so that so I could be here today uh, to explore other opportunities for other programming within the courts. For example, one of the things that we've discussed in the past, uh, when the pandemic hit, we were trying, we, we already have a day of court mediation program where we have mediators, trained, media, trained and certified mediators at the court uh, where the judges are afforded an opportunity to send out the plaintiffs uh, out to the court, uh, out into the hallway to discuss their case and try to mediate and settle it before moving forward with the case. We wanted to do day of court attorneys 
Uh, the previous administration was not necessarily open to that concept, but this new administration is, and that's something that we're currently discussing. So, um, and thank you for that, because I, I did, when I talked to individuals, I felt the courts would be helpful, so I'm glad that you um, um, reached out to them. You, you say that the money, the summer, I'm gonna get back to that, I just thought of something. If someone has been, <clears throat> let's say, that, that is no longer living in that unit, will the landlord be able to draw down reimbursement for the back rent, or does the individual have to be living in the unit? No, the reimbursement is going to do be, uh, it's based on rental arrears that are owed to the to the landlord. So it won't, be, so let's say the tenant decides to move out and move to another state. So as long as they can validate that they have the, the rental arrears that are due to them, they might be potentially eligible for the grant. Okay. Um, and then Sh Sherry, Cherie, hi. Um, I know the CEO is uh, housing, uh, initiative is presently executing our emergency declaration goals with our city partners, working on implementing the Birch uh, directives, ex executing Measure H, contracting and strengthening strategic partnerships. And I wanna thank you for the work that you've done thus far. Um, you really have done an amazing job and I continue to see and hear about all the great work from my cities. And I don't know about my colleagues, but that's made a difference when I go out and talk about what we're doing with Measure H dollars. Um, I know it's been a heavy lift for your team to execute all this, so I'd like to ask you if you feel that transitioning tenant protections to your team at this time is feasible. Um, as, as I'm looking at the motion, what I'm seeing is that we'll work with county departments to assess the efficacy and cost impl implications of centralizing access to county federal programs. Um, so I was looking at it from that perspective, um, and we can certainly support um, that for this 30-day report back, um, doing that analysis in partnership with our county departments and coming back to the board with that information. I mean, you are absolutely right that we are very, very much involved in That's why I'm asking, because I know we, that yeah. Tyler has told me that you all are doing a lot of different things. Yeah. And then with our working with the city now on, you know, what we're rolling out, I just want to make sure that we're not putting too much on your plate. And then last but not least, I'll just say, you know, I look at the, re the report backs and, and I agree wholeheartedly, you know, these report backs should be put into play. We should be looking at that. And I'm glad that the board's directing it, but I hope that it's already being thought about because some of this to me is like a no-brainer. These are things that we should be doing and has been consistent with what this board has recommended as it relates to, um, you know, um, uh, Tenant, uh, tenant power toolkit or you know things like that that, that to help um, because the reality is that, that we can't keep kicking the can as it relates to tenant protections. Um, and I think that we need, to, if we're going to make this change, and I've said this and that's why I wanted you to talk to the courts and I wanted you to talk to the property owners, things do need to change. And I don't know what that change looks like, but when I've talked to people that have talked to the judges, They've seen firsthand some of the issues, both on the tenant side and on the landlord side, that maybe 20 years ago worked, but now we need to revisit, especially as it relates to rent control and all. And I think it, that, that we as a board should take that initiative and do it holistically and look at it from the standpoint of um, changes and modifications, not just based on COVID, but based on what's right for individuals that are renting and also right for those mom and pops that are the landlords to these tenants that, that in some cases are in the rears quite a bit. So um, with that, I, I appreciate um, the answers on that and that is all I have to say. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Mitchell. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Um, this is a reoccurring conversation since I joined the board December of 2020. We've literally had a dozen motions on emergency tenant protections before us and I'm clear today that we're considering this motion um, for a new set of countywide emergency tenant protections under the Homelessness Emergency Pro Proclamation. So just to remind us kind of where we were in, in more recent history. September 2022, we voted on a motion to inform tenants, property owners, and cities about the sunset of the COVID-19 emergency protections to provide cities additional notice for those interested to craft their own local protections. And since September of last year, we extended COVID-19 emergency tenant protections twice. In large part, those extensions were done based on the arguments of those who brought the motions forward to provide time for cities to pass their own tenant protections since they fall largely within the governance responsibility of, of cities. 
and to give us time, I might add, us, the county, to develop our own expanded permanent protections. That's the issue I've tried to consistently raise. Before I go to some questions, I, I do want to reiterate and share that the number one issue I get calls and emails about from both tenants and landlords to keep people who are housed in their housing is affordability. That's why I continue to raise rent relief. Um, uh, the, the, the last motion that I brought forward, uh, co-authored by Supervisor Barger, you know, was 45 million. We acknowledged it wasn't enough. And even getting that across the finish line for this board um, to, 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 wasn't easy. And so affordability continues to be the question. So I want to thank the city of Baldwin Park for coming up with this kind of side by side. I was looking for some help and guidance to help answer some questions. I still have some additional questions. Um, getting to what are the statewide kind of laws that we're looking at. Um, I had the privilege of voting on AB 1482 in 2019. I get that. You know, Costa Hawkins is always up for debate. So I wanted to get a sense of kind of getting to your question, what is, what, who is not covered in 1482, and what are the full list of protections we really need to begin to work on as a county. And again, having a sense of how, you know, what the cities are really doing, what is really happening <laughs> at the city level. So, Fact check me, if you will. I believe cities in the county of our 88 that currently have protections would be City of LA, Culver City, Inglewood, I believe Pasadena, maybe not Santa Monica. Is that the exhaustive list? Uh, yes. West Hollywood? You also have Pomona and West Hollywood, and okay, then our unincorporated for a total of 13 municipalities, 12 cities, and our unincorporated. Got it. Um, And do you have a sense of the remaining cities in the county, how many are in active engagement in terms of doing the work? My general understanding is there's about four cities that are actively working on it. We've had okay. discussions with the, several of them. Um, most recent conversation was with Pico Rivera. They do have a a mobile home ordinance that they're looking to potentially expand and they were looking for some technical assistance on potentially implementing. Um, yeah, and thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Your, your team referred them to us. That they modeled after the county. Mm -hmm. So what's, you know, I, I hear that counties, that there are some cities that don't have the resources, that need support, need help. We keep hitting you over the head, quite frankly, about what's taken so long for the summit. What would stop any of the other um, housing, stakeholder groups, any of those four cities coming together, looking at the county model. What would, since we've been talking about this in September of 2022, what is stopping another group from convening the summit? If, if the summit is what everybody is waiting for, and then after the summit, everybody's going to switch into high gear. <laughs> I'm curious, what is stopping some other entity from holding a, hosting a summit? I could, I could speak from our perspective. For us, it's been the capacity, the same folks. I've mentioned this before, the same folks working on this, are the same folks trying to put the summit together. Right, I get it. Uh, and and resource-wise, fortunately, recently we were able to identify some funding that will allow me to host the summit a little bit earlier than June. We were leveraging June because we were trying to use some free resources. But now, through some cost savings that we were able to generate, uh, we're going to host them a little, host it a little sooner, so I'm onboarding a consultant to help us with the coordination on that. But to your main question, there's really nothing stopping them. Um, our, we, are, we make ourselves available. Thank you to Supervisor Hans, Supervisor Solis, and the other offices who asked their, their cities to reach out to us for uh, technical assistance or any support that we can provide them. We're, we'll make ourselves available. Our code is actually available online, uh, both through our lacounty.gov website and municode.gov. Um, I will say some cities have taken advantage of that. Mm -hmm. uh, like to say the city of Culver City, 
they essentially took our code, copied and pasted it, and mm -hmm. put their name on it, and they went one step further, and they, they stole one of my best staff to implement the program in their city. Uh, but uh, outside of Will and Drive, and I'm assuming their own machinations, they haven't moved forward. Do, do we know then how many rental units or possibly people are without any tenant protections in the county? Given that 1482, you know, provides protections for property, you know, 15 year. So do we have a gap in terms of newly constructed, constructed units that coupled with the cities that don't have any protections? So I don't have that number readily, readily available. I do know that it was projected that 4.9 million new households would be protected under AB 1482, um, both throughout the state of California, but we could go back and work with our partners to see if we could figure out Supervisor how many are not covered. Yeah. I do. Um, so even with 1482, there are conservatively at least 650,000 renters in LA County with no just cause protections due to the law's loopholes and exceptions. The protections aren't activated until the tenant has been housed for 12 months, and that 12 months restarts, for example, when a new tenant joins the household or there are other modifications to the lease term. Um, the lease language, and the protections don't apply to units built within the last 15 years, as well as certain duplexes, single family homes, and condominiums. So there are a, a ton of loopholes that, that allow for 650,000 people. Yeah. Uh, and what's your source, if you could share that, since DCBA doesn't have that data? Um, I'm happy to uh, get that source from my staff, and I'm happy to add what our, t what our motion today would add in addition to 1482. I'm clear about that, but I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of the number of people impacted. So that just the source would be helpful but since DCBA didn't have the number. Thank you very much for that. A um, couple more questions, Madam Chair, if you would allow me. As I go through my chart looking at 1482, looking at um, what we could be doing if we were spending the time at the county level really talking about our, our permanent protections beyond another extension. Um, So also, with regard to LA County Rent Stabilization Ordinance, um, it's a public document, and I would assume much like the tenant protections, there's nothing that would stop cities who don't have it from looking at the county document and replicating it much like Culver City did. Okay. So again, we have an RSO, inclusive of tenant protections. So who, are included in these protections? Unincorporated county residents and not cities who don't have them? Clarify that for me. In 1482 or in ours? So 1480. Go ahead. Yeah, so 1482 covers all municipalities that don't otherwise already have tenant protections in place. Right. And it also expands upon uh, protections that are at, at a lower, uh, that are l less than those provided by uh, 1482. And in, in the unincorporated, our tenant protections are actually provide a higher level of protection than 1480. Got it. So I think, you know, I think that there are um, a variety of options before us. Um, I, I know that uh, Senator DeRazzo has a bill that will expand upon 1482 and expand permanent protections. I think it has probably stronger just language, just cause language than we've seen. It will lower the rent cap. Um, again, I don't get a, have a sense that there are cities who are serious about this that, that couldn't have done it, that couldn't have um, um, convened themselves, found um, an advocacy group or a partner um, to help them convene. Appreciate that your staff have been overwhelmed with what we've been doing in terms of the emergency protections that I supported during the COVID emergency. Um, yes, tenants need protection. Yes, affordability is the primary reason people are fearful and experiencing uh, and, and are at risk of falling into homelessness. We need to, as a county, figure out our permanent protections. The other critical issue that I hear from stakeholders, advocates, and, and constituents is what I call universal legal access as opposed to right to counsel, because I am interested in it truly being countywide and us figuring out a way to pay for it so it's real. Um, those are issues that are important um, that if 
given the time and opportunity for us to focus on the real issue at hand, which is expanding permanent protections, I would hope to that as a county we could get to. Um, appreciate, you know, the, the, uh, cities um, are resourceful entities with elected bodies just like us who have the responsibility to serve their constituency. Um, and have the responsibility to figure out how to get the technical assistance they need to do what's right by their constituents. So they have a level of accountability just like we do. So I am hoping that the department um, can get to a place where we can talk about permanent tenant protection. Um, uh, that, that won't be incumbent upon some state of emergency, be it COVID, or whatever we have to call in the future. Thank you for the clarifying um, information. I appreciate that, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, to, to offer the source, it's the census, the number of families in new construction and single family homes in cities that don't have local just cause. So this is the American Community Survey data. Um, this wouldn't obviously include anyone with a modified lease. So 650,000 is a very conservative number. It doesn't include anyone in a city that has any sort of protection either. Appreciate so there would probably be people in those cities who would then be covered by this as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I know it's late, and I do know there's a lot of people that are waiting to speak on this item. Um, why don't we go to the public now? Um, and I can reserve my remarks for later. Well, Arnold Sachs, Bijan G, Cassandra Aranda, Cynthia Gonzalez, Emmanuel Matamoros, Eva Garcia, Fred Sutton, Greg Bonnet, Heidi Gonzalez Toledo, Herman Herman, Yvonne Annette Machado, Jasmine Perez, Corey Schmidt, Maria Larragut, Mateo Gill, Matt Buck, Max Sherman, Pamela Augustine, Red Chief Hunt, Rosa Magana, Ryan Yu, Sasha Harnden, Sofia Garcia, and Victoria Palayo, please come forward and staff will assist you. Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please. Our first participant is Nayiri Bagdasaran. You may begin. Hi, my name is Nairi Bagdasarian. Thank you for having me. I'm with the San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership. I'm here this afternoon to respectfully ask this body to vote no on item 54A. This proposal, which was introduced late in the agenda process, did not give all stakeholders enough time to provide feedback. And this policy would significantly impact each and every person and love and level that is part of the world of housing and making sure that we approach this issue with pragmatic solutions is more important than ever. The fact is that the state and country are quickly phasing out emergency measures and we need to continue to fo focus on addressing issues outside the parameters of the pandemic. Housing providers and partners need to be allowed to be part of the solution towards addressing housing and homelessness issues. We need to be sure to include local council members to address the housing needs of their individual communities. And we urge for more conversations to be had before passing a motion such as this one. Thank you so much for your time and commitment you. to your constituents and we urge this body to vote now. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Emma Reyes. You may begin. And Ms. Reyes dropped out. We'll now go to the line of Francisco Negro. You may begin. Hi, this is Francesco Negro. I'm a property owner um, I, in the county. I strongly urge the county to vote no on this. Um, there's enough rules and regulations in place from the state. Um, some of these ordinances you describe uh, the ability for somebody to add roommates and pets, and now you can't. Um, have them justly moved out. These people have changed the terms of their leases and, and that's not just cause they're adding people um, causing destruction of property that now as a property owner, you need to repair. We've got increased costs for property taxes, insurance costs have gone up, maintenance costs gone up. 
interest rates and banks have gone up for, for the cost of housing. All these costs are passed on to the property owner. Um, if you want to fix something, maybe consider lowering property taxes instead of increasing them 3% each year. Um, there's a lot of other problems. I, I know the tenants, you know, respectfully Thank need you. protection, but Thank so do the homeowners. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Victor Riaz. You may begin. Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. My name is, yes. My name is Victor Reyes, and I'm calling on behalf of VICA, the Valley Industry Commerce Association. We urge the board to oppose the recommendations outlined in Supplemental Agenda Item 54A, which include yet another last minute expansion of the emergency order to expand countywide eviction protections. The use of the emergency declaration to back yet another expansion of county eviction protections sets a uh, dangerous precedent for future policymaking. These proposals, which aim to override state and local laws passed by council members, continue to disregard local decision-making processes. FICA has long advocated for an end of the COVID-19 related eviction protections, and we believe it is time for housing providers throughout the county to resume normal operations to ensure thriving communities and investments in housing. Many local and statewide jurisdictions ended COVID-19 related emergency orders months ago, and we urge the county Thank to you. follow suit. Thank you. For Thank these you. reasons. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Jan Bowie. You may begin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Van Bui, and I represent Long Beach residents empowered. I urge the board to vote yes on item 54A to ensure that tenants across the county can be protected against eviction for no cause. Tenant protections are homelessness prevention, and the county, as well as the city of Long Beach, have declared the state of emergency on homelessness. In, in 2022, Long Beach saw almost pre-pandemic levels of eviction cases, and that's with the existing tenant protections. Once these protections expire, the homelessness crisis will only continue to get worse. If we want to address the root of homelessness, we will need to keep people in their homes and off the streets with tenant protections like just cause eviction protection. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Brian Hugh. You may begin. Uh, hi, uh, this is Ryan Yu. Um, we spoke to the board back on March 7th. Uh, about uh, the concerns of mom and pop landlords, and uh, we just wanted to say thank you um, because I, I feel like I, I know there's an ongoing battle between the tenant side and the landlord side, but that uh, that we we were heard, and that there is room to breathe uh, for those of us who are trying to uh, um, move on with our lives. I just just wanted to to, to thank the board of supervisors. Um, my wife and I were we're very proud to, to be part of this this democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is D. Crossum. You may begin. Hi, this is D. Cross, and I'm a mom and pop property owner in LA County. I uh, I urge people to vote no on 54A. The pre-COVID laws that were put in place not only protected renters, but protected owners as well. They were bipartisan in nature to keep a just and fair system in place so the county and its many citizens could operate their day-to-day -day lives without the burden of politics. I oppose 54A because it discriminates against not only the property owner, but also the mass majority of renters through unnecessary legislation, and it puts undue burden on an already struggling renter's market. 54A will only hurt an already struggling county and those individuals living here. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Caleb Calderon. You may begin. Caleb Cal Calderon, your line is open. My name is Abel Calderon, and I'm a small landlord in the county of Los Angeles. I implore the Board of Supervisor and oppose the 54A and to end all aspects of emergency housing measures over the unincorporated cities. 
This proposal is not about homeless prevention, but a bore power. This will help, this will hurt those intended to help. The solution are already in place to address the county's concerns about COVID impact on household. Permanent eviction uh, protections and billions of dollars in assistance were made available for those who truly struggle. Uh, and we actually um, continue, uh, we encourage the board to, to directly rental assistance programs for those in need. But the problem is that um, if the county continues to override the state and the local flaw uncorporated policies and flexible mandates, if approved, the housing will become more expensive. Thank uh, you. Landlords Thank cannot you. afford to lose rent. Thank They're you. Obligated Thank you. To Your time mortgages. has expired. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Cheryl Parkle. You may begin. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go yes. ahead. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, to all the board members, I, I am a member of the Apartment Association of Southern California Cities, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my fellow mom and pop landlords. We understand and, and we've been very sensitive and acknowledge the hardships that the tenants have had during the pandemic and uh, subsequently as we end the pandemic. And, uh, you know, we understand that the, you wanted to provide protections for the tenants, but the landlords, we're your constituents too. And provisions have been put in place to protect the tenants, but very little, and it's almost after the fact, have been put in place to protect landlord property owners. We're not billionaires or even millionaires, and many of us are barely holding on to our properties with these rent moratoriums that have happened. So any extension of any aspect of these rent moratoriums or expansions will not only cause further harm to the landlords, but it's going to hurt the tenants as well because it's going to result in less available Thank housing. Thank you. Your time I is up. I implore you to oppose Thank item you. 54A. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Michelle Stuber. You may begin. Hi, uh, this is Michelle Stuber. I am also one of the mom and pop landlords here and a member of the AACSC, the Apartment Association of California's Southern Cities. A um, couple of things I'd like to note, the 3% increase that you guys are recommending is unreasonable. Our expenses, whether it be the recent gas hikes, the, our, my insurance has doubled in the last year. Um, I'm in Long Beach. They continue to raise my gas uh, or my water 7% per year. Taxes, my items such as hot water heaters, everything, the expenses overhead far exceed your 3%. And you're not protecting the landlord in any way. And I've already lost a property. I'm down because of your rent moratoriums. There's more of us than you realize. I have one person with five people, five added people. Thank there you. were two in a one Thank bedroom. You. I've got seven Thank people you. in a one bedroom. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Our next participant is uh, Evelyn Masanovich. You may begin. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi. I also am a mom and pop owner of uh, properties in LA County, um, have nine units. Uh, my costs have skyrocketed. My insurance is up, my property tax is up, my water is up, my trash is up, my electrical is up, my labor is up, my materials are up. I have a mortgage that I have to pay. And now, because of the emotional animal support, I have to allow animals in to anybody who can get on the internet and, and print me a certificate that says they need an emotional support animal. Now these animals urinate, they ruin my carpets, they ruin my door jams, not to mention the fact that they bark and, and, and make noise when there's separation anxiety. I cannot charge extra for this. Um, I, I, I cannot, I, my heart bleeds for the homeless people, honestly it does, and I give as much charity money as I can to the homelessness situation in Los Angeles County. But I cannot afford to bear the burden of the homeless people in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you please. for your call. Thank you for your call. Your time has expired. Next speaker, yes. please. Oh, we're going in person. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Max Sherman. I'm speaking on behalf of the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles. We strongly urge the board to vote no on the motion in its entirety. This motion is an attempt to push the board to claim authority over local city councils by using the recently passed homeless emergency ordinance to impose its own just cause regulations across the county, while AB 1482 already offers uh, city just cause protections. Additionally, it's a mistake to allow for unauthorized occupants and pets to remain in rental housing for an additional year, especially as we have seen the COVID-19 pandemic measures lift. There's no justification for this extension. Further, it's time for the county to stop imposing emergency measures on small mom and pop rental housing owners long after the COVID-19 pandemic has lifted. Instead, we advise the county to look at direct rental subsidies to help renters and small mom and pop property owners alike. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Fred Sutton with the California Apartment Association. We appreciate all you do. Recently, this body had a discussion on board governance and process. This item was put forth to the public at 6.30 on Friday night. There are controversial and sweeping elements to this. There's a lot being discussed today. This board wields tremendous authority. The county exercised emergency powers over incorporated cities during an unprecedented pandemic. Now, a new emergency is being used to continue to exert that, that power, replacing current state laws, sowing more confusion, and overriding local decision makers. Cities can implement these policies on their own. And in fact, these discussions go on countywide. We were in discussions yesterday with another city on these items. And I'd like to remind the board that the, the policies put in place by the county in 2019 were very controversial and still are. The board is considering a very troubling precedent that will continue to utilize a very important and trusted power on controversial issues with no documenting support or discussion. We urge you to vote no, and we've also submitted a, a letter. Thank you. File. Thank Next you. speaker, please. Hi, Matt Buck with the California Apartment Association. Uh, solutions are in place to address concerns regarding COVID impacts on households. Billions of dollars in rental assistance and permanent eviction protections were put in place. Rhetoric about a wave of evictions has failed to materialize in California cities where emergency orders ended long ago. Housing providers are not in the eviction business. AB 1482 provides just cause protections to every multifamily unit throughout the county. It's time to allow the emergency housing orders to expire with the end of the COVID emergency. This new emergency proposal is being introduced under very different reasoning and has little to do with concerns about res residual impacts from COVID policies. This proposal is not a homeless prevention strategy. There is no demonstrated nexus between the proposed policy and the desired aims. This will hurt those you are trying to help. This will make housing more expensive and harder to find. Please vote no on 54A. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. My name is Yvonne Nanette Machado, and I'm in favor of um, 54A. And I was illegally locked out at 357 South Alvarado, apartment 212, Los Angeles, California, 90057, while I was affected by COVID in August 2020. And my sister got stomach cancer on December 2021. And Alvarado Loves illegally locked me out on March uh, 6, 2022, April 16. 2022 and June 13, 2022, while I, while I did um, a police report, two police reports in Mrs. Hilda Solis district. So I am pleading to you to please continue the tenants protections and don't let people become illegally locked out. And I also volunteer in the tenants protection um, uh, fair because I don't want people from MacArthur Park oh, or you. other areas thank you. being affected. Thank so you thank very you. much. Thank you for speaking. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Good afternoon, supervisors. Uh, my name is Cassandra Aranda. I am the director of On Our Feet Collective, and I live in District um, 2. Um, as a representative of our collective, and as well as the neighbors I engage with, I, too, am urging you to vote yes on item 54A, just cause protections, protect renters like me. Um, individuals who experience extenuating circumstances, such as the fact that I live somewhere where my landlord actually lets me live somewhere with my three pit bulls. It took me two months and $10,000 of my own money to find this apartment. 
if my landlord were to just decide to tear down the house to build a better a better home to get more money, I would have no recourse currently. I, I almost bankrupted myself trying to find this rental. I tried to buy a house in City Terrace in 2020 for 600 k and was still outbidded. These protections would protect somebody like me in an extenuating circumstances. We all need to come in reality that we may be in the same storm, but these landlords are not in the same boat as us, and we have much more to lose than these mom and pop landlords and the corporate landlords. Thank you. Please vote in favor Thank of you. Next speaker, please. Luxury apartments, nowhere to live. Like I prophesied, the end of March, many of you are going to be homeless because you continue not to protest why these people and their conditions about prevention for critical tenant recommendations is all a bunch of bullshit. You gotta be an idiot attorney to come up with fucking language like that. No fault, reason under the county. Well, the city has the same conditions. You're all full of shit. And it's sad that in my lifespan, I have to see people and their children and families suffer because I pay taxes to watch you delegate with this idiot over here to my left who has no idea how to spend $40 million or was it $40 billion? because he hasn't touched one goddamn dime. What a fucking idiot. Thank you for the record. Okay, next speaker, please. All right, Corey Schmidt. Uh, okay, so we're talking about homeless prevention. Um, do you think it's fair for someone that you get into an argument with that owes you money um, to kick you out of your house? Do you think that's ac acceptable? Is it okay to do that? Um, I see, because let's, let's listen to this. Uh, I spoke to um, inspectors about a property that was being built nearby and uh, it wasn't going to the plan that they brought to the city council meeting. Um, so I complained about it and wanted to make sure they were actually following what they presented. Um, and then instead of fixing anything, they instead bought a property behind my house and then um, uh, built the biggest thing they could and then put frat guys and musicians in there so that they could kick me out of my house. So, you know, we're talking about preventing homelessness, but are we uh, focusing on predatory development? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mi nombre es Eva Garcia y vengo a pedir, por favor, que voten a la 54A. My name is Eva Garcia and I'm here to ask that you vote on 54A. Porque es importante para las comunidades más sublimes. Actualmente, la orden de desalojos, los acosos, son el pan de cada día. And it is important for all of the communities that are surrounding us. Currently, the displacement orders, they're actually what we have to depend on to eat every single day. A pesar de que hay protecciones. Aside from the fact that there are protections. Imagínense si eso termina. Imagine if that finishes. Hemos escuchado varios pequeños dueños, entre comillas, que están hablando ahora. We've heard of many uh, small business owners, in quotation marks, que están recently, siendo afectados. That are being affected. Pues entonces que se pongan a negociar con ropa de marca, con carros, pero no con vivienda. Well, they then can come and negotiate with brand name clothing, with their luxury cars, but not with our residencies. La situación económica es muy dura ahora. Our social economy is really difficult at the moment. O comen o pagamos renta. Or we eat or we pay rent. Es muy triste vivir esto y por qué ellos ahora dicen, oh, no, es que estamos afectados porque dejan las viviendas destruidas. It's very sad to live in this. And now they're saying, oh, we're affected because they leave the homes in a destructive way. ¿Y qué dicen ellos que destruyen hogares? And what do they say? They're the ones destroying homes. Nuestros hijos no van tranquilos a la escuela sabiendo que van a salir a la calle. Our children don't go to school comfortably knowing that they're going to be out on the streets. Por un dueño que no se toque el corazón. Because of an owner that doesn't really have a heart. Solo piensan en ganar, ganar dinero. They just think of making, making money. Que le gocen otra cosa pero no sea techo ni comida. May they bargain anything else but not food and homes. La vivienda es un derecho humano. Being in a home is a human right, and Thank you. we all have that Thank right. Thank you. Gracias. Uh, next speaker, please. Mi nombre es Rosa Magaña. Yo vengo de la ciudad de Lingwood. 
vivo ahí de, del 2009 hasta ahora, el propietario vendió, el nuevo dueño me está sacando, tengo dos nietos, mi hija, eh, soy ma, eh, somos solteras y yo necesito que así como hay protección para otras ciudades, lo debemos de tener en Lingwood, allí no hay nada de protección. My name is uh, Rosa Magaña. I am from Linwood. I've been there since 2009 to the present. And well, the new owner sold the property. And I have two children. I have a daughter. We're both single mothers. So I need that the same protections that are in other cities be applied in Linwood. Uh, nunca le hemos debido al dueño que vendió, que yo conocí, José Salazar, nunca ni en la pandemia, gracias a Dios, pero el problema es que el nuevo dueño quiere su propiedad. Está carísimo ahorita, yo he andado buscando, necesita uno de 7 mil, 8 mil dólares para moverse una familia de cuatro miembros a cinco miembros. And I've never owed anything, not even during the pandemic, to the owner, Jose Salazar, not even during the pandemic. So, but the new owner wants his property back. And now in order for us to move, we need about $7,000 to $8,000 for a family of four. Yo lo que pido que esta protección que existe en otras ciudades, que la pongan también en las otras, como en Lingwood, no hay nada que te ampare allí. Nuestros nietos, nuestros hijos se asustan porque los nuevos dueños te mandan papeles que va a llegar el cherry, que vas a la corte. And I just, I'm asking for more protections, just like the protections that the other cities have, that it be also placed in Linwood. We have no protections. The kids, the grandkids get scared because Thank we you. receive letters from Thank the you. sheriffs. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Rafael, did you have something to, to say? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to offer her some help. I have yeah. Gabby and Ava in the back that Great. could provide her some assistance in the back. Yeah, uh, and I was thinking everybody that's coming up and expressing concern about the ability to pay rent, we've we've got help, right? Okay. Sure. And your staff is here to. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Maria Leriget. Ella, ella, ella me va a interpretar porque sí puedo hablar un poco de inglés, pero me expreso mejor en español. Good afternoon. My name is Maria, and she will interpret for me because, yes, although I know the language, I express myself quite better in Spanish. Uh, yo, yo vengo a, en soporte la 54A porque yo soy rento casa en, atrás de con el dueño de, de mi casa. Él me avisó que va a vender, entonces puedo quedarme yo sin hogar. So I'm here to support 54A because I rent a home. I rent the back house of where the owner lives. So I'm here because it could be that I could be left out without a property if the owner sells. Uh, yo, yo entiendo a los que son dueños de, de propiedades que rentan, yo los entiendo. Yo soy una, como pueden ver, soy un senior y, y yo vivo de, de mi, de lo que me manda mi seguro. Y, y entonces, si venden la casa y me quieren subir la renta, entonces, ¿qué voy a hacer? Si, o me quieren echar de ahí, ¿qué voy a hacer? So, I understand the owners. I understand them. I mean, I'm, I'm, also, I'm a senior, but I also feel like, what if they sell the home or they raise the rent? What's going to happen with me? Si tratan de, de sacarme de ahí, entonces, uh, yo conozco personas que, que las están queriendo sacar y las, las he acompañado a corte por lo mismo, porque no han podido pagar su renta con el COVID. Y, y, y ahora las quieren sacar y están yendo a corte. ¿Por qué? Porque los dueños no entienden nuestra posición. Okay, so I have, I mean, if they kick me out, they want to kick us out. I've been to courts with other people that are trying to get evicted or that they get evicted. Thank you. And they don't Gracias. have anything, so they're trying to get us out. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to the phone. Our next participant, Sinia. Garcia, you may begin. Good afternoon, ladies. Uh, my name is Ksenia Garcia. I am not representing any association or any organization. I'm representing myself. 
and my three beautiful girls. Um, I would love to urge you to vote for not only accepting the this current today proposition, but also extending um, a protections until June. Uh, since it is no one's fault what's happening in our world, and me being forced from a six-figure, very successful woman become a homestead mom, with taking care of the three kids, being on a fourth being on a lockdown and putting my career away and right now trying to get back on my feet i'm afraid to be on the street with my three little girls and i cannot even thank move you. out and rent something thank you. else thank you because of the three times the thank rent you. thank you very much and if you'll reach out if, if you'll reach out to someone we can we can try and help you i'm not sure where you live but you can certainly um call us and we've got help for you. Okay, next speaker on the phone. Our next participant is Alicia J. Gomez. You may begin. Okay, my name is Alicia Gomez. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. My name is Alicia Gomez. I'm a pop and mom owner. I independent property owner and oppose Eviction Control Code 1336503. Okay, eviction control affect me. Um, I need my rent um, every month to support myself, my my husband, the building. And um, I'm 84 years old, and I live in Social Security. The pandemic already affect me. Uh, I need one apartment to... Uh, for my daughter, she's in, the, in, in, in divorce, she's going into divorce, and uh, I'm afraid uh, for her safety. I talked to different attorneys, and they told me there's the law, and uh, I feel your Thank laws you. are against Thank you. me. Thank you. Thank if you. Something happens Thank to you me, very much. Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Diana Prado. You may begin. Hi. Hi, my name is Hi. Diana Prado, and I'm the founder and executive director of Heart LA. We support item 54A and commend Supervisor Solis and Horvath for bringing this motion forward to protect tenants from facing homelessness. We also support items 2, 5, and 6, and those who passionately spoke earlier in favor of those items. Bell Folks and All About Love reminds us that we are subjected to radical change every day. For example, revolutionary new technologies have led us all to accept computers. While to some these kind of protections may seem radical, what is radical is the homelessness crisis happening in our streets. The number of tenants paying over 40% of their salaries towards rent and still facing eviction. The overpopulation of animals in LA County animal shelters with an estimated 22,000 animals being surrendered by their owners last year, according to the LA County Department of Animal Care and Control Statistics. We cannot end protections while in the midst of these crises without any real solutions. Your tenant community needs your support right now. Heart LA in the past two months has received calls from tenants with companion animals from two separate multi-unit buildings Thank you. threatening to evict them Thank you. the moment the Thank protections you. end. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Donald Tilly. You may begin. Hello, Madam Chair and Supervisors. Uh, I'm currently renting out our former primary residence in Supervisor Hans District, but based on the continuing punitive measures on the board has imposed on housing providers in this county, I'm gonna to have to sell that home and take it off the rental market. I'm sure there are many other mom and pop housing providers who are gonna do the same thing if the board continues to impose these endless temporary emergency measures. The larger issue here is that this proposed ordinance, ordinance represents a clear taking of individual property in violation of the protections provided by the 5th and 14th Amendments of, this, of the Constitution. So I'd urge the board to keep these constitutional protections in mind and, and reject the proposals in item 54A. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Megan Brezeno. You may begin. Hello, my name is Megan Brezeno. Um, I am a small landlord in Los Angeles County um, and 
This is yet another last, last minute attempt to extend eviction protections that were put in place back in 2020, three years ago. There's a lot of people calling in, talking about situations that that really shouldn't be happening, but have nothing to do with this type of extension. There should never be a legal lockout. That's not those protections are not being extended by this by this motion. This is an extension of protections for things like additional occupants. In my case, we have tenants who have brought in people who are causing problems in our rental communities, and we are still unable to address those issues because those additional occupants are protected. And you're going to extend this for another year. That leaves us with a dire situation where we can't protect our existing tenants. Additionally, thank you. Thank the 3% you. Thank increase. you for calling in. Your time has expired. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Jason Castaneda. You may begin. Hi, my name is Jason Castaneda. I'm the Southwest Regional Manager for Hometown America. We own and operate Lake Hill Estates in unincorporated Los Angeles County. I'm urging you to reject the motion to extend the tenant protections through March 2024. Our operation costs have increased 14% over the four, last four years without the opportunity to raise rents due to the rent freezes that have been in place. Rent increases are a necessary and critical component of maintaining the long-term viability of our communities. They allow us to cover operational costs and investment in capital improvements, which in turn preserves the market value of our residents' homes. Managing communities like Lake Hills includes significant continuous capital improvements in infrastructure. Not only have we been operating under a rent freeze for the last three years, we are now facing a 3% cap on rent increases after the county has already adopted a rent stabilization ordinance. Extending the tenant protections will hinder our ability to maintain the viability of our community and will have a negative impact on the homeowners you seek to protect. Lake Hills Estates pr provides affordable quality homes. Thank you ownership Thank for solution you. for more than 200 Thank individuals. You. Thank you for calling in. Angeles. Thank you for calling in. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Lisa Hassan. You may begin. Go ahead, Lisa. Hello, I'm, hello. I'm calling Hi. from the uh, Apartment Association of California Southern Cities. Um, I would like to oppose 54A and um, I'm calling an end to all aspects of emergency housing measures. I am a mom and pop um, uh, landlord as well and have, fa have faced um, uh, issues as well um, being an independent um, owner. I would appreciate if um, you would come to the landlord's side and this issue. Um, thank you. I appreciate your time and your um, advice on this matter. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is LaVon Gilmore. You may begin. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, respectfully request that the board reject 54A. Um, I believe that as mom and pop as I am, that um, We've extended these COVID-19 emergency uh, uh, guidance uh, declarations for long enough, and we need to move on, and we need to learn how to live in the real world. The rest of the world is trying to move on, and, and everyone on these two. I understand that uh, uh, people have received eviction notices and so forth, but most of those people won't be evicted because they can work to get their rent paid and caught up. Most of those people will not be evicted. Um, the other thing is, is that I think it's terrible that mom and pop should accept uh, uh, the tenant to choose who lives in the building, uh, who lives in the apartment, you know, and when they decide to bring a pet in. Not all um, uh, buildings are conducive for excess number of people and properties. I think that definitely Thank you. should be rejected. Thank you. Thank and the you. other thing is, is that we've had 3%. Thank you. Thank you. We knew what you were going to say. Um, Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Aurora Morales. You may begin. Hello. Um, I know your main focus around trying to protect the tenants and, and trying to keep everybody housed is on minority. Well, I'm 28 years old. I'm a Hispanic. I come from a single mother with five kids. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to buy my own property 
and have been unable to, well, I'm still renting, but I need to pay my tenants rent because you guys allowed them to self-certify. This does them no good. You guys allowing them to do the just cause. I mean, if you guys are gonna go with this, and I, I say no, but if you guys do, you guys should at least have some guidelines in place. Self-certifying, you guys allowing them to do it is the same as saying kids could miss school and not have to show any proof of absence or tell the parents that they were that they didn't go to school. So you guys should, even if you guys pass this, should have something in place to where there's guidelines to who moves in, how they act. If there's anything that they don't act, that they don't do, then they should be able to be evicted and be kicked out if they can prove that they're not living there because they're helping them. Thank so you. Thank you. I don't know much. when. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Jerry Ledger. You may begin. Homelessness is a sad and serious problem. Conscripting mom and pop landlords to house others is wrong. If you still want to extend the moratorium, I offer the Homeless Mitigation Law, H-O-M-I for short. The HOMI law requires homeowners with unrented bedrooms to rent to people who may not pay. Supervisor Solis and Horvath, your home's extra rooms are subject to homeless mitigation. You say that's unfair to force you to rent to people in need? Where's your heart? You say that this is just plain wrong, commandeering your private home against your will? I agree, and so is the extension and original implementation of the current and proposed laws, AKA screw the mom and pop landlord law. I have wonderful, fully paid renters. So I'm advocating for all the overburdened mom and pops when I request set my people free. Thank you for making this emotionally tough and correct decision to end this unjust law. Free Thank you. Our Thank indentured you. mom and pop Thank you. landlords Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we're going to go in person. Welcome. Hello, my name is Jasmine Perez. I'm an organizer with Eastside Leeds and tenant rights advocate with the State House LA program. And I urge you to vote yes on the item 54A to ensure that tenants across the county are protected against eviction for no cause. Evictions without a just cause are a tool of discrimination, harassment, retaliation, and unjust displacement. And it's very frustrating to connect with tenants who assume that these protections will keep them housed, when in reality, nothing will stop a landlord from filing an unlawful detainer against them. And um, tenants at the same time are being severely harassed by their landlord to force them to self-evict. And whenever we assist them in submitting complaints to LAHD and the DCBA, there really isn't any follow-up for these tenants. And we really need the item 54A to pass as the bare minimum. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Sasha Harnden with the Inner City Law Center and the Keep LA House Coalition. Um, you've declared an emergency on homelessness and a really obvious place to start is to stop people from being evicted with no reason. I want to respond to Supervisor Mitchell's question earlier. We in the Keep LA House Coalition have already held a tenant protection summit. We're working with a number of cities who have expressed interest as quickly as possible to support their local policy development. But nonprofits stretching to both address the individual challenges of struggling families while also completing the work the county should have done already doesn't relieve you of your obligations and following through on your earlier votes. Cities need the technical assistance the county has told them is coming. They need the model policies and the summit the county has already voted to put in place. We are doing as much of that work as possible out of concern for tenants, but there is a difference between that and the county encouraging electeds based on a shared constituency to step up and do the right thing. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I'm a tenant in Los Angeles, and um, I'm a tenant organizer with East Elites. Um, I urge you to vote yes on items 54 aid um, and ensure that tenants across the county are protected against, against eviction for no cost. Tenant protections are homelessness prevention, and the county has declared a state of emergency of hom homelessness. All tenants should have the right to know the reason that they are being evicted, and no one should lose their home because they took a household member or a pet during the last two years. Eviction without just cause are often a tool of discrimination, retaliation, and just displacement. 
Um, Supervisor Mitchell, um, can you please can we please have your vote on 54-8, please? As a single mother, I ask you to do it, to protect us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, everyone. I'm an Oswin organizer uh, with Eastside Leeds. Um, there have been many tenants that have reached out looking for assistance and housing in general because they're afraid of the end of the month. Uh, many landlords know when the protections will end and are simply waiting for them so that they can continue to do as they please, you know, but uh, again, no one should be kicked out of their home without any reason. Uh, many of these tenants have already received rent increases, notices, right, uh, from their landlords. And the landlords are asking for two to three times the amount of rent. And if they don't pay, they can leave, right? They are using this as an intimidating uh, tactic, right, against tenants. Um, <clears throat> and these are also tenants that have been paying for rent and have been paying throughout the pandemic. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I'd just like to ask for an explanation as to how that can happen. And also, right, in regards to reaching out to DCBA, like, what are they doing to enforce these laws? Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Bijan. Um, I'm a tenant organizer with Community Power Collective. Um, I'd like to, you all to vote, please, on item 54A. Um, there are currently 650,000 tenants who are not protected by the statewide law, the, the Tenant Protection Act, and thus don't have just cause protections. Extending these just cause protections to those who don't have it is an easy lift, let's be honest. All we're asking is that owners provide a legitimate reason why they want to evict their tenants rather than being able to kick an elderly person, a disabled person, or someone with kids out on the street with no reason, leaving tenants without any defense to fight an eviction. It's time to acknowledge that listening to these calls is actually tenants that provide housing for their landlords, seeing that many mom and pop landlords depend on their tenants for their income. It's tenants that are paying the mortgages for all these rental properties. Doesn't that afford them more rights? They're propping up AGLA, and asking for just cause protections is a small ask. And um, at least put more money into rehousing services. And Thank this you. is a way for certain landlords to get around non-payment protections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Greg Bonet. I'm a staff attorney with Public Council in support of item 54A. The board proclaimed a state of emergency for homelessness on January of this year, January 10th of this year. And with over 70,000 county residents experiencing homelessness on any given night and thousands dying each year, yes, it is an emergency. It's an emergency that requires the county to do everything in its power to address. And it's an emergency that undeniably crosses municipal boundaries. A family evicted in Hawthorne may have to double up with relatives in Compton or live in their car in Downey or seek assistance through the continuum of care, which covers, tries to coordinate housing services, um, in nearly every count city in the county. This is a countywide emergency and it requires a countywide response. The item, this item will give every tenant in the county basic just cause protections, avoiding arbitrary no cause eviction and improving housing stability for over 2 million tenants, including over 600,000 that aren't covered by local just cause or the State Tenant Protection Act. This could be one of the most significant Thank actions you. the board takes Thank to you. prevent homelessness. Thank you very Thank much. You. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Mateo, I'm in favor of 54A. I'm a resident of CD4, organizer with SAGE. As a coalition, Keep LA House, we recently held our own summit with over 100 people in attendance, people from unincorporated cities of Los Angeles County. What this tells us is that we have just scratched the surface and there is a huge need for tenant protections and for a tenant bill of rights to be adopted as proposed by our coalition. But today what we need is just cause for incorporated cities and areas that don't have these protections until March 31st, 2024. No evictions for unauthorized pets or tenants because we recognize that all life is sacred. And for the county to utilize its resources to prevent a huge massive tsunami of evictions. These landlords say that this is a mistake, but they would rather see people dead just for some profit. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Sofia Garcia. I'm a tenant organizer as well with Eastside Leeds and Stay Housed LA, and I am in favor of Motion 54A. I know firsthand the horrific impact zero tenant protections have had on Angelinos. 
and that is why we have filled two rows and landlords have the luxury of calling in. The programs we keep mentioning are not working. That's why we're here. The mental and physical health of children, seniors, and people with disabilities has severely deteriorated due to the stress of not having protections, the threat of eviction, and landlord harassment. We are still in a pandemic, and tenants are still being financially impacted. The least that can be done is to extend these protections for another year so they can stay housed through these unprecedented times. If you fail to pass this motion, there will be blood on your hands. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, my name is Pamela Agustin. I am part of the Keep LA House Coalition, and I'm also a tenant in the 5th District, Glendale, California. Thank you, Supervisors Horvath and Solis for authoring today's motion that if adopted would continue important protections that this board has already found crucial with keeping families housed countywide. As a Glendale tenant, the county's protections have offered us protection when our CD leaders, lead, leaders sorry, ignored our calls for stronger protections. Glendale residents desperately need protections, including rent control, removing rent banking, and a right to counsel for a city. I am seeing tenants in my city sign bad uh, move-out settlements because they couldn't find representation in time. It is very challenging to find new housing, and these tenants are experiencing that, especially the families. Tenants in incorporated cities like mine need more time. Thank we you. have a plan, Thank and we you. need your support. Thank you. Yes, the Red Chief, Red Chief Hunt. Hunt. Yes, I'm kind of confused about the uh, tenant. Uh, why, why are we holding the money back from the tenants? Um, if it's there, give it to them. Uh, I'm in favor and support of this bill, but I'm also in favor of support of the tenants getting paid too. Um, it's the kids 22 here. $100,000 is only $44,000 now in the city of Los Angeles study came out and we all losing here. So if somebody's making $25,000 a year, they only bring home $14,000 with the, uh, economy uh, in disruption and stuff like that. So please, please start listening. Do what you guys got to do, but also the tenants have to be paid too. So with that, you know, the Red Chief says, let's make this thing work. If there's a problem, there's a solution. The Red Chief Hunt. Thank you, Red Chief. Next speaker, please. Hello, Victoria Palayo. Um, we can't continue to push scapegoat agendas due to the lack of action on resources that are desperately needed in our communities. Please take note from Gloria Molina's tenacity and focus on helping these families pay their rent, create affordable housing, set up legal resources, set up mental health services, and help the homeless instead of placing the burden on the landlords. You stated a, ye a year would help you find these resources. Essentially, that has not been a priority, and that is extremely concerning for the families and individuals that need it the most. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Arnold Sachs. So I've got here um, County, Services, current County Services Guide. It says here, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, created in 1993 by the city and the county of Los Angeles, to address the problems of homelessness. That's a lot of shit. This is an agenda item from the city of Los Angeles, February 24th. Director Hakla, Los Angeles Homelessness Service Authority. But above it, it says Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles. Hakla. So is it housing or housing authority? This has gone on and on. This is this is just a game of, of words. I've got an I, my vaccine code. Influenza. Is it the COVID? Is it an update on the COVID? What about the other? What about the monkeypox? What about the SARS? What about the novel corona? You're just playing head games with everybody. It's a minimum wage thing. People are getting paid minimum wage. Thank Their you. benefits are based Thank on you. federal Thank minimum wage. Thank you, Arnold. And their salary is Thank based you. on what? Next speaker, please. Ooh, who would that be? Let me check my phone. Oh. Uh, 
Uh, do we have any more speakers? Yes, we're going to telephonic. I love the Lord. What? We're going to te telephonic. Let's go to the telephone. Our next participant is Vlad Polishuk. You may begin. Um, good, good afternoon, comrades. I urge you to vote no on 54A. In the background, I'll play the Soviet Union anthem so the communist Manchurian candidates amongst you will be triggered to pay attention. I stop the continuation of the eviction moratoria collectivization in whatever form under whatever pretext. If the intent is for more affordable housing, the eviction moratorium represents a Chinese finger trap. The harder you pull, the more stuck you become. Keeping track of a constantly changing regulatory environment is a cost all in itself. Add to that the ever-increasing risk to rent collection, increased legal risk, price controls, lease covenants getting overridden with sunset dates that are moving targets, gives a whole new meaning to housing instability, or dare I say political instability. Political risk to property rights is past COVID-19 reality of investing in LA Realty in 2023. Eventually, risks get priced. When costs uh, go up on the producer, they get, get passed along to the consumer. Lots of supply and demand holds, uh, housing shortage, constant regulatory disincentives to build more, drive market rents higher. Higher barriers to entry reduce the amount of landlords' com uh, competitors, and less competition leads to lower quality and increased Thank prices. You. Thank you. Prices work as an Thank you. Your time has expired. And your music, too. Uh, do we have another speaker on the phone? Yes, we do. Okay, go ahead. Our next participant is Karen Karapetin. You may begin. Yes. Pardon me, just go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Karen Karapetin, and I'm a Los Angeles tenant, so I I'm asking you to vote yes. Uh, as a uh, father of the family and uh, I, I, I go through, through this also the eviction process. The people, it's very hard to file the landlord. They, they need the protection. I have been impacted by COVID, and now I have to relocate it. I just signed a deal because I, the, the, a lot of people, they just be impacted by COVID. I just ask him to say the word yes, please. It's a it's lot of people that are going to go become the homeless. Very hard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is David Cheney. You may begin. All right, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. And some other stuff, okay. too. I just wanted to say, I, <laughs> I wanted to say that um, I had a property where a tenant uh, did not pay for two and a half years and, and made 165000 with Airbnb. And then, um, she bought a house in Texas. So well, we have to remember that te tenants have not, and I had to, you know, eventually uh, pay it out of my own pocket while she had a, uh, a state provider. Given any money from the state, it's put in a very bad position financially. I'm a retiree. I'm not the only person who's going to have to go, go out of business here and sell my properties to hedge funds because we can't just keep supporting people like this. And it was, I, I feel like when you talk about equity, you're not talking about everybody you're talking about only tenants that i don't hear you talking about owners at all and i've lived here for 30 years and and really helped this community and i, I it's very disturbing to me thank you thank you very much hope you're not driving and talking um next speaker on the phone our next participant is connie rodriguez you may begin uh, hello thank you for taking my call I just want to say I am voting or would like you to vote no on the, uh, on the bill. The reason being is I am a landlord. Uh, the tenants that are not paying their rent are buying $45,000 SUV. They're making bad decisions because they are not paying their rent, but I still have to pay my bills. When and buy the $45,000 Cadillac SUV, let their 15-year-old son drive it and crash it. And they still can't pay their rent. The other one took a month off of their work and went to uh, Mexico because they have all this other money. The, the other one, oh, it just goes on and on. It's just absolutely ridiculous. I don't, there's no bank giving me money. 
Okay, thank you very, I'm, thank you very much for calling. Thank you very much for calling. Next speaker, please. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Matthew Salabin. You may begin. Please do not pass item 54A. I own a small residential complex in Long Beach. Half of my tenants' rents are below market rent value. One of those tenants is a nuisance to other tenants and neighbors because of loud parties, multiple legal pets that are loud and damaging the unit. First off, 99% of tenants don't become homeless as evicted. They move to cheaper areas and rentals. Stop your lies. Don't interfere with my right to enforce a private contract between private individuals. I should be able to evict a tenant for back owed rent in violation of a rental contract. If I don't, my good and rent paying tenants may move out. I didn't buy a complex within the city of LA because the rent control there makes it very difficult to raise rent, market value, manage, or evict tenants. If you make all of LA County rent control, it reduces property value and makes it less desirable to buyers and lenders. No one has the right to live in someone else's property if they can't afford it. The social assistant takes away a Thank landlord's you. Thank incentive you. and ability. Thank you for your call. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Ever Huckabee. You may begin. Yes, thank you for taking my call. This is Everett Huckabee. I'm a small uh, property owner, a member of the Apartment Zone Association, and I urge you to vote no on, um, on this measure. And I also want to say that if you punish land uh, homeowner providers, you're going to hurt your renters more than you're going to help them. So please vote no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Rick Alejandrino. You may begin. Thank you for taking my call. My name is Rick Alejandrino, and I'm a tenant and senior. And I live in Glendale, California. I urge you to vote yes on item 54A. As a Glendale tenant, the, country's, the county's protections have offered us protection against eviction, but, but we need desperately need stronger protections, including rent control, removing banking, and a stronger anti-harassment protection. Given your promise to support with, with a summit and the toolkit and your lack of action thus far, the absolute bare minimum you can do right now is to support in com incorporated cities now to, to extend emergency just cause protections countywide until March 34, 2024. Thank you for this and thank you for the emotion of supervisors Horvat and Solis. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is David Potter. You may begin. We need tenant protections. Let's be fair. We also need housing provider protections. Supervisor Solis drastically underestimates the impact the moratorium has had on housing providers. She refers to us as landlords. We are housing providers. We are on the same team as the county by providing safe housing. Supervisor Horvath and Solis have taken an emergency COVID eviction moratorium and politicized it into a homeless issue. COVID has absolutely nothing to do with homelessness. With the COVID eviction moratorium, the county is attempting to hold housing providers responsible for the homeless situation in Los Angeles, which is totally irrational. 55% of all rental units in Los Angeles County are owned by single owners that only own one unit. Measure H, the $3.55 billion fund that has been in effect for six years, use those funds appropriately, please. The homeless situation has only increased dramatically since eviction moratorium, which is clearly an indication the eviction moratorium is ineffective. Los Angeles County has a huge housing shortage and desperately needs additional units Thank created. You. Thank Developers you for your just call. won't come to Los Angeles Thank County with, with these crazy laws and Thank you. Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Nell Bailey. You may begin. Uh, yes, uh, good evening. Well, it's after 5 o'clock, so good evening to you all. Um, I come to you as a community activist and a proud member of District 2. We all know that we're all aware that unhoused families often have children. I mention this because how will this agenda item coupled with Measure H be addressed by the Department of Youth Development? We know that some youth engage in activities that are deemed criminal in nature, whether it's malum in se or malum prohibita. A lot of these actions are done out of, uh, out of survival and necessity. As a homeowner, as a landlord, and as a former renter, I understand both sides of the argument. Um, item 54 has the potential to actually increase the amount of youth offenders. 
And I'm not sure if the Department of Youth Development is prepared for that and the parameters set for it. So whatever is decided, I just ask that you keep both sides in mind and listen and, and just you. receive. Thank you. Thank you for today. your call. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Jesse Flores. You may begin. Hi, my name is Jesse. I'm a tenant in Norwalk and member of the resident-led group Norwalk Unidas. I urge this board to vote yes for just cause countywide. I grew up in Norwalk and hope to stay here long term in my life, but, but I'm faced with increased rent prices here and, and I'm scared that I'm going to be priced out of my own hometown. More than 34% of Norwalk's residents are renters with 54% of those households being rent burdened. A household has to earn approximately 85,200 annually to not be rent burdened here. Families are financially strained. Friends, senior to fixed incomes, and other working class families want the reassurance that we won't be evicted and end up homeless due to no cost. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Kenny Lim. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Kenny Lim, and I'm an attorney with California Poverty Law Group. Um, we're not necessarily for or against item 54A, but we're really concerned more about the language of the resolution. Um, essentially, no fault or just cause protections um, within the LA County's uh, chapters are very limiting. They don't really talk about tenancies at will or 1160, CCP 1161A cases. Um, if the board is to pass this, essentially I would really urge the board to really revisit what that list entails of what just cause is, because sometimes it's way too inclusive and it will hurt landlords who, or well, people who are renting out to uh, their sister or their brother or their son or something. Um, so essentially, if the board is looking to pass this, we really would urge that the board would revisit what just cause is. And in the event that they don't pass this, again, we, we feel very strongly that accessibility to the law is more important than the substantive law. Currently, there are many protections place in place for tenants, and accessibility is Thank the problem you. more than anything else. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Alessandra Valdez. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Alessandra Valdez and I'm a tenant in the city of Burbank. I urge our board of supervisors to vote in support of 54A. Burbank is over 60% renters, but we have no tenant protections. I'm currently organizing alongside my neighbors to fight for tenants' rights at a local level, and the stories we've heard across the city have been harrowing. 10% max rent increases allowed by the state are currently displacing seniors and black and brown people at a disproportionate level. I'd like to urge our Board of Supervisors to really consider the power imbalance between tenants and landlords. We do not own the land we live on, and if we're priced out of our homes, tenants are the ones who need to find an entirely new place to live. We're the ones who have to live with the fear of losing our housing, not property managers and not property owners. Tenant protections will simply level the playing field and make the housing market fair for everyone, including mom and pop landlords. Please vote in support of 54A and give our cities time to enact permanent tenant protections. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Zeke Sandoval. You may begin. Good evening, supervisors. This is Zeke Sandoval with PATH in support of item 54A. It's simple. Tenant protection is homelessness prevention. This package of common sense reforms lifts tenants to a more even footing without unduly burdening small landlords. No one should fall into homelessness because a tenant and landlord couldn't come together to address an issue. Universal just cause protections offer an opportunity for conversation instead of resorting to immediate eviction. And in uncertain economic times, when hundreds of thousands of renters in the county are doing everything they can to make rent, ensuring renters can stay housed and manage their rent payments while working through any debt is essential. Looking beyond these proposed reforms, we're eager to support the county in efforts to educate tenants and assist cities in establishing their own protections. In particular, we're excited to learn more about centralizing enforcement of tenant protections within the county's broader homelessness response system at COHI. Aligning legal protections with financial assistance makes perfect sense. We're grateful to county staff for their hard work on these programs, to supervisors Horvath and Solis for bringing this motion, and for all of you for staying with us. I know it's been a very long and busy day. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Uh, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Mark Smittle. You may begin. Thank you so much. Uh, I am opposed to 54A, please vote no. I'm a single family landlord. I have a single, uh, I have one house with my wife that we bought years ago. We've raised five children and we were able to uh, 
to move into another home and keep that one for our tenants. Uh, but I, I can't see how this can possibly have anything to do with homelessness. I mean, landlords are in the business of making money, not making people homeless. I mean, I love my tenants and I, and I take care of them, but I have many expenses and the taxes are going up and the expenses to keep the home up are, are increasing. Please, please vote no on this because I just cannot keep in business as a, as a small, small landlord. Please, I urge you to vote no on this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is April Amra. You may begin. Yes, hi, thank you for listening. Um, I'm with the gentleman before me. We are also a small mom and pop and begging you to please, please vote no for 54A. COVID provisions and moratoriums were previously needed, but extending them at this point absolutely has a counter effect on our tenants that we absolutely love. It has a, the effect of raising rent that we have to, we can't sustain the damage anymore. We have to pass these costs that we're, that we're, we have to pay our mortgages and we can't, we've been burning through our own personal savings to be able to pay our mortgage. We need to, we don't want to raise our rents on the tenants, the other people that we love, but we have one who's taken advantage completely of these moratoriums and we're having to, unfortunately, eventually we're going to have to pass it off to them. So it's having a counter effect. Please, we beg you, we urge you, do not vote yes, vote no on 54A. Enough is enough. We want, we love our tenants. We want to provide housing for them. Measure 54A has a counter Thank effect. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Ryan Barrett. You may begin. Good evening, supervisors. My name is Ryan Barrett, representing the Pasadena Foothills Realtors. We ask you to vote no on agenda item 54A. I'll be concise as possible. When are you going to start protecting the people who are investing in the community? Continuing the eviction moratorium in this way won't solve the homeless problem. As a reminder, we've had AB 1482 in place since 2020. It was purposely designed to not have loopholes. It does what it is designed to do and provides protections throughout the state. Item 54A is a huge overstep by the county. You have some very good council members in our cities and they have a clear picture of what is happening at the local level. They are more than capable of making appropriate decisions to govern their cities. I urge you to trust your cities. Use AB 1482 and let your cities make those smart decisions and do the right thing for each of their communities. Let them take the lead on guiding and creating the best action plans for their municipalities. We strongly encourage a no vote on this agenda item. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Francisco Negro. You may begin. Hi, I got cut off earlier, so I wanted to call back again. Um, I'm urged to vote no on 54A. Um, as a um, property owner, going back to the issue with adding pets, um, we're talking about people versus pets. You know, we should be more concerned about putting people out on the street and not the pets. Uh, it makes no sense. Um, that's a big concern. In terms of costs going up, that continues to happen, but there's no protection for landlords. I know I'm ranting. I've been listening to you guys talk about this for five hours. Board members, I don't know how you sit through this stuff. My hat's off to you. Um, but this is a, a passionate thing for me as it is for many of the other owners and obviously the tenant. Thank you. Because people like you just keep it interesting. Okay, next speaker, please. <laughs> Our next participant is Mr. Lewis. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, I want you to vote no on 54A. Uh, I am a landlord in LA County and a member of the Apartment Association of California Southern Cities. Uh, and uh, I cannot thrive with such uh, uh, rules imposed upon landlords. And a tenant can easily move to another location, but a landlord can't pick the business up, uh, the business structure and move back. Uh, like hotels, hotel guests, uh, tenants are guests, and if they are unconducive to the uh, the building, then they should leave, and they do have 30 to 60 days to do so. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Our next participant is Diana Beard-Williams. You may begin. Hello, everyone. I have listened to all the comments, and I wanted to say I have been on all sides. I have owned homes that I've been scammed in terms of time by tenants. I've lost homes because of them. I now, be, I'm 69 years of age, even though I've devoted my whole life to fighting for causes. I tell you, nobody I've heard says anything about the American dream. You work all of your life to be able to own property. And nobody said I have to own property and be concerned about homeless and this and putting pets out. No one tells me I should feel like blood is on my hands because I want to protect my own financial security and my family. I urge the supervisors to vote not for or against, but to vote for sanity and what's appropriate. Take into consideration the pain on both sides, but realize the greatest sacrifice of all was made by the people who secured those buildings. Thank you. And to make fun Thank of you. them because they say Ahmad is unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Jaime Rodriguez. You may begin. Greetings, comrade. Horvath and Solis, my name is Jaime Rodriguez, a single rental housing provider, and I would like to voice my strong opposition towards your misguided motion of quote-unquote critical tenant protections, but rather more ways to steal from private hardworking families to fund pet projects and be disingenuous to the public by rebranding it as a homelessness initiative. The lying has to stop. We all know these critical tenant protections will not stop come March 2024. A new convenient emergency will suddenly be used at the 11th hour to extend and incorporate cities again. I am calling out this crap from the disingenuous supervisors. Stop stealing from me and all other hardworking private families providing housing. Supervisors should stay in their lanes only in the unincorporated uh, cities after three years of one-sided nonsense. Leave us incorporated cities alone and let us make Thank our you. own decisions Thank you. And Thank about you. our properties and our lives. Thank please you. abstain. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Jesse Torres. You may begin. Hi, yes, I, I, I am asking you to oppose 54A. Uh, I'd like to say that the pandemic has been declared over. Let me repeat, the pandemic is over. Let's just extend another, another year. We heard this year after year. If you really want to say, set a good example, as you stated, then start making decisions that make sense because the pandemic is over. If you truly care about homelessness, allocate a larger portion of your billion dollar budget to deal with the cause of the problem and not deal with the mismanagement on the backs of landlords. Tenants have always had great amount of protections and this has nothing to do Nothing to help with the housing problem, but only creates the burden on the uh, of the county on the problems of back to the landlords. We too have uh, many miles of feet. I have children. Currently, um, it seems that we are the remaining victims of the pandemic because it's just another year, and then the goalpost gets pushed further and further for landlords. Enough, please oppose 54A. It's enough. Thank you. Thank you. I know I see uh, Celia talking to the sergeant and I, but I was wondering if we could provide some water to uh, these folks who've like been here all day, um, if, if that's possible. You're not worried about that being a security risk, are you? Anyway, I, I'm feeling for you all. We're, we're up here too, we're, we're with, but you guys have been here a long time. So you guys, somebody already brought you water? Okay, all right, just wanna make sure. There's a little girl out there too. Does she need any snacks or anything? Okay, good. Oh, look, you came prepared. Yeah, okay. Good answer. Okay, uh, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Alejandro Lara. You may begin. Hi, uh, my name is Alejandro. Uh, I urge you to vote no on 54A. I am a small landlord. Uh, I have mortgages, I have two duplex that I bought it, and I have mortgages on these ones. I worry every day that my tenants gonna stop paying, which already happened in the past. And I had a good tenant, but until they heard about these protections, they just called me and say couldn't pay. Uh, I work, I work 12 hours every day, and 
I could be considered a minority. Uh, I come from difficulties. I'm one of those guys that very young, uh, went to prison. I turned around my life. And I worked really hard to to do this. And, and, and I learned that I couldn't, could invest in properties. I don't earn money on these properties. It's for the long term. And that's why uh, I, 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 it, it puts me in a, in a very disadvantaged Thank you. position. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for calling. Yes. Next speaker, that's please. All. Our next participant is Brittany Benesey. You may begin. Good evening, members of the board. I'll be quick. I'm speaking on behalf of the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals to ask you to approve item 54A with a focus on the second provision of the motion related to unauthorized pets. As the county shelters continue to struggle with overcrowding and residents are faced with extremely limited pet-friendly housing options, ensuring that pets who are required during the emergency are able to stay in their homes will support our shelters while allowing tenants to continue to enjoy the physical, mental, and emotional benefits of having a pet. We wanna thank Supervisors Hor Horvath and Solis for bringing this motion forward and thank each of you for engaging with the ASPCA and our partners on solutions to enhance pet-friendly housing options in LA County. I respectfully ask for your eye vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Roy Humphreys. You may begin. Okay, uh, folks, one thing I want to, that speaker that uh, spoke just before you went to uh, the live people, it, that, that was a point of genius in that I know all your supervisors are going to uh, get your uh, bedrooms out there that are vacant and, and have that, that that'd just be so sweet, wouldn't it? But the next question is, what uh, rabbit uh, do you envision pulling out of a hat six months, a year down, down the road? That's very interesting. Do you have any idea, any concept where this uh, th item ends? What, what's your end game, as they say? And the other thing, the only real end game is up, and that is to be like in Chicago, New York, the, the big eastern cities, and, and perhaps even areas of San Francisco, where you have huge, absolutely mammoth public housing uh, projects to house the uh, low-income or indigenous personnel. It, it, it's just another situation. If you want to see a little bit of what's like, there's a series called The Wire. It's, it's an old series, but it's really, really good. So folks, get out there and uh, do you. what you can do. Thank you. But start Thank time you. to deal with reality. Let's have our next speaker, please. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dan Huey. Hi, my name is Dan and I am a tenant at, uh, in Pasadena, Catherine Barger's district, and I'm calling to strongly advocate for the passage of uh, 54A. We need stronger tenant protections. I myself was a tenant who was run evicted and kicked out of my building along with 24 other individuals who are now scattered throughout um, the area. They should have been able to stay in their homes and stay connected to their community. And so this is why I'm calling in and asking for your, your support. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Leonard Siegel. You may begin. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Supervisors uh, Leonard Siegel, renter in the third district. Please vote yes. Uh, people in many cities need your help. Please do whatever you can to protect people from eviction and give more time to build more housing and financially help all stakeholders. No fault evictions are also important. That are, there are many vulnerable renters, elderly, handicapped, terminally ill, and others. Unhoused people cost more money to government and increases uh, hospitalization and death. So thank you for your heartfelt motion to protect society. Hopefully together we all move forward. Thank you again for voting yes. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. Okay. <laughs> Anybody in the audience? Okay, great. I see uh, Supervisor Barger. Yeah. I you have, have a, one question? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, Raphael, I mean, just out of curiosity, the money that we allocated, refresh my memory, if a landlord draws down that money, is there any provision that they cannot evict for 12 months um, if they accept the funds for back pet back rent? So no. long as the tenant stays up to date with the rent? No, there is not. There is not? Have we done that in the past? I, for some reason, I thought we talked about this at the board, where if a landlord accepted 
back rent through these funds, that there would be some sort of protection that they could not evict that individual for a period of time? So as part of the small mom and, small mom and pop landlord non-mortgage related grant, uh, the grant will provide $30,000 to cover rental arrears with the condition that in, uh, in accepting the grant, they will forgive any additional rental arrears beyond the $30,000. And what is the cap on this $45 million? If someone owes, let's say, $38,000 or, or goes over the forty. dollars So at, uh, as, as proposed, it's, it's a $30,000 grant as well, uh, which will also continue. The landlord will still be allowed to try to collect on um, the balance. Go ahead. I was say because the goal was to relieve the tenant of the debt burden. Correct. But I'm also thinking that if we are going to allocate county resources to do pack back rent, that we might want to tie it to some sort of protection for that tenant for at least a year, if they are up to date each month on their rent, so they don't go back into the rears. Do you follow me? Yeah. But they, but um, they can't. They, there is no protection for non-payment of rent now. So you have to pay your rent. Yeah. No, I understand. But what I'm I'm saying is that if if I'm a landlord uh -huh. and my tenant's behind in the rears twenty seven thousand uh -huh. and I'm waiting to apply for that twenty seven thousand that I'm gonna get, uh -huh. I would sign something saying this tenant is now up to date and now for one year um, uh, they will be protected from any sort of eviction. What? We don't have that a doesn't exist. No, I know. I'm, I'm, like I'm thinking out loud. When I listen, I mean, I, I am sympathetic to the issues, but I'm trying to play both sides. And I'm not going to do it today. I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud, and I wanted to get a clarification. I know that we have done it before, because I am sensitive to the tenants, but I'm also sensitive to the landlords, and I feel as though there's got to be a balance um, as it relates to how we move this forward. And. My other question is, is the money only for unincorporated or is it for countywide? No, it's countywide. Countywide. Yeah. Okay. I, um, I apologize, except for City of LA. Okay. I mean, I'm not for a vote today. I was just thinking out loud, and I wanted to get... Maybe that could be part of the report back, um, and that's uh, that we could we could look at. Why don't that... We could add that as part of the report back directives to, to, to explore that. And if I may, I know that there were very many property owners or representatives of property owners who are asking for support and relief. And I want to be, once again, reiterate and be extremely clear. No fault evictions, just cause evictions. What we're talking about is people still have to pay their rent. They still have to abide by the terms of their lease. Because of Ellis, because of state law, there are what's called no fault evictions. And these are people who are paying their rent who are adhering to every single term of their lease, who have not brought new people into their units, who have not brought pets into their units, but people who are paying their rent and who may even be current. We're just asking for them to be protected while we stem the tide of this crisis. And, and I understand that, but I also understand that, that there were individuals that testified that they are gonna be evicted if we do not do this. And my question is, if they are in the rears, and this money is used to bring them up to where they need to be, then maybe that would be an opportunity for us to stay off evictions um, based on the fact that the, land, the landlord's made whole and the tenant is protected for a year. And I know the no fault, I, I, I know all that, but I'm just, I'm thinking for those that have testified that um, if we lift this, they're gonna be evicted, I would assume that some of them are going to be evicted because they are in the rears on the rent. Well, part of that is that why we is why we had Directive Three. We've been hearing for from tenants who are now paying their rent currently. They believe they're staying current, but their landlords are taking their rent and applying it to back due rent, which may, puts them at risk of being evicted. So this directive would say that year, for a year from the end of end of March, when we lift the COVID restrictions very clear, right. no more COVID protections, when we would lift the end, lift those at the end of this month right. to March of next year, that, that Directive 1 is saying 
people get to stay if they're paying their rent and following the terms of their lease. Directive three says if they start paying rent current as of April 1st, then uh, they can they have a year to pay back that rent so they can't be evicted for holding that debt. So we wouldn't have to decide what you're indicating today. We could have time to figure that piece out if we pass directive three today. But there are those, and I, and I hear what you're saying, but there are those that are not gonna be able to pay back their back rent in a year. They're making minimum wage and are barely able to pay the rent right now. So to Supervisor Mitchell's point, when we had discussed this last time, we're putting them further in debt. And it, at what point do you try to solve the back rent and start fresh, but also protect them from being evicted in situations where, quite frankly, the landlord is just trying to recoup the cost. And if they're willing to, to, to get the back rent but all, and be made whole, but also keep that tenant in the unit, then that addresses some of the concerns that I've heard. Well, about. like I said, if you want to, we can ask. Well, that. I mean, and I'm not going to do it today because right. I, I, it's got to be flush. I mean, I, I right. kind of, you know, that's been my frustration. And and again, Supervisor Horvath, I appreciate and I and I love the fact that you know when we talk about this, I understand why. I understand why it's the how that I'm having a problem with, and I think my frustration is is that rather than look at this holistically, it was we're going to do it one more time. We're going to do it one more time, and now it's we need one more year. And I feel like we'll keep kicking the can when we have an opportunity to work with the courts, to work with both sides, to come up with something that's going to be a tenant protection that is not going to be a, an eviction moratorium per se. It's actually going to be something that, that addresses some of the um, shortfalls or shortcomings of the current laws on the books. But the how isn't a moratorium. It does, it, people still have to pay their rent. They still have to abide by the terms of their lease, and they would have up to one year, which would be the reason why we're asking for that one year on Directive 1, is because people need uh, have up to a year to pay back their rent. So that, that gives people the time to know that um, as long as they're keeping current on their rent, and they have to figure out in this next year. And I'm hearing you that there will be people who at the who in March 2024 will still have an unpaid debt that they have to figure out. I'm very clear about that. These protections today do not address a year from now that problem. We still have to figure that out. These protections today address the fact that we are coming to the end of the COVID moratorium in just a couple of weeks. There will be people who will be at risk we are trying to offer additional protections. I am clear that people are frustrated that the report was filed on Friday. We are also frustrated that this conversation has been going on for quite some time and the directives that have asked for more protection have not come forward. So we've been working to figure out what are the most imminent changes we can bring forward today to help people stay in their housing while we get this summit up and going, while we get longer term protections in place and have the ability and time to engage people in more discussion. This, uh, based on what you identified with regard to state law already on the books, just make sure that those loopholes, that 650,000 people or more are protected for a year. It's already state law, so it's not, it, it's what we're protecting are the people who fall through the cracks because they are then going to fall into the pipeline of homelessness and we will have to pay for them on that side. And for my part, I would prefer that we keep people in housing that they're already in and not have to deal with them on, on that side of things and force people into homelessness to be willing to pay for, to help them. And I, and I agree with you on that. Um, and I'm prepared to support the report backs in 30 days but I'm just not there on the action today, but I am there on the report backs. And again, pushing you, Raphael, to bring something to us that we can discuss and bifurcate into what's state action and what is within our own purview at the county level um, to do. Because I know some of the recommendations are gonna be state legislation, correct? Yes, and, and actually, we had a big win today on state legislation. Our uh, AB 875 county sponsored bill passed in consent uh, through the assembly committee, judiciary committee. Uh, so we're hoping that the, we, the momentum keeps there and we continue to push that. Um, I, I do want to, I do want to address some of the comments that were made by the, by the public if, if you go humor me. 
in, in particular, not for me, but for my staff who are listening, for my staff that are here. There were some innuendos and, and, and some statements about what they're not doing and what, they're not, what they are doing. I just want to say that we have some highly dedicated people that day in, day out are handling over 300 calls a day, dealing with these stories in the day in, day out, taking those stories home themselves and trying to help them. This board, too, I have to commend you on the work that we've done. Because of your leadership, we've been able to advance some of the strongest protections within the unincorporated, and it should be definitely a model that most cities should try to follow. Um, you know, to our partners, the QPLA House Coalition, they have nine recommended, recommended policies that they're pushing through in their tenant bill of rights. Six of those, this board has already implemented. Three of them are partially implemented, and we're well underway into enhancing and advancing those. So there is work being done here, and I want my team to be recognized that, that are listening. Also, earlier, our already partners uh, nicely pointed out that my budget before ARP was $17 million. I want to let my partners know and the State House Coalition that $25 million a year are being pumped into our State House LA program. That's bigger than my departmental budget. Uh, so there is a commitment to the work here, and I just want that to be recognized for my staff that are listening. Thank you. Well, colleagues, you know, we, I mean, we, we are called to make the tough decisions. That's why uh, uh, we're in these positions. And uh, for me, you know, this is a familiar position that we've been in before. Uh, one where we're days away from the planned ending of our countywide emergency tenant protections. And we have in front of us um, a last minute motion uh, to, I know you don't like to use the word extend, but to put in uh, place uh, more emergency protections. And, you know, time and again, I have voted to extend these protections every single time over the strong objections of many of my mom and pop. Uh, landlords, um, and we heard overwhelmingly uh, from them. And by the way, thank you for everybody that came down to testify. And I think today we had a we had a good mix of tenants and landlords, uh, both here and both on the phone, who wanted to express their side of the the story. And you know, that's what housing is. It's it's an equation. We we have the tenants and we have the landlords, and you really can't have one without the other. Uh, the landlords need their tenants, the tenants need their landlords. Um, and, you know, we've got we've to work to, you know, bring both sides together and do a decision that makes sense for everybody. You know, when we put the original moratorium in place, eviction moratorium, we were in a crisis that demanded it. At the height of the pandemic, unemployment had skyrocketed and going to work was a literal threat to people's lives and health. We made the unprecedented decision to impose a countywide eviction moratorium onto all the cities in the county uh, because the unprecedented crisis created by the pandemic uh, warranted that. But that part of the crisis ended. Um, businesses have reopened. Unemployment is at the lowest it has been in decades. And last year, we paired our emergency order to more limited tenant protections, but continued to impose those on all 88 cities in the county. I supported those because we talked about it being a reasonable off-ramp. It gave tenants time to prepare for the end of our emergency protections and gave our cities the time they needed to put in place their own permanent tenant protections. And going into that January 24th meeting, I was fully prepared to vote no on the proposal to do another extension of tenant protections. But I heard from some of my cities who said they needed more time to put permanent tenant protections in place. So I agreed uh, to your proposal, Supervisor Horvath, to extend these protections through the end of, the Mar of March. We've now more than three years into having these emergency tenant protections countywide. We've extended them time and time again, and there has been time for our cities to put in place their own protections. And I just feel at this point, um, I feel like for me anyway, I can't speak for anybody else, it feels like an overreach right now to impose these on um, the incorporated cities. We have put tenant protections in our unincorporated um, areas of the counties. That's where we always have authority, but emergency situations do give us authority um, to go into other cities and tell them what to do. But I think if there's elected officials at the city level, and I've 
got some letters from some of them that still want more time to put in their own tenant protections, I'm urging you to act now. If you need more time to consider what your permanent protections will be, I urge you to put in place temporary ones while you do that work. And I think you could model your temporary protections off the motion that we're looking at right now that's in front of us. And if there's a city, I'm gonna say this out loud, if there's a city in my district, one of the 32 cities in my district that wants to put in place tenant protections, my staff, I know, uh, Raphael, your staff, we stand ready to work with you to help you write these tenant protections. You could start putting them in at your next council meeting. Um, I do think, though, the county has a role to play in helping tenants who cannot pay their rent. Um, and as Supervisor Solis, this keeps her up at night. Those who are in fear of not being able to pay their rent. Um, whether you live in unincorporated or you live in one of the cities, we have a role in helping you. Um, our board recently allocated an additional $45 million for rental assistance. Stay Housed LA currently offers up to $12,000 in rental assistance to tenants um, in need and up to $20,000 for tenants living in unincorporated areas. So we have to do a better job of helping people who need our help. But at this time, I think it's time for the cities and the county to step up. Um, they are always talking about local control. Well, this is a local control issue for all of our cities. Step up, help the tenants in your cities. But at this time, I feel like I need to keep my word that I have said um, publicly that this was the last time that I was going to do it. And so um, I think the arguments in favor of this made a lot of sense last year, but I think we're in a very different situation right now, and I think our policy needs to reflect that. So um, without further ado, this motion is before us. Thank you again for everyone uh, staying and, and engaging with us. Um, 54A is before us. I heard perhaps, uh, Madam Chair, if you will, um, a willingness perhaps to bifurcate some parts yes, of the you're motion. Correct. Are you willing to bifurcate the report back? That's, is there support? It's the second part. <clears throat> it's directive okay. five through nine. Yeah. Yeah, we are I'm doing sure some. We're doing some of that. We anyway. are doing some of that anyway, but we we can buy for. So it's instructed the, the director of consumer and business affairs to take the following actions and report back to the board in writing in 30 days. These, is that what you want to bifurcate? Okay. If that if that's all there's support for, I mean, I'm looking to see. It's it heard. I heard from the chair there wasn't support for this motion. Um, I'm not sure about where you are on any of the. I, Okay, uh, understood. So would you understood. like to bifurcate So the report backs, our Supervisor Solis, okay. are you willing to consider those? Bifurcate. Mm -hmm. And consider the report backs only? I want to I want to consider the front part and all of it. Okay, so we'll I we'll consider both. Right to, we'll take two votes then if that's okay, yes, Madam Chair. Right. Yeah, I think um, so right. to we, need a, we need a move and second to bifurcate and then we'll vote on the bifurcation. I, I move to bifurcate. So do, is there a second? Second, should we take that vote first? And then we need a vote on the bifurcation. And then we'll vote on directives one through four. So we have to vote on the bifurcation. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a vote, vote on whether or not we want to bifurcate. Okay. Okay. So, um, to bifurcate, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Raise a hand. I motion carries five to zero to bifurcate. Now we need to move and second on the vote um, to uh, vote on directives one through four. So I need a move and move. A second. Supervisor second for Hahn. Supervisor Horvath. Yes. Supervisor okay. Horvath. And now this is vote on directives one through four on item 54A. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Abstain. Supervisor Mitchell abstains. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Barger. Supervisor Barger. No. 
Supervisor Hahn. It's a report back, right, on those? No, no this, this is, is uh, this is one no, through four. This is the first section. This is the first this section. Is yes. Okay. No. Supervisor Hahn, no. Motion two to two with one abstention. Motion fails. Okay, now this is on, um, I need a move and second on directives five through nine, which is the report back. I'll move it. Supervisor Horvatz moves it. Second. Mitch, Supervisor Mitchell second, seconds. So this is on the vote on the directives five through nine, which is the report back. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Horath, aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries five to zero on the report back. Thank now, you to my colleagues you, for that discussion. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, it was, it was very good. Now, somebody's gonna have to figure out how to communicate to everybody, because I'm pretty sure everybody that just heard that vote has no idea what we just did. Uh, but uh, just wanna make sure we did that properly. Thank you. Okay. Um, at this time, it would be appropriate to hear from supervisors on items not on the posted agenda or be presented or referred to staff or placed on future agenda. Supervisor Mitchell, it's my understanding that you have a special. Ma'am, I do. Thank you very much. Colleagues, I have a read in motion co-sponsored with Supervisor Solis regarding the Medi-Cal redetermination process. Beginning April 1st, 2023, counties across the state will begin annual Medi-Cal renewals for all beneficiaries. Uh, this process um, was put on hiatus during uh, the pandemic. Experts project nearly two to three million Californians could lose their Medi-Cal benefits. In LA County, this Medi-Cal redetermination process will affect nearly four million residents. Uh, the first district is, um, is uh, significantly impacted with almost a million Medi-Cal beneficiaries in the district, and so this is really important. So the reading is as follows, colleagues. We therefore move that the Board of Supervisors direct the Director of the Department of Public Social Services in coordination with the Director of the Department of Health Services to report back via presentation to the Board on Tuesday, April 4th, 2023, on plans to implement the Medi-Cal redetermination process in a manner that collaborates with community partners and as much as possible, minimizes any unnecessary disruption to health benefits and services. So, uh, appreciate your support. Thank you. Let me get this straight. So, oh yes, Supervisor um, Solis. Yes, as, as her co-author. Oh, sorry, I didn't know you were co-author. Yeah, yeah, go. I mean, so we can vote on this. Right, we're gonna vote on this uh, after public comment oh. on the remaining items. So do you want to say something? Just briefly, yeah. I support the motion now. As okay, thank you. Have, oh, no. <laughs> uh, now become a member of LA Care. We've had this discussion, and we you've been carrying motions too, uh, Senator, Senator Holly Mitchell. And now we need to also extend this uh, protection. We almost have a million people in our district, 926,000. So we know that this has to happen. We have to hold our county departments accountable, DPSS, DHS as well as other health plans and community partners to make sure that we're reaching all those people that have to be redetermined and make sure that we are doing everything possible to get them enrolled. So wholeheartedly support this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I believe Supervisor Horvath has a special. Thank you very much. Uh, this uh, item is entitled Abortion Pill Court Ruling. Yeah. Um, and this is uh, the abortion medication status in the county. Um, as we know, access to abortion has been severely restricted since the repeal of Roe v. Wade last June. Just today, the governor of Arkansas approved a monument dedicated to aborted fetuses. Anti-abortion oh. activists have seized upon the Dobbs decision to introduce draconian legislation across the country and used our courts to further their agenda, leaving legal and medical chaos in its wake. Women in states with abortion bans are nearly three times more likely to die during pregnancy, childbirth, or soon after giving birth. Think about that statistic. Right now, 24.5 million women of reproductive age are living in states with abortion bans. If FDA approval of mifepristone is revoked, 64.5 million women of reproductive age in the U.S. would lose access to medication abortion care, an exponential increase in harm overnight. 
This doesn't include people who can get pregnant but do not identify as women. Factoring in that population, the number of people harmed is even higher. The most consequential and far-reaching of cases is Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine versus the F U.S. Food and Drug Administration, a case in the U.S. District Court challenging the FDA's approval of Mifepristone, one of the two medications typically used to provide medication abortion, the most common form of abortion in the nation. The judge could grant an emergency injunction that would force the FDA to withdraw its approval of Mifepristone, which would pull it off the market and, in effect, ban it nationwide. This motion reaffirms not uh, not only in LA and not not in LA and not Los, not on Los Angeles County's watch. We must continue to protect reproductive rights to ensure access to necessary medical care and being a refuge of reproductive access and justice for all. Last January, the board approved a motion by Supervisor Mitchell and my predecessor, Supervisor Kuehl, to ensure safe access to reproductive care for all, resulting in the Los Angeles County Abortion Safe Haven Project. The county worked with numerous community-based partner organizations and academic experts to plan for expanding and increasing access to abortion care and other reproductive health care. The Abortion Safe Haven Project is a network of county agencies, nonprofit, academic, and business partners, reproductive health, rights, and justice advocates, and healthcare providers committed to ensuring safe access to reproductive care for all, and to send the message that Los Angeles County stands in absolute contrast to sexist, bigoted, and harm-inducing states in this country who are actively harming women. Today, I am submitting a motion to do the following. One, instruct the chief executive officer, the directors of the Department of Health Services and Department of Public Health and County Council to report back at the April 4th, 2023 meeting on the status of the county's abortion safe haven project, including clarification on the status of Mifepristone, and two, to request the sheriff's department and the district attorney to report back at the April 4th, 2023 board meeting on plans to address the court ruling, including efforts to ensure access to abortion, including abortion medication, without the fear of enforcement and prosecution for those that seek out and provide those services. We will send a loud, clear message to the nation. Abortion care in Los Angeles County is available to pregnant people of any age, regardless of immigration status or where you live. We are here for you, and we will continue to fight for women's rights locally and across the nation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that motion will also be voted on after public comment. Okay. Okay, um, are there any other specials? Okay, then we will now hear from <laughs> We will now hear from members of the public wishing to address the board on all remaining items not held by supervisors and general public comment. For members of the public on the telephone, please press one, then zero now to comment on these items. You must indicate the agenda item numbers that you wish to address, including general public comment, in order for us to allocate the appropriate amount of time. But please, have mercy on us. It's, it's, it's 10 after six. Get to the point, and we're all ears. Uh, Executive Officer, please call the members of the public who signed up to speak on the remaining items and general public comment. Well, Harriet Elliott, Antigon Robinson, Mira Patel, Mena Gori, Donald Harlan, Arnold Sachs, and Corey Schmidt, please come forward and staff will assist you. Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please? No, we're going remote of first. Of course, we'll be going to call you we'll call you after after remote go ahead so our first one will be Sosa uh, Quinoas please go ahead yes I just want to inform the Board of Supervisors that once again in unincorporated East Los Angeles we had um, 5g wireless companies come in and try to install towers without notifying us and and uh, so I did contact my supervisor and the and the sheriff's department, and I will be sending pictures to our legal counsel. Your, your your body voted that they had to notify us, and they didn't notify us when we approached them and we asked them for the notices. They didn't have them, 
And when we approached them and asked them if they had permits, they did not have them. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to Joe Abiquin. Please go ahead. Good evening, my name is Joy Abiquin. I am the Quality of Life Prosecutor for the City of Redondo Beach, and I'm here to speak in favor of item number seven and general comments. I am speaking on behalf of Redondo Beach City Attorney Michael Webb, who has just flown in from Sacramento, having just testified in front of the Assembly Judiciary Committee in support of Assembly Bill 67, where it just passed this morning. Assembly Bill 67 would establish the Homeless Courts Pilot Program similar to the Homeless Court in Redondo Beach. It is a program set up for those individuals suffering homelessness who have committed crimes. Our program is focused at bringing the justice system to the community in a very supportive, non-threatening way to an area where the unhoused individuals are already spending their time. The goal is to set those individuals up for success by removing the obstacles that prevent them from becoming housed and ultimately get the cases dismissed upon getting permanently housed. We have a 79% average attendance rate with some sessions at 100% attendance for a population that usually fails to appear for their court appearances. Our city has seen a 44% decrease in homelessness from 2020 to 2022, in large part due to our homeless court, as well as our pallet shelter and other supporting programs. It works because of the partnership with the LA County Superior Court, the public defender, the alternate public defender, Department of Mental Health, the Sheriff's Office, and multiple service providers from various programs. Supervisors Hahn and Mitchell have been great supporters of our homeless court. This program has expanded to other areas of LA, such as Long Beach, Torrance, and Hermosa Beach. AB 67 would provide a framework and funding that could potentially be even more successful, which is why we are in support of Supervisor Hahn's motion to sponsor AB 67. Thank you. Next, we will go to Diana Beard-Williams. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, I would just like to make a public comment. Um, I would like to introduce to this board and to the Ansel Valley residents that we are forming an organization or have formed it called the Taste of Justice Antelope Valley. And our goal is to explore a class action lawsuit against Kaiser Foundation Health Plan and Kaiser Permanente for delivering substandard services, equipment, appointment times across the board in the Antelope Valley, which people up here in terms of our leaders are ignoring. Since 1997, I have been a Kaiser advocate and I maintain a good relationship with many Kaiser staff. Um, and I was the consultant in 1997. The Kaiser Foundation Health Plan put $50,000 on the table and had me change the zoning in Palmdale on 47th and S because they could not get it past the Planning Commission. So I am their advocate, but they are wrong what they're doing now. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we will go to Fran Sarasaz. Please go ahead. Hello? We can hear you. Hello? Go can ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, mercy. We can hear you. Okay, we'll move on to the next speaker, please. Open. There are currently no others in the queue at this time, Madam Chair. Thank you. We will go to speakers in person. Go ahead. I'm worried about this man rolling his eyes. I, uh, and yeah, so please don't do that and distract from what I'm talking about. Thank you. Um, I, I'm talking about mind reading radar, okay? Uh, something that police uh, are, I, I'm sure you read in the LA Times that the police are funding privately. Uh, they don't get enough money, and you're not knowing what they're t uh, funding for, okay? Well, I met a man named Terry uh, Neese, uh, N-E-E-S-E, -E, who has a Facebook account, yet he's a low-level criminal. And he said he thinks the reason the police are coming, uh, keeping him out of jail, he's a, he's a nonviolent offender, right? So he can stay out of jail. He thinks the reason he's staying out of jail is so police can use this on him. 
mind reading radar. And I'm, uh, can you take this and hand this out to them? I want to make sure that it's not t put on the side. I want to see you. Okay, it's a patent, and there are other patents by it's si silent sound. Anyway, these are real. Well, how do we know what police are doing? But that's what he said. He keep them out of jail. To work, uh, he's a test subject. That's amazing, I think. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Antigone Robinson, and I'm here on behalf of AHF to give general public comment about STIs in LA County. The White House has released President Biden's budget proposal for fiscal year 2024, in which he suggests flat funding of $174.3 million for CDC's Division of STD Prevention, the same amount received in 2023. Since federal support in the form of increased funding for STD prevention is unlikely, LA County must ensure that there is enough local funding and resources to sustain our STI testing, treatment, and prevention programs. Community-based organizations like AHF are willing to work with the county on reducing STI rates in Los Angeles by offering our media services, MTUs, and other resources. We just ask that the Department of Public Health meet with us to strategize and collaborate. This is not the time to turn away CBOs who are willing to help. We need all hands on deck. Please urge DPH to accept our invitation because AHF has resources to share. We want to be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Mira Patel, and I'm a pharmacist, and I'm here to provide general public comment on behalf of AIDS Healthcare Foundation, or AHF, about rising STI rates in LA County. The CDC reported preliminary STI data for 2021 found that STIs are at an all-time high and for the sixth consecutive year. So LA STI rates are no different. They're climbing every year with no end in sight. LA County Public Health Department needs to address this crisis. The county lab should resume processing lab specimen from community-based organizations without asking patients for insurance. Patients come to AHF and other trusted community providers because they know our encounter is confidential and that an explanation of benefits, or EOB, will not show up at their homes. People who are underage, undocumented, or unhoused may not have insurance to utilize and worry that an EOB in the wrong hands could be devastating and subject them to violence, homelessness, or deter them from Thank being you. tested again. Thank you. Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Mena Gore. I work at AHF. I'm here to discuss the STI crisis during uh, general public comment. Um, the most recent STD report back presented by the LA County Department of Public Health uh, to the HIV and STI providers highlighted the additional federal funding that LA County acquired for fighting STIs. It's long overdue. Now that the funding is incoming, there must be a defined path to maximize the funding. Key tools for fighting the ever-rising rates of STIs must be utilized, such as creating robust public health campaigns, covering the cost of laboratory tests, and developing partnerships with community-based organizations. Tangible goals must be established to reduce yearly infections, focusing on neighborhoods with the highest rates of infection for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. Addit additionally, the rise of antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea, new intervention, New interventions are needed to curb rising STI infections before they become impossible to reverse. Shifting the county protocol to use more mild doxycycline for STIs will treat the patient without building resistance to antibiotics. LA County Department of Public Health must support, support community-based organizations. Thank you very much. Your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Donald Harlan. I'd like to speak on agenda items number 1, 14, 21, 22, 23, 27, 28, 33, 34, 38, 39, Go 40, right ahead. 41, 42, 43. I get one minute. Uh, yeah, LA County supervisors needs to stop illegally trying to claim my real estate. Uh, trying to illegally develop my property, uh, that's a real crime that not only are you committing a crime uh, that nobody can ever own that property, all those properties come off your tax base too. And then uh, we find out the people that you're employing 
uh, are contributing to your political campaigns through the labor unions. Uh, it's just a big, giant loophole you guys have going on over here. Um, number 21, affordable housing, Meta Housing Corporation. No, that's not their problem. They don't need $50 million. Uh, the Coastal Development, number 23, 19560, Grandview Drive, Topanga. For sure, Sullivan doesn't own that property. They're not supposed to be in there. Uh, also, number 27, the Inglewood elections. If the mayor or somebody from the state asks somebody to inter intervene in a local election, please tell us who that is. Uh, County Equestrian Centers, I see you guys are buying four horse ranches today. Who is that? Uh, Santa Monica Channel grants of easement. Castaic Creek, the bridge over Castaic Creek. The sale of parcel by Pickens Canyon Channel and the Bradbury Channel. Uh, yeah, that doesn't belong to the county. Why would you guys be selling it? Wouldn't the owner be the one to sell that? Is that county infrastructure or is that private infrastructure? Uh, who in the fuck is going to be buying my infrastructure? I don't want you guys selling my infrastructure. You know, all those properties come off Thank your Thank you. Tax your time base. has expired. Next speaker, please. Okay, I signed up for all items in public comment. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, well, well. I'm back. I, uh, I see there's some new faces around here. You know, Sheila, uh, Ridley Thomas. Looks like we got some new people around here. Um, but let's get to what I really want to talk about. Uh, so what I want to say is that R set me up. Uh, he left me out to dry and tried to kill me. Um, stupid motherfucker. Now he's in Department 32. Uh, and the kicker, he teamed up with Jay. Jay pulled the trigger. The same Jay that pulled the trigger on the Malibu fire in Thousand Oaks. The same Jay that kicked me out of my house. Uh, so, now that I have a little bit more time, let's talk about item number three. The rescue plan, American rescue plan. Where was my rescue at? That's what I wanna know. Uh, and then number th six, so went from three to six. Uh, care first, jail's last. I don't know. I don't, I don't believe that that's something you guys do around here. Um, strategic growth, number 21. Uh, we, you know, I talked about that already earlier, about how people are just building properties to kick people out of their homes, and then you can't afford the rent that they, you know, put it in. Uh, but development in a good way, you know, I see Topanga, uh, Topanga House Development. Uh, that would be cool. I'm into that. Um, that, uh, that's something that I think should happen. Uh, let's see. Um, the, uh, interior remodeling of, you know, on item number 25, I think some interior remodeling is definitely due. Uh, let's see. Beaches and harbors design. Oh, 44. Yeah. Hazmat cleanup. Definitely, we need to be cleaning some shit up around here. Uh, and then I already talked about the sheriff's reform. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Your microphone is an answer. Hold on one second. There we go. Uh, Arnold Sachs, a few items. Um, uh, Madam Chair, are you going to get uh, Esplanade money for the repair in Redondo Beach? You promised to do that. They haven't shown up with the tsunami warning yet for the beaches. Uh, you mentioned something about King Medical Center. Did you know that MLK Junior Hospital was closed down by Mark Ridley Thomas? Or, no, by the federal inspector back in 2008. They took $200 million, $200 million and screwed over Willie Brown. Um, he never put it back in the county agenda. It's not part of the county system, so I don't know where you're coming up with King Medical Center. Is that King Medical or King Drew? You know, her, her, her dad opened that hospital in 19, 1974 or something like that, 
and in less than 20 years, it failed. They, they, they ran out of Killer King biscuits. Number 15 refers to uh, carrying a concealed weapon. You're banning 50 caliber machine gun, and they're talking about carrying a concealed weapon. Who the fuck is going to carry around a 50 caliber machine gun? That was your item, wasn't it? Banning guns. You're going to have the government saying, oh, you can't carry that. That you got to only carry one belt of bullets on your shoulder while you're carrying that 50 caliber. The city of Los Angeles said they want to okay. send out unarmed Thank people. Thank you. Thank you. Well, very they're much. giving. I got Thank another you. minute, ma'am. Your time has expired. No, I got two minutes. I get public no, comment and items your, your on the agenda. Your time has expired. Um, colleagues, at this time, it would be appropriate to hear adjournments. Um, oh no! Wait, wait, executive officer. Please indicate the agenda item numbers on which it's we will be voting. Unacceptable to speak to her that way, sir. Uh, can you please read the agenda items that we will be voting? Thank you, Madam Chair. The following items are before you. 1, 4, 7 through 11, 14, 17 through 19, 21 through 27, 29, 31 through 44, 46 through 53, 54B through 54C, 54D with Supervisor Barger abstaining from the vote, 54E through 54F, 57 through 59, 1D through D, 3D, and the two read-in motions, 50, 55A, the Supervisor Mitchell's motion, and 55B, Supervisor Horvath's motion is before you. Okay, moved by Supervisor Horvath, seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve these items with the exceptions noted by the Executive Officer. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, now it would be appropriate to hear adjournments. We will begin with Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. When we adjourn today, I ask that we adjourn in the memory of Gloria Jordan Boatwright. Miss Jordan, Jordan Boatwright, beloved mother of City of Gardena's council member Wanda Love, was born in April 1937 and passed away this past February at the age of 85. Miss Jordan Boatwright was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida, and in the 60s she relocated to Los Angeles where she graduated from nursing school and worked as a nurse at the LA County USC Medical Center. Ms. Jordan Boatwright enjoyed cooking and was very active in church. She was a hardworking mother of nine biological children and was the proud foster mother of 30 children whom she loved and treated as her own. One of her favorite sayings was, quote, if you're gonna pray, don't worry, and if you're gonna worry, don't pray, end quote, which became the founding principle of how she lived her life. She'll be remembered for her unwavering faith and as a loving mother, grandmother and foster mother. She is survived by and will be deeply missed by her nine children, Jamie, Jesse, Joni, Catherine, Nancy, Patricia, Teresa, Tyrone, Wanda, 17 grandchildren and a host of great grandchildren, family and friends. When we adjourn today, I ask that we adjourn in the memory of Dave Comer. That's my final uh, adjourned in memory, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we will now go to Supervisor Horvath. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Pierre Elias Tulacani. Mr. Pierre Elias Tulacani, a resident of Encino, died on January 13th, 2023. Pierre was born in Urmia, Iran on October 24th, 1932. He was raised in a proud Assyrian family from the villages of Tulakan and Babari, Iran. Pierre left Iran in 1958 and started the journey to America before settling in Los Angeles. After graduating from Cal State LA, he, worked, he started working in financial planning and investment with the Prudential Insurance Company. He was active in the Assyrian American communities at the local, state, national, and international levels, working tirelessly until his passing. He was a co-founder of the Assyrian American Association of Southern California and served two terms as the president for Assyrian American National Federation. He also served as chairman and board of uh, and board member of advisors for the Assyrian Universal Alliance. 
Besides his active involvement in the Assyrian nation, he, in, he earned a reputation as an outstanding businessman and entrepreneur, especially in downtown Los Angeles. Los Angeles County has lost a great community leader who worked tirelessly to the betterment of the lives of all residents of Los Angeles County. We join his family and friends in mourning his passing and celebrating his long, selfless, and productive life. Pierre Tulacani lived in Encino until his passing with his lovely uh, wife and business partner of 40 years, Mrs. Angie Tulacani. And I know Supervisor Barger uh, uh, would like to join in this adjournment as well. Okay. Uh, right, is, that, is that all for you? Okay, great. Um, so me. Uh, uh, colleagues, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Joseph Martisic, who was born and raised in San Pedro. Uh, after graduating from San Pedro High, he enrolled at Pepperdine University on a basketball scholarship. The first in his extended family to go to college, he finished his bachelor's degree in social science at Long Beach State and went on to become a teacher. Joe loved teaching. He taught for a few years in Torrance before returning to his hometown to teach at Dana Junior High and San Pedro High. And throughout his 50-year career, Joe made a positive impact on the lives of countless students and colleagues. Joe survived by his wife of 63 years, Marianne, his children Jody, Joe, and Ted, 10 grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren, and a number of extended family members, including Andrea Hegabelli, who is a friend of mine. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Okay, so, so uh, this is Joan Palikas, um, who lived in Manhattan Beach, Holly, so I didn't know if you were going to adjourn. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, she was, a, um, actually she was a longtime resident of Palos Verdes Estates, okay, I thought she lived in Manhattan Beach, but she was, she was the mother of Nancy Palikas and um, the mother-in-law of um, uh, Kurt Moody, who lived in Manhattan Beach. So she was the mother of Nancy. And Nancy, for those of you who remember, was the woman who was aged like 56 who got early onset of Alzheimer's and wandered away from um, our County Museum of Art. Remember that case um, many years ago? And I will never forget going to Nancy and Kirk's home in Manhattan Beach. And George and Joan, who were Nancy's parents, were there every single day uh, copying flyers with photos of Nancy and taking them themselves to every um, nursing home, every hospital, every bus terminal by themselves trying to find Nancy. And it was because of Nancy going missing and because of her parents, George and, and Joan, um, that we started LA Found. And thinking that maybe we could do better the next time a family member had someone wander away. Joan was a longtime member of the League of Women Voters, and she took an avid interest in civic affairs. And one of her greatest passions was being a pilot, and she shared this with Nancy. Nancy was also a pilot, um, and they apparently loved uh, taking trips together uh, in the airplane throughout the Southwest together. But she's survived by her husband, George, and her son-in-law, Kirk, who, um, resides in Manhattan Beach, so I would love to have you join me on this one, um, Holly. Um, I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Lisa Hansen, who was a resident of Torrance, who passed away at the age of 58. Um, Lisa li lives, leaves behind a legacy of philanthropy, leadership, and service to others. She grew up on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, was a graduate of USC, where she was a member of the Tri-Delta sorority. Lisa served as the chair of the Norris Foundation for over 20 years where she worked to expand opportunities for those living in the LA area. She served on many nonprofit boards and executive committee, committees, including the California Science Center, the Banning Residence Museum, which is in, um, is, surrounds the Banning Residence in Wilmington, which is where I uh, got to know uh, Lisa very well. And the Bookworm Guild. Lisa was a longtime supporter of the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, the Blue Ribbon supporting the Music Center, Autry Museum of the American Southwest, the Torrance Memorial Medical Center, Boys and Girls Club of Los Angeles Harbor, the USS Iowa, and was a member of the Seaside Community Church in Torrance. She really gave back so much um, to her community. Lisa was preceded in death by her mother, Harleen Norris, stepfather, Kenneth Norris, 
and father, Jean Martin. She's survived by her husband, Steve, her sister, Kim, and many nieces and nephews. And may we all continue to live by the model that guided her life, which was kindness matters. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor. Thank you. I move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Judge Beverly L. Bourne, a Los Angeles Superior Court judge who passed away on March 2nd after a courageous battle with cancer. She was appointed to the bench in 2013 by then Governor Edmund G. Brown, Jr. Prior to her appointment, Judge Bourne served as a senior trial attorney for the Los Angeles County Alternate Public Defender's Office. She earned her bachelor's degree from USC and her JD from Pepperdine University School of Law. Mm -hmm. Beverly was totally devoted to the court's Beverly Reed O'Connell Power Lunch Program and served as co-vice chair for many years. She also co-chaired the Young Women's Leadership Conference Subcommittee and was a member of the Young Men's Leadership Conference Subcommittee as well. In addition, she was a teen court judge at Pasadena High School for the Judge David S. Wellesley Teen Court Program for many years. Despite the challenges her cancer treatment presented, she never lost her wit, her desire to serve the public, and her will to live each day to the fullest. Beverly brightened every room she entered with the cheerful disposition and her energy, grace, and kindness. She will deeply be missed. Beverly survived by her husband, John Carroll, her mother, Ruby Bourne, her sisters, Gwen Bourne, and her brother, Anthony Bourne. Also, that we adjourn in memory of Michelle Jenkins, a longtime College of the Canyon trustee who passed away at the age of 72. She served um, as a College of the Canyons board member for nearly 40 years, since 1984. During her service on the Board of Trustees, Jenkins served in a multitude of capacities, including clerk, vice president, and six terms as president. Her husband, Dr. Gregory Jenkins, was among the first graduating class at College of the Canyons. In 2000, they were jointly awarded College of the Canyons Outstanding Alumni Award. Jenkins took an active role at the state level representing the Santa Clarita Community College District and providing leadership to other trustees. She also helped establish the Santa Clarita Valley Chapter of the League of Women Voters, as well as a local branch of the American Association of University Women. In 2021, Jenkins was reelected to the College of Canyons Board. Michelle is survived by her husband, Greg, daughter, Lorraine, son-in-law, Andre, daughter-in-law, Jennifer, and grandchildren, Mary Jane, Lucas, and Lyra. Also that we adjourn in memory of Eric Lloyd Wright, an American architect and grandson of the famous Franklin Lloyd Wright, who died at the age of 93 on March 14, 2023. Eric was born in Los Angeles on November 8, 1929, to Helen Taggart and Lloyd Wright. He worked in his grandfather and father's architect firm as an apprentice. Eric's early education as a grandfather's apprentice allowed him to partake in iconic projects such as the New York's Guggenheim Museum and Mono, 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 Mono uh, Terrace in Madison, Wisconsin. He eventually received his license in, as an architect in 1967 before establishing his own firm, Eric Lloyd Wright Architecture and Planning in 1978. Eric Lloyd Wright Architecture and Planning does design and building, and Eric leads a non, was leading a nonprofit called Wright Organic Resource Center. Their firm's focus is on residences, often working with other architecture firms for final construction. He also worked on larger, larger projects, including the Sunset Community High School. Eric is survived by his wife, Mary, and his two sons. Also that we adjourn in memory of Monsignor Michael Joseph Slattery, who passed away at the age of 84. Monsignor Mike was born in Fermoy, County Cork, Ireland on December 22, 1938. He grew up in Tallow with his four sisters and two brothers. They worked on the family farm, frequently tending to sheep. This foreshadowed the next phase of his life, becoming a priest. The vocation to serve God led him to attend St. John's Seminary in Waterford, Ireland. Then he studied Latin, philosophy, and theology, studies that stayed with him his entire life. Shortly after being ordained, he arrived in Los Angeles to begin his career at St. Rose of Lima in Simi Valley. Monsignor was a prolific reader and enjoyed poetry, music, golf, travel, watching the horse races, going on lawn walks, and having lively conversation with friends and, stra and strangers. After the devastating earthquake in 1994, Monsignor Slattery was faced with rebuilding St. John Baptist de la Salle, de Salle Church. He would later help to build the very beautiful St. Kuteri Takavita Church from the ground up, the second largest parish in the Los Angeles Archdiocese. Michael 
is survived by his sisters, Angelic and Carmel, and his brothers, James, and 18 nieces and nephews, as well as dear friends. And last, I move that the Board of Supervisors adjourn in memory of the following individuals who were identified as indigent veterans by the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner and were subsequently buried with dignity and honor at Riverside National Cemetery in the, late, in the last month. Ronald Joseph Bandy, Army, Joey Ralph Hernandez, Marine Corps, Stephen J. Jacobs, Army, Peter Yeager, Jr., Marine Corps, Nevin Douglas Jones, Air Force, Warren King, Air Force, Guy Ronald Mason, Navy, Robert Lee Useri, Air Force, Mar Mario Alfredo Balren, Army, Raymond Gary Weems, Navy, Archie Stewart Weston, Army, Fred B. Williams, Navy. Their contributions and sacrifices in service to our country will never be forgotten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisors, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Francis Carrasco. Francis Carrasco was born on November 2nd, 1958 in Santa Monica, California to Roberto and Martha Carrasco. The family, which included five siblings, grew up in Mar Vista Gardens housing project. Francis attended St. Gerard Mejelia Catholic School. She also attended Marina Del Rey Junior High School and Venice High School. Francis then went on to attend UCLA. At UCLA, Francis was involved with school-based community outreach programs, such as Project Motivation, which gave tours and talks to potential college students. She was also involved with the student newspaper publication known as La Gente. Soon after getting her BA from UCLA, she started her own computer graphics business, High Res Graphics in Culver City. She then continued to work as a graphic designer for many years in Santa Monica. Frances cared for and was immensely loved by her many nieces and nephews. Her home was always open to all of them. Friday night sleepovers became the highlight memory of, of their childhood. Frances would cook for them, teach them, play with them, and the list goes on. She loved it. Frances is survived by her three siblings. You may know her, Barbara Carrasco, famous artist, Latina artist, uh, Robert, Leandra, nephews Ricky, Matthew, nieces Eva, Amanda, Olivia, Barbie, Rose, and Lisa, and babies Phil and Jackson, her loving fiance, Paul Pina, and his entire family, including little Nick and Isabel, whom she raved about constantly, and were the new generation of kids that were so lucky to have been loved by Francis. We will miss her very much. Secondly, I move that when we adjourn, we adjourn in the memory of Raul B. Pizarro. Raul was self-taught, queer Latinx visual artist with muscular dystrophy. Born in Mexicali, Mexico, the third of four siblings, Raul and his family migrated to Southern California, the place that reared him and became home after the age of three. He grew up in the city of Pomona, a, sh a short stroll to Pomona's art, art district. Rawls' professional work bridged diverse themes and spanned over 25 years. Each piece of art emerged from his experience at the intersection of disability, LGBTQ, identity, race, ethnicity, family, and community. Raul believed art needed to be reclaimed by our communities and embraced by the former art world. Among his proudest achievements is Raul's residency with Self Help Graphics Los Angeles. Raul worked with the master printmaker to produce some prints of Chiara, in which half became a part of various Latinx collections at museums and universities nationally. Raul was one of the artists invited to participate in the singular Los Angeles Community of Angels project. And this year, Raul was featured in Preserving Creative Spaces, a traveling collection of 50 photographs of artists and their studios that will become part of the Smithsonian archives. The Da Center of the Arts was the first gallery to exhibit Raul's work in December of 2019 hosted his first retrospective, which encompassed over 70 pieces, including his own painting, completed at the age of three, which is when art became Raul's preferred language. In 2020, Raul joins the Da Center for Arts Board. In 2022, Raul was appointed to serve as vice president. He passed away this past Saturday on March 18, 2023. May his soul rest in peace. Madam Chair, my my third introduction. <laughs> I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Margaret Eleanor Holt. Margaret Eleanor Holt passed away at her Rosemead home one day after her birthday last December. She was 79.
Margaret's family moved to California in 1967, and she put herself through nursing school at Rio Hondo College in Whittier. She worked at Garfield Medical Center in Monterey Park, City of Hope in Duarte, and Huntington Memorial Hospital in Pasadena before retiring in 2011. She loved riding her bike 10 miles daily, seven days a week, rain or shine. It was during these bike rides that she noticed people experiencing homelessness in the area. From 8 a.m. to noon on Thursdays, they offered food and gently used clothes to our unhoused. It was my honor to support her efforts by bringing the organization Shower of Hope and providing our homeless brothers and sisters with an opportunity to shower. Little by little, this weekly shower program became a weekly resource fair where she would provide support services, clothing, and food for our most vulnerable. She was a giver. I will always remember the impact she had on members of our community, including the cookies that she made and she carried with her. She was a giver and I had the opportunity to know her. I know many will miss her. And lastly, Madam Chair, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Fujima Kasuma. Madam Fujima Kasuma was born in San Francisco on May 9, 1918. As a child, she was often sick and bedridden prompting a doctor to advise her parents to find an activity to build up her immunity and strength. Her mother chose Kabuki, and when the family moved to Los Angeles, their daughter began lessons at nine, immersing herself in the classical form of Japanese theater, mixing drama with traditional dance. Madame Kasuma joined an all-girls troupe, touring Hawaii, then deciding she wanted to learn from the best, yet the best was in her ancestral homeland, and after graduating from high school, Madame Kasuma headed to Japan, and over the course of four years, she absorbed the rigors of acting, dancing, learning how to conduct tea ceremony and arranging flowers, how to dress in kimonos and practicing etiquette. In 1938, she earned her notori, or master license as Madame, and returned to the U.S. at age 21 with trunks full of costumes and wigs and quickly opened up her first studio in downtown Los Angeles Hotel. Yet not long after she began teaching, the U.S. entered into World War II, leading to the forcible relocation and imprisonment of more than 120,000 people of Japanese descent. Madame Kasuma and her family were moved around to different prison camps, ending up in Rower, Arkansas. The camp administrator sought out Madame Kasuma after being inundated with letters from fellow detainees asking to continue their dance lessons. In late 1945, when the war ended, she and her family returned to Los Angeles where she threw herself into a strict regiment of teaching and performing, practicing in dozens of Japanese American culture events across Southern California. As her reputation spread, more and more students flocked at her classes in Little Tokyo. Though more than 70 years of dancing, Madame Kasuma taught nearly 2,000 students. Her dedication to sharing the beauty of Kabuki and her Japanese heritage won her awards, including the Order of the, of the Precious Crown, Apricot, from the Japanese government in 1985, and the National Heritage Fellowship from the National Endowment of the Arts in 1987. Thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my adjournments. Thank you. Okay, um, we will take all those motions as seconded, and if there's no objection to unanimous vote, that will be the action. Uh, members of the public and colleagues, we are now going into closed session, and while we're in closed session, we will be showing video presentations. Um, not for us in closed session, but for those of you out here. Uh, Supervisor Solis has a, a video presentation proclaiming Latina History Day in Los Angeles County. Um, and let me just take an uh, opportunity to thank our um, security uh, officers from, from the DA. Uh, you did a marvelous job today along with our own, uh, our sergeant at arms uh, for keeping the peace today. And it's been a really long day, but I, we really appreciate how you um, interacted with the public and kept everybody um, safe and calm. So thank you so much. Okay, read us in a closed session. In accordance with Brown Act requirements, notice is hereby given that the Board of Supervisors will convene in closed session to discuss item CS1, public employment interview and consideration of candidates for appointment to the position of interim chief probation officer. Item CS2, department head performance evaluation and CS3, conference with labor neg negotiator, Fesia Davenport and designated staff as indicated on the posted agenda.
We spoke too soon. You all look so beautiful, lovely, talented, intelligent women. And I can't tell you how happy I am to be in a room full of powerful Latinas. As the only Latina serving on the all-female LA County Board of Supervisors, of HOPE, Hispanas Organized Political Equality. We're here today celebrating Latina History Day. We think it's very important during Women's History Month that we take out one day to ensure that we celebrate the contributions, accomplishments, and everything that Latinas do for our great state and our nation. So as we celebrate Latina History Day, we are proud to always have the support of Supervisor Hilda Solis. She was the first Latina to serve on the state Senate, first Latina to serve on President Obama's cabinet, and she is an ongoing supporter, role model for all Latinas across the state and the nation. As we celebrate history, we love highlighting those history makers like Supervisor Solis. Today, we also have 1,200 women taking time out to not only celebrate our common accomplishments, but discussing what we can do better for our communities, bringing more women and being more inclusive to our society and making sure our democracy is strong.
everybody. It's almost 12 hours since we started. We started at 9.30 a.m., right? And it's 8.30 p.m. It was almost 12 hours ago we started. And we still got our purple going on. Okay. Here we are. Um, Executive officer, what have we been doing? Okay, all present except for Supervisor Solis is absent. The following is a report of action taken in closed session on March 21st, 2023. Items CS1, CS2, and CS3, no reportable action was taken. Okay, this meeting is adjourned.